Hey everyone, welcome to your full course down tutorial. So this beginner's course, will if we're following along with school, would cover everything inside this book. This six hour course will teach you to grade through grade 10 and 11. And if you're not doing it because of school, this course will help you get up and running with the Delphi programming language. Now let's get started. And hello everybody, I'm so glad to see that you're all joining in into this Delphi tutorial. So this is our first video and we're not going to do any coding right now. I'm just going to show you around and show you how everything works and looks and what it does and stuff like that. So here, you don't have to really worry about anything. This is just how the, the intro, you know. What you really gotta do is you gotta go to file. And this is in most cases what you need to do. And if you're working with Delphi, you'd want to say BLC forms and BCL forms and applications. But if you're working with HTML and stuff, you can go here. But since you didn't, if you didn't follow my HTML tutorial, you'd never actually need to go here. But here is the BCL forms and applications. You click on that. You really need to worry about any of the things that's here just yet. Uh, you just always start with this one, alright? These will come in later. Now, we're just going to show you guys around. So first off, we have files. Now, after you've opened your file, you'd want to save it. But do you not say save? We're going to say save is not going to save everything. So you have to say save all because it's going to save the project as well as everything else that might have come, come with it. So you can either say shift control S or you can say save all right here. For the first few videos, I'm going to say right here so I can get into, guy, into your guys' heads that you should be using this one. Now let's click there. And then here, usually you can keep it like that. It's not a problem. Or wait, you first you find your directory. So you go new because I am already where I want to be. And now you just say folder and call whatever you want. So we're going to go. Delphi test. We're going to our first folder, and in here you can just rename it to whatever you want. You can even leave it like that, but I suggest you go FRM, whatever the name should be. So we're going to go test, and if it's the unit, which is usually the first one, you just go underscore U, and you also see here it says U right there for unit. And you just put you there. Uh, you don't need to do this, but it makes it easier to navigate. Just say save, and then you're going to have to save the project. Now you just do the same thing: frm with the name underscore, and instead of you, you go p, because p is usually the the one you want to open. So just that just makes it easier, you know. Otherwise, you're going to have to read the the like dot dpr oj and you don't always want to do that so you just go save and you have saved it correctly now that's about all you have to worry about in here the rest is not really that important i never use it you can use it and nothing really important here we don't have to worry about it search nothing really to worry about actually view uh, you never actually use this either but maybe you will find something that will fit to your liking and then you will use this but otherwise you don't really have to worry yourself with this either refactor i never use this and i probably never will so uh, you can decide if you want to use this i don't know what's going on in here so yeah project here you can find a few cool things for example compiling it building it but you don't need to actually ever use these unless you're creating something specific to like you know, actually use for a game like here. I've created a game. Also, here's the folders where you can just like, as you can see, there's the underscore p and stuff. So easy to read. Now, what I have done is I've created a game. Now here, and basically, if you say build, you build this exe. .exe, you know, and you can play the play whatever you used. So that's what all of this is for. 
then you have the options option which is a uh, pretty useful as well for you remember this game I just showed you now you might be wondering how do you change how it looks how do you change the icon and stuff here now there's the icon you can change the icon here change the title hat check go make a help file you can change the version info now this is if you're creating like applications and stuff for actual people this could be useful but yeah that's about all I use here you'd actually ever know you'd actually never have to use this either and then you have to run where you can actually run it or run it uh, without debugging but you don't actually need to click this you know you could just click this which is also run run doesn't really do anything right now it just opens it up and shows you this is how it looks it doesn't have why did you do that it doesn't have anything why are you oh wait okay never mind see this is basically the dot exe can you stop doing that why are you doing that the dot exe file so you don't have to click this but you can if you want I just like clicking this you have the component which I never use either tool which I never use either windows and help I never use either, any of those then most of these you can find for yourself for example this is save control s you can find it here all of this you can find that here this you can also find here in view uh, like uh, da -da -da. I'm not sure you can find it somewhere here but there's nothing special about it saying none won't do anything going undocked is just making everything as it says undocked you just move it around like let's say you have a bunch of things you gotta check out how to move it around mess with it not really important it does very confusing things then you get the debug layout which is uh, nothing special it's just what you get normally and then you also get the default layout which is also nothing really too special but I just go with the default layout because it's the easiest of them all you can see which one you want and which one you like you know up to you we'll get to this we'll get to this and here are all your projects now this is just a project you can add another project here for example um, I can add this I can put it there but I'm not going to and then you can add a project here oh wait let's do it let's show you what to do so let's say you add a project here so you can like so it has anyways been added usually it will have an extra on here but I said closed so here it would usually be then you can things and it's both projects you know but this one which usually interfere, interfere with this one you can change it here somewhere but I don't do that I just say remove pro remove project this will remove that project and you will only have your one project there which is mostly useful just for later on you know because you never know when you might accidentally do that then here you can just resize the form the form is nothing sp the form is actually the whole application I can't say nothing special see if you resize it this suddenly becomes bigger this here is where it will pop up if this is in the middle it will pop up in the middle of the screen if it's there it will pop up there and stuff like that so let's make it pop up right there here so if I run it now it opens up here which I find really annoying usually what I do is I click on it and here at the object inspector I go to Either window state and make it maximize, or I go to position here and I just say make it into the center, desktop center. There is another one, but I just pick whichever one works for me because I don't have two screens or anything, so it doesn't bother me. So now I can move it around and stuff, but it will always stay there. Why does it do that? It's really annoying. Anyways, so yeah, then you have that. So now let's get to the tool. Hell. Now let's get to the tool plash it. Now here is where you can find things like buttons, uh, memos, panels, which I don't necessarily like using. Bunch of things which is pretty cool. Another thing to notice: if you accidentally like put your memo on the panel. Um, let's create an, another memo memo if you accidentally put your memo 
or, or button or whatever on the panel. You'd see it's quite annoying because it's on the panel. But you know, it makes it look nice and stuff later on. And it does have special effects and stuff. But if you do this and you don't want it here, it's annoying because it can't go out and stuff. Let's delete this memo because this memo is unimportant. You can just go to edit, delete, then memo is gone. But see, if you want this one to go away, what you're gonna do is you gotta go here to this, the form structure. Now, this is basically how everything is built. Like, see, that with the children and stuff like that. Like this is a parent, this is his children, and this is the parent's grandchild. But you can make this grandchild the parent's child by dragging it to the parent. Now as you can see the memo is no longer part of the panel. So we can just put it wherever we want. Good thing to note because that can become really annoying if you don't know how to do it. Now we can go here after we have covered basically all of that. Here we can just change things, for example the name which we will get to later when coding. Usually for button we go btn and then the name like press button press and then to change the caption you just go to caption and you remove the button there now it's just press now this doesn't do anything yet it's just a bunch of components on a form you can do whatever you want it's not going to do anything See, this is just so you can edit how everything here looks. You can change the colors and the size and stuff like that. You can all do. You can do all of this inside of the code. Um, like in this game right here, I did a lot of things just inside of the code. Um, especially here when the first version came out, the beta version. This is all like set inside of the code. Like when the game starts, all of that is like set to a different place with the code. Now we don't, we're not going to start with the code just yet, we're going to do that in the next video. Now I'm just showing you how everything works. These three you don't really need to mess with, I never mess with them because you know I'm not, I never use them so I never mess with them. Then you have the code which we will get to later on and how to edit and stuff like that because right now you can't do anything really, it's just a bunch of useless stuff. Um, now what you can do is you can either press code or design and it will swap between the two or you can press F12 and it will swap between the two as well now here also on the object inspector is nice to note that you have events for example on the press button we have like on click events like if they click on it or uh, where's it like in drag like after a drag and they stop something will happen on exit, on entry, you know, a bunch of useful things. We'll also get to that later inside the code. Okay, now back to here. Now here you also have history, but I never use it because I never need to. Now yeah, next time we'll get to coding and how to start with the basics, for example, coding a button and a shape. So today we will be creating this. It's a basic program which just sends the ball up and down. It has a label, two buttons, and one bit button. Now I will be explaining all of these later and also has a shape. Now we'll be trying to create it almost exactly like this. Doesn't need to be exactly, but we can try and create it exactly like this. So first Create your form, new VCL forms application, and then this should pop up. Then save it. Save all. Then you choose your directory. Call it I'm going to call it the page on explaining to you guys. Then let's go frm game underscore build frm ball game. Maybe you should know what it is when you go in, okay? Underscore u. You. you can copy that if you want. And then underscore p. And now you have saved it. Now let's see. So it has label, 
two buttons, a pet button, and a circle. So we have a label, two buttons, one bit button, and then one shape. Okay. So let's first do this. Let's get everything out there. Okay. So before we try and do everything where it should be, let's first try and make this into this because as you can see they are not matching. So first off, now you can do this, but this isn't as accurate. Let's say you want specifics, you know, then this isn't going to work. Now first of all you select the form because sometimes you are selected to want these and then it might not work as good. So first you select the form, then let's go to the height. Now in the object inspector it should be there. We can make this 330. It will probably be 330 pixels but it doesn't really matter in this context. And then we change the width to 350. Now that should look pretty much like this. A little different but they will probably not need to know. Now, we put the label there, and there. Now let's see, what else does it have? Let's see, what else does it have here? Uh, so its font seems to be Comic Sans. So let's go here, and then we go to the font. Now you can change all this in the code, but because you're new, we'll be using the Object Inspector first. So then you go to font, you click on these three buttons right here and you search for Comic Sans up here, select that, make the yeah, make the size 10, so it's a little bit bigger than that. And then you go OK. Now as you can see everything here changed. Then let's see what else we could be now this one has a cat in my first Delphi program. Now select your form and go to caption. My first Delphi program. Yeah, my first Delphi program. Now I believe we can go on to the label. Ooh, wait, wait, let's first shape everything. How does all this look? Okay, yeah, let, let's first do the label. So you change the caption to it says click a button click a button okay so there is the label now here it is round about here so we can reshape this be a little bigger this you can change to how big you want I would like it to be about that and we can change about that there, now they look basically the same. Alright, now this is up to you. You can actually make it whatever size you want. I'd actually like to make it a little bit like that. Now, also, another thing to note is you can press Ctrl and left, right, up, and down to move it like slightly sideways, upwards, downwards, you know. If you can't get it to exactly where you want it. For example, see you can't get it constantly there but you don't want it. Control and the side you want it to go to and boom. Easy as pie, am I right? And then its shape is around here. Okay, so now we can start with the first button. Now when you open it up, it says up. So first let's let's name all our things firstly. Because this makes the whole process easier to first name it. So then we go to name BTN up. Go to button 2 and make this BTN close. Close. Darn. Down. Alright. Then the bit button we go bit BTN and close. Okay, so now we have this. 
and so we can rename this one to SHP for shape and then circle okay so now we can go to the captions so we can just go there and go there see just go to the object inspector makes everything easy and you can just quickly change whatever you want now of course as I said you can do this in the code but if you don't have to why do this no, well, I, I like to do it like that, but since we are new here, we gotta stay with this. Now, a bit button isn't the same as a button. Now, a button you can code, you can code a bit button as well, but a bit button you can give a specific thing to do. Like here, they gave gave their bit button the specific thing to close. So if I'm going to click on this, it will close. Then I will need to go reopen it. As you can see here. So this one should do the same. So what with the bit button, you select it and then what are we doing? Okay. You select it and you go down to kind. You click on this button right here and you go to close. Now it should look basically the same. The reason we I know this is a bit button is because it has this little image here. Bit buttons can have little images. I don't know why, but it, it's kind of cute, you know. So yeah. So the first button here seems to be enabled, as you can see here. And this one is disabled, so you can't click on it. This one you can click, and then this one becomes enabled. We'll get to the code with this later. So first let's disable this one. So you click on it and you go to enabled right here and you take it to false. Now this one should be disabled when we start it out. Then we can go, I think we can continue to the shape then. It should be this. Now the shape seems to be a circle. So you select it and you go to shape now this is up to you you can either make it an ellipse or a circle it is truly up to you a circle can only change its radius and the ellipse can only change its can change its height and width if you follow my html tutorials you will kind of understand this more now a circle if you change the height the width will change along with it so if you change the height to 60 the width will become 60 as well with an ellipse, if you change the height to 60, the work will stay the same as what it was. So let's go to ellipse. You can choose circle if you want, it's actually faster. But for the sake of the video, we're going to choose ellipse. Now, we're going to change the height of this to 40. Change it to 40. And then the work we will also change to 40. Now we have a 40 by 40 ellipse. What is this? Look? Okay. Now here it's red. So to get that, you go to brush. You click on this plus sign right here, and you will have the option to color it. You click on this button right here at the side, and you choose see our red. Boom! Isn't that beautiful? So then we can start positioning it. So let's make the left around 160 maybe. And we make the top one what about 120? So top is 120. Hmm nah. We make the top 200. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So here is what we have here. It looks basically exactly the same, right? But if you're going to run this one, you will see they do look exactly the same. But there's one difference. If I click up here and down here, the ball moves. But if I click up here, nothing happens. 
So let's close this. Now we can start coding. So with a button, you can either go to the events and click on the on click. You can double click here, or in the faster way and just double click on that button, and it will automatically create an on click procedure. Now here is where we start programming. Thankfully, Delphi is in fairly easy language to learn and um, everything is super easy to understand so first off as you can see here the app button sends things sends the ball up so the first thing you should do is we should send the shape up. now we called the shape here at the name and then, and then, and then. There, SHP circle. So here we can go SHP circle. Now, uh, easy thing to notice is you can either do that or you can press control and space and then SH, and there your pop up will come. Press enter and you have your name. Now, when you press the button up. The circle should be going up, correct? So you say dot, and this is where it can come in. So we're still selected at the circle. Right? So right now its top is 200. And as we all know, changing the top changes where this is. So if I change this to 20, it will go up. But if I change it to 200, it will go back down. So we go shape circle dot top and then this is a becomes it is the two dots and an equal sign and then you just, just go twin so it's top becomes twin now do you see what I just did there? Let, let's do that it was here now if I press Ctrl and D, it shifts it upward. Delphi has this beautiful thing of when you press Ctrl and D, it makes your code just look so much better and easier to read. I highly suggest you do that because if you don't, it will just look unprofessional. So Delphi kind of makes your life easier for you. Now let's quickly run it. And you probably saw here that this changed to green once I uh, this is when I press Ctrl S. So here I press Ctrl D, it changes to yellow because it, everything is unsaved. So Ctrl and S saves it and turns it to green. Now let's quickly run it. And let's see, if I press up, you see it changes to 20. So yeah, we can close that. But you see, the problem is when we press up here, this one becomes enabled and this one becomes disabled. So what we should do here is we should go btn up dot enabled. Now, as I showed you before, you go here and you go to the object inspector. The name that we chose is yeah. BTN up. Now BTN up dot and then here is the enable which is set to true. Now see BTN enable dot yeah BTN up dot enable then you just make it false. Now there's this thing in programming where true and false is basically like a one to zero. False is where it would be zero and true is where it's one. Now, I don't actually need to explain this to you, but it's for future reference. So, if something is enabled, then it has a 1. And the computer reads it as, okay, so this thing can be used. When you create a false, it gets a 0. And then the computer is like, huh, this is 0, it can't be used. So, yeah. And then btn down, but enabled becomes true. Now, if you were a bad programmer, 
you do probably do some you probably do something like this. Just untidy. Just, you don't want that. Then it's control and D just makes all them beautiful. Now this space here doesn't matter. I like to keep mine apart if it's if it just looks better, you know. But there. You don't need it. So also another thing to note is yeah, we can we can do that later. Okay, so now let's quickly try and see what we get. So now if we press up, it becomes this thing, and this one becomes enable, but it doesn't work yet. So down is basically the same thing. So you go to the down button, you double click on it, and here you go. So SHP circle dot top, oopsie, top becomes 200. Then btn up dot enable becomes true and btn down dot enable becomes false. Super false. Now Dalphi has this nice thing is about where it doesn't care where anything is actually. Now um, with any program language it does sometimes matter where these is, these are. But for those of you that has no experience with programming, this doesn't really matter in most cases about where it is, uh, or not in these cases. And in most cases, it actually does. But in this specific case, where this is, it doesn't matter. You can put this one here at the top. It doesn't matter. As long as it's between that begin and end, it you don't do. It just really doesn't matter. Okay. So now let's try it again. And let's quickly see how the other one looks that we have. There and there. So they look exactly the same to me, right? Now you might be thinking, next to some, what about the codes? Don't need to worry. This is where the bit button becomes really nice. It codes itself basically. So close. Easy as that. Now, you might be thinking, how do I know if I made a problem somewhere and it doesn't work and I don't know how to fix it? Now, first thing that would happen is, let's remove that. This will come up and it will tell you at which line it is, like line 34, and 20 is how much, like where, which column, like how much characters up. Just excuse that noise in the background. Now, even if you run this, it will give you an error. And it will show you exactly where it is, and here it will also tell you what's wrong. So, there, fixed. So, today we'll be covering comments in Delphi. This shouldn't be a long video at all. Now, comments are basically things that remove that you can use to like give yourself some tips, like. Um, what's that? For example, slash slash. This is a one line comment. It only covers one line, so you can be like, um, set um, shape position. But this won't be read. And as you can see, there are no problems. But if you were to put this without a comment, like here, then you would immediately get a bunch of errors saying, hey, wait, what's this? So, this really helps you if you just want to cover one line with a comment. Now, you can put a comment anywhere, um, but these you either put above, below, or after what you wanted to say. Because if you're going to put this in front of what you wanted to say, then this is also going to be commented out, and you don't want that. Now, uh, comments are extremely useful, correct? But if you have, like, let's say you want to comment out these lines because you're not going to use them, you want to use something else. This is this is lines that you never want to use. We can say, or let's say you want. BT and up to be enabled but always stay enabled. Or, or wait, wait, let's just comment these two out, okay? 
then you can either do that and you will comment out both of them with this but if let's say this is like 50 likes then would you really want to do this 50 times so you can use one of these brackets and close it off with one of those and as you can see these are not comments and they won't be read so beaten up dot enabled becomes true but it won't become true because you see it won't become true because we commented it out now these are the most um, popular comments to use in Delphi but if you really want to you can always use um, a bracket with a star and a star and a bracket this does exactly the same thing as this but um, yeah but this one is more effort so I suggest you use this one so today we're going to be focusing on the Delphi images so here in this folder as you can see we have an image along with our project nothing special about it now we're going to see how to load it in here now I gotta say images are pretty easy all you gotta do is just say image you add an image then you can resize it to whichever size you want you just go like that and then all you gotta do is you click on it and you find the picture in the object inspector inspector and you click on the three dots right here at the side you go here and you say load it will open up in the folder and see it's a lot easier than HTML so then you just click on it you say open and there it is you don't say save or clear or anything you just say ok now you might be wondering wait what I didn't expect that to happen but all you gotta do is just gotta go down remember you should still be selected and then here at stretch you should make that true and there you go that will basically stretch itself so it can be shown and that is how you add an image guys okay so today we'll be working through this now um, this form is basically just three edits, three labels, one bit button. Um, this bit button might say reset, but its kind is retry. So remember, just put a retry and then change the caption to reset. And then we have three buttons Afrikaans, English, and Spanish. Now, if the person clicks on Afrikaans, this should change to Afrikaans. Person clicks to English, it should change to English or it should stay English if it is already English. And if you click on Spanish, it should change Spanish. And if they click reset, this should be cleared. But when you start up, this shouldn't be in it, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to remove that when we start up the whole program because if we're starting if we start up now, we're going to have a little bit problem with the you know just it's all going to be inside we don't want that so and this doesn't actually work yet even if it's a bit button its code doesn't exist just yet so let's get started click on the form go to its events now you can either choose on activate or on create to be honest I don't know what the difference is I just usually select on activate while everybody else decides to rather select um, on create but to me there's no difference if you start up the application it does everything the same so let's start it up now we have finally started up or on activate but now what so we want to get rid of the insides now with an edit it's insides are made with text so the inside of that edit is a text. Now since this shouldn't be doing anything specific, we don't need to like assign it to any variables which we haven't done yet, but we'll get there. So let's press F12. Now we know this one is an EDT name. So EDT name 
dot text becomes I can just do that or if I'm correct we can go dot clear so let's see will dot clear work yes dot clear works so you can either use that or you can use edt age dot text and make it equal to nothing As you can see, it works as well. Now, in I know in some other languages, like uh, Java, you have to use these if you want to create something like this. But take note, in Delphi you don't. Also, in like JavaScript, you can use like this, this, and uh, this. It all work the same, but in Delphi you can only use these so take note of that now edt surname dot clear all right so now we should have the first part perfectly done yes now let's do the reset now this is basically a copy and paste Literally, that, that that's all this is. So if you go like that, like that, and like, like that, if we say reset, it works perfectly. Because it does exactly the same, it clears everything out. Now, it is good to program as, and don't do, and not doing this, because this doesn't look, it doesn't look clean we can say now you should either make all of them like this or all of them like this but for the sake of the lesson we did it here like that but here since we have already covered that we can just do what's best dot clear it's automatically in English so let's first start with when we press on Afrikaans oh wow now a label uses a caption but one thing I forgot to add was the label name you don't it's not necessary to add a label name but it is if it is a label then it is just good practice to make it like that Right, now, labels work with captions, if I am not mistaken, yeah. And as you can see, this one's caption is already perfect. This one should be surname. And this one should be name. Alright, so now when you press in Afrikaans, this should change to Afrikaans. When you press in English, this should be changed to English. Unless it already is, which it will not matter then. And if you press in Spanish, it should change to Spanish. Now let's start off with Afrikaans again. Now LBL name dot caption becomes and in Afrikaans the caption or name in Afrikaans is nom. There we go. Could I say something? I want to do that. Okay. So yeah, the LBL surname dot caption becomes fun and then lbl h dot caption becomes odordom if i'm not mistaken can you not Now if you run it, it should work and shouldn't have any problems. So uh, let's select Afrikaans. Norm fun odor dorm. Yeah, I think that's that works. 
Now we should of course still do the English because if they change to Afrikaans they're like eh, I don't actually understand Afrikaans that good. We should be able to you know they should be able to change it back. So LBL name dot or we can just be lazy and do this. You can make it name. Yeah, it just doesn't look right. Surname. Then age. All right. And then we just have Spanish. Now I don't know any Spanish, so I'm going to go here and name. Nombre. Right, just copy that. Okay, oh wait, we want to do it fast, so let's, let's do this, let's do this, and I think it was nombre, I think, yeah, okay, then surname, All right, and let's see if all of the buttons work. So it is Josh Smith, and he is 19. Now we can reset that. Yes, change it to Afrikaans, English, Spanish. It works perfectly, right? But you know, I once heard from someone who programmed that a good programmer is someone who, who does that extra effort so we're going to go back to reset and we are going to just do this because the main language everyone knows or most people knows is English so if they say clear shouldn't it change back to English for them because let's say they're, they they don't actually know and they just want to go back to where they were. See, let's say they did that and they don't know like what. Okay, which one of these was the one I actually chose? Because people are terrible with actually reading in English, you know. So then you just go reset and there. So today we're going to be working on your basic output. Now, first off, let's start completely from the beginning. Make a new VCL Forms application. All right, I just like that, and then file, save all. Then we can go frm output underscore u. We can copy that. Then we can go frm underscore output p. Okay, here we go. So we're going to start with the basics. Now we're going to add a button. This button is going to do a lot of things. This one particular button. Then we're going to add a label. We're going to add a memo. And that should be all for now. Oh yeah, and probably a good thing to add would be a panel as well. Alright. Okay, now let's just name all of these things. LBL out. You just call them all out. Alright, now with memo, you will see that you don't want that. You don't want that in there. So, what you do is you go to lines, you click on these three, and you just delete. And then say OK. And there we go. Then there's panel. There we go. PNL. We can just yeah we can we can keep it like that okay 
So then we're just going to rename the button to BTN display. And then we're going to make the caption there, display. Now when I click on this button, each one of these will be changing into something. So let's start. Now we can start with the label. Now when they click on the label, they're going to get a basic output. So I'll be on out and then as we all, whoopsie, as we all know by now, the label has a caption. Now, if we were to say cap dot caption, then we can change its caption. Now we shall be going the answer to five times five is. Alright. Okay, now we're going to make this the answer to 5 times 5 is, and this is going to be the answer. So then we can go. Now, this is where you might where it changes a little bit. Now, the, here's the memo. Now, as you can see, we deleted the lines. Um, where's the lines? See, we deleted this part right here. We didn't have a caption. As you can see here, there's no caption. But we do have lines. So we go mem out dot lines dot add and then we go five times five would be twenty five. Now there's a string output. Alright. But what if we don't want a string output? Since we have a panel we can just as well put that to use and go PNL out dot caption because the panel has a caption becomes and then we can go because we're going to times five for five so we're going to go int to string five times five now if we're going to be running it Now, if I say display, the answer to 5 times 5, here is a string, and here is an integer. So those are the basic outputs you can get, but then you also have a show message. Now, a show message is a basically a pop-up box that tells you things. Now, let's go, the answer is... And then we plus it with an int to string five times five. Now display, and then the answer is twenty five. But if we were to not add this and we were just going to say that, we would get an error because you can't have in string and an in integer. It may must both, that this can only take in a string. So you have to convert it from a string, from integer to a string, which is int to string. The same here, if I would want to, if I would want to put it here, I'd have to say int to string first. Otherwise it won't work. Another way, if you don't want it to actually times, you can always just do that but then you won't get the answer already put together so display the answer is 5 times 5 that's just the equation so this was basic output guys So today we're going to be talking about adding, subtracting and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, let's get started. So first off, if you watched my previous video, you would have seen quite a few outputs you can get. So we're just going to use a show message to do everything.
So, first off, let's begin with plus. So we're going to be adding stuff together with plus. So it should be easy. We're, we don't have variables yet, so we're not going to be using that just yet. Uh, I will first want to teach you guys how to make sums. So let's start by just creating a show message. Show message. Okay, and in here we're going to be doing everything. So let's go int to string, and then in here we'll be plusing and stuff. So plus is easy. It is just something like five plus six, and you should get eleven. Yes, eleven. All right, that's easy enough. Remember, guys, this and this and this is not the same. So this will just display five and six. Unlike JavaScript, you can't plus them together if they're strings. Same goes for if you're going to make this one string. It's just going to be a string. It's not going to be adding or subtracting anything. So now we have done plus. Now let's do minus. Minus is pretty easy. Just as plus, it can be int to str. Okay, and then just like 5 minus 5, that should give you 0. See, 0. Very easy. Now this is where it gets a little teensy weensy bit different. Times. Now, let's times 5 by 5. Now, you watched my previous video, you know times is a whatever that is. Now... Yeah, you could go that, but that doesn't work, because X is a letter. We don't want letters, we want that. Um, this is b pretty basic, it's mostly the same in every language. Um, not all of them, of course. For example, BrainFuck, you can't do that. So, uh, yeah, that is times. Show message, 25. Now, then you also get... Divide. Divide. Now, let's divide 25 by 5. That should give you 5, right? But that's a times. So, a divide is a slash. That, that's all it is, a forward slash. And then you divide. Oh, but wait. Into string can't be called with this argument. It's probably because it's a divide. Div. Okay. Now, in a type of divide where you would use it in an into string place like this, you would use a div. And voila! Now, div is something a little bit different, so we're going to be working with the div a little bit later. But if you were, would want to have used it as slash, the actual way people use it, it's going to give you an error. But that is because with a slash, you get returned in real. Now, in real is something that is like a number, dot, or comma, and no, more numbers. Now, also another word for real could be float or even double if you work with Java. Now, to get a float, you just go float to string. Now, this will change it from a double or a real or whatever you want to call it to a string. So, remember, a float is something like 5.67. That's a float. Just 5 is an integer. 5 point anything, like even 5.0, that's not an integer, that's a float. So, now if you go like that, 
and you go like that, you get 5. Yeah, so that is based the basics of dividing times plus and minus. We'll be using this a lot more in the future. So, today we're going to be practicing the basic input. I was going to do variables, but then I said, or then I saw that the book was doing it in chapter 2, which I feel isn't really a good way of doing it, but we're following the book, so we'll be doing it in chapter 2. So, what we have here is three labels. Two just normal labels with captions of first name and surname. They have no actual name, as you can see. Then an output, which is LBL output, which is also a label. Then two edits, which is EDT name and EDT surname, with one button called PT and display. So what's going to happen is we are going to put in insert our name here, insert our surname here, and when we click on this button, this should be the name and surname that we inserted. Basically being hello with the name and in the surname because we want to greet them. So let's open up our button and let's start. So we don't have variables, so it's going to be a little more effort than it has to be, but when they click on a button, LBL, or it's actually a little bit less than you think about it, but anyways, LBL output dot caption becomes now or let's first make it hello. And then just remember the space needs to be here because we want the space between the hello and the name. Plus, and this is where we get our first input. So it was edit name as you, whoopsie, as you remember, this is called edt name. So, oh my gosh. So we're going to go edt name, but. Wait, let's just first keep it like that. Now, if we run it, you see we get an error because edt name is not a string. It is an object because this, these are objects. So we need to get the text inside of these objects because they return text. So it's edt name dot text. Once you learn some JavaScript, this will look really easy, but it should look easy for you right now. So you get the object, and then you turn the text inside of the object. So let's run it now. So now if you just insert some random things, hello, and then the name. See, it works perfectly. Now, let's get the output of the surname. So we're going to create a space, so there's a space between the name and the surname, and then go edt surname dot text. Now, when we run it, I will put in, let's just go neon strike. So hello neon strike. This isn't completely in the center, but that will be okay. Now, as you can see, that is the basic output that you get, or input that you get, excuse me. Okay, so today we'll be looking at the calendar. Now, let's just create a new. Vsounds forms application. We resize this a little bit. Now, what we'll need is one calendar. Don't get it confused with one calendar. Get one calendar and then one edit and one button. So let's get that. Alright, so here we have a calendar, a button, and an edit. Now, what we want to do is we want to put a date in this button, then when they are in this edit, 
Then when you click on this button, wait, you guys know what? Remove this edit, delete. We want a spin edit. So here we have a spin edit. Because this will make the whole process of making sure it's only integers and stuff like that a lot easier. Um, of course it's still easy if you even if you don't use the notes specifically, but anyways. So let's just do this. So then let's rename the button to set date. And then we give it a name of BTN set date. There's no real specific name for calendars as far as I know. So I'm just going to go calendar. Because there's no reason to not have it calendar. So, first thing we're going to do, so we're going to um, limit this to only two numbers. So you can go here to maximum value and minimum value. And you can also change that if you want. And max length. So when you go two, it will stay at two. So we're going to code this in. We're, we don't want to do that. So, first we go to events. Whoopsie. First we go to events and then we go to on activate. Okay. E what wait. Okay. Set date dot max length and then we're going to make it two because we don't want them to put in something like one hundred, you know. Ninety-nine is a for the max. Then we're going to go set date dot nope set eight dot max value and we're going to put that at 31 and then yet again set date dot minimum value and we're going to make it one because we didn't want them to put in zero because there is no date such as zero. Okay, so then we can just save all. So now we have set a minimum value, a maximum value, and a max length. Easy as pie, right? So now we can here go to set date. We can open it up. So now we go to we should click on this and we should put the value up to 1 here as you can see here value we can make it 1 we can hard code that in if you want but we don't want to do that right now okay so then we go to calendar dot day becomes and then edt I mean SED date dot value. These are both integers they take in, so if we're going if we're going to run this, then we should get a right output. So let's make this the fifth. As you can see it went to five. Now I can all just click there and do what you want, but this is best to do. So then we can go 15 set date 15 all right but now we want to be changing the month and the year so let's go to the design but we don't want to get confused so we're going to be going here and saying label month we can just change the name to SED month SED 
year. Now it is actually during good practice to put them all in a way that you can read it. So ACD day. Now we should just go back to the code and edit it. So now let's do the month. Now what we can do is we can do this. We can do exactly this, but do the month. But we won't be doing that since we want to try out more things. So we're going to set the max length to 2, the maximum value to 12, and the minimum value to 1 because you can't have a month less than 0. And then we're going to change the value to 1. See, easy enough. Then we go to year. We're going to give it a max and minimum as well. So max length is 4, because it shouldn't have more than 4. Max value should be, let's say, 2050. So they shouldn't be able to go past that. Minimum value should be 1990. And in the value, we can make that 2000. Or actually, it's 1990. Should be a good place to start since it's the minimum, and you can just take it up. If you had a drop down list, it should, would have been a little bit better, but we don't have that right now. So then we can just code it. And let's see that all of the restrictions work. So here, can we have more than two? No, we can't. More than two? No. More than four? No. Okay, and if I'm correct, you should be able to go up to 13. Yeah, you can go up to 13, you can even go up to 14. But as soon as you press any of these, it won't accept it as well if you click away. So you can put something higher in, but it will restrict you to those specific times. So 32 isn't an option. And 3000 isn't an option either. Okay, so that's good to note, right? So then we can close that. And now we can set date. This should be easy. We can actually just copy this and stuff. Yeah, so let's copy this. It should be a quite fast. Control C, V, V. Now, calendar isn't calendar.day anymore. It's calendar calendar.month. Because we want to change the month now. So, SED month dot value and then here is scd year dot value and calendar dot year pretty easy compared to most languages we can run it there should be no errors and then we can change it to however we want so we make it day five of month three in the year 2000 set date and there we can always make it month 8 set date there you go now we can't see the month but there are ones where we can see the month and you can put them on yourself if you go here to search for calendar then you get month calendar which does give you a few extra details but it's small and you can't really resize it you know so it's not really the best option to have that's why i told you guys to get the normal calendar and you can resize it even if you can't see the specific date right now and hello everybody welcome back to a new video Okay, so today we're going to make a traffic light with Delphi. So we're going to be basically be changing up a bunch of uh, properties of all of these things when um, with code. So yeah, let's get right into it. So let's create a nice GUI for it. Because here in the book they give us a few, they give us what we should do. So we're going to be uh, seeing what we should do. 
and then we will be continuing. So let's see, the button's height should be 100, that's mostly what I wanted. Okay, so let's get the height, the rest we will do ourselves, because I know how to do that. So, let me explain to you after I've changed the height. Okay, now, these we want to be as, we want to have as circles, because the traffic lights use circles and not squares. Or at least here they use circles. So let's first change these to circles. Um, circle. Circle. And circle. So here we are completely leaving the book. Uh, we'll just be completing command like um, make sure the circle turns on and stuff. So first off we want to change this background of the form. We want to make it black because you know they are black there so then we can just uh, make the color black we can actually do that while in the code but let's rather not okay, so now if we run going to run it nothing special is going to happen but it will look more like a traffic light there we go so you can actually make it like the green goes on, then yellow, then red, and you don't have to actually press the buttons, but we're going to press a button, then this light will come on and stuff like that. So let's give them all names. This will be SHP red for shape red. Then we have the buttons. So first let's change their names before we change anything else. So this one's going to be BTN red. So now we can change their caption by doing that. And there, the design is actually ready somewhat. So we want to see these. We don't want to make them black just yet. We want to still be able to see them in the design. So we're going to click on the form and go to events and then on activate. We're going to change the color of the shapes. So when the form activates, we want BTN green to be the color that will be showing. So uh, let's change everything inside of the code here. So then we go um, SHP green access. Uh, okay, cool. SHP green dot uh, wait let me quickly see so it's SHP green F12 click here what's the color change dot brush okay so this is a nice way for if you can't remember you can go look here you can click on it look at an object space so search dot brush and then dot color this is a very useful thing to remember so I suggest you do remember it so it's dot dot brush dot color becomes cl green now that should be correct let's see if it works because if it does work wait let's first save the game because if we save the game we know we won't lose anything so let's go first save save all Alright, so now that we've saved everything, let's run it and see if it's green, then we're doing everything correctly. It's green, we're doing it right. So now we can make the rest black because we don't want them to be seen. So what we can do is we can type all of this over, but that's going to be effort. So let's be lazy and copy it. So then we go SHP yellow and then red. Then we go with both of them, we can go CL black and then here as well we can go see how black now they shouldn't be seeable from when we run it perfect so now you can only see this but clicking on buttons doesn't do anything just yet which is not good because we want to them to work correctly 
So these are pretty simple stuff, um, but I'm still going to do it with you guys, just so you guys can see. So let's take that away. Now first we're going to do green, but green is actually already on, so we want to see if our code actually works. So we're going to go red first. Now I'm just going to copy this and paste it there. Now what we can do is we can retype it or maybe put in specific parameters but that's a lot of effort and you don't really need to do it so we can just go cl black and in here red we can go cl red that saved us a lot of time and a lot of unnecessary coding so now if you press on red it works almost perfectly so let's just quickly fix the design here because that's really annoying looking at that the whole time there we go ah that's gonna look so much better i can put this more into the middle of everything instead of at the top you know and then we can bring then then we can bring this up closer and there we go we have a beautiful traffic line but we are not done yet so we're going to go here we're going to paste it again and we can even this is not good practice, you first finish the code you're actually working with, so don't follow this one, but then we can open green as well. First finish your code, because otherwise you're going to get confused and it's not going to be nice. Damn it, okay, let's copy this, let's paste it here. So this one is already actually done, so we don't have to worry about this one. And this one, on the other hand, is not done, so we can just go CL black. And then we can go here, CL yellow. Now, as far as I know, this should do everything that is required. So we have green, if you click on it, nothing happens. Yellow, red, yellow, green. As you can see, they all work perfectly now. And that wasn't too hard now, was it? It's very basic code. If you can understand this, then I can guarantee you, you'll understand what's coming on in the next video. So we're finally starting with variables. You guys don't understand how excited I am about this. Oh, so then let's click on calculate to open a on click. Can you can you open an on click function, please? There. All right. So there are three types. Now the first two you don't have to really do work with just yet. These are mostly, you know, for you. To later on okay so first you get private declarations now I'm not going to go through the nitty-gritty things I'm just going to tell you guys for now and um, what these are what this one is mostly used for and um, but I'm not going to tell go into the very deep details and tell you guys what specifically you'd use it for that we can do later on once we get to the bigger projects so first off you get private now to declare a variable um, you get the different types of variable you get a string which is a word. Wait, let's let's put this in a, there. So first, you get a string, which becomes a word. For example, uh, my name. That's this is a string. Um, hello. That's a string. A string can also be something like a sentence. For example, how are you? This is a string. Then you get a character. Or a char. This is literally just a, char a character. For example, A or B or C. You know, there's not really a thing too special, you know. So these are the main types of things you'd work with when you talk about strings uh, char not really that much but you do get like once in a while you'll find that now note these are very important in all, almost all programming languages you'd have this you'd have something that is a variable so keep this in mind you gotta get this one underhand so then there's also an integer now integer is basically a number for example 5 or nine or even uh, seven thousand all right but do not confuse it with 
this. This is a string because it is in these quotes. This is a number because it does not have quotes. So keep that in mind because Delphi will see this as a string. Then you get a real or a double. Now in Java you'd usually use a double but in Delphi you have the option to use a real. Now these are basically also numbers but these numbers can be something like 5.79 or 9.0 or even 8,765.987654 This is a real or a double But if you were to put something like this here, it will give you an error because an integer is only whole numbers While a double can be things like this Let's first do this so to declare a variable, you go underneath procedure or pri here private, but we'll get to that later. There's going to be in public, but that's also for a later topic. Put in var to say you're going to start declaring variables here. Now let's go is word of yeah is word, and then you go this. This basically says becomes or is, you know, and you go string. But since Delphi isn't really um, capital sensitive, you can do that or that. It doesn't really matter because on NFD, if you press Ctrl D, it's not going to give you any problems. Okay, so now let's just fix that because that's annoying. Okay, so then we can go like this. Now, how to declare a variable? You can go like S word becomes, and then in these quotation mark things, you can go and make it maybe. Hello. Now, the reason why we say S word with the S and not just word is because when we work with this, this basically tells us this is going to be a string. Because later on, you will be doing things like S word plus int to a string i num. Um, yeah, plus s word two maybe, and things like that. And let's just go like this. We remove that, that, and that. Now, yes, you can still read it, but later on, it's not, it's not going to always stay word. It will change to things like name or even ID number, ID num. Now, ID number can be a string, guys, just like phone number. It's it's you can make it a string. It's not impossible. So it's usually good practice to do that. You don't have to, but it's good practice. Now let's go and declare another string. So to do that you go copy, I mean comma, and is word two. Now you can also do this is word three. Oh, sorry about that free and go string and do it all one by one but Delphi made it easy for you and just made you add you just have to add a comma now we can go s word 2 becomes world world so now we can do this because we have an edit Sorry about that. We have an edit here. This is edit to edit out. Now, when we when say calculate, we're going to like display hello and world as one word. So then we go edit out dot text becomes an s word plus and then a space in between plus s word two. Right now, you might not see the point of all of this. But once we get deeper into this, guys, you're really going to love it. I'm telling you, this is the variables makes everything easier. If you say calculate hello world, that's very nice, right, guys? So basically, this just says um, hello and then plus a space plus world 
that's all that basically says. Remember, you can also put sentences in here. So you could have gone like a sentence and say hello world, and it's one sentence. So yeah. Now let's remove that because it's a calculate. Now we're going to declare an integer. So now we're going to go i num one comma i num two, and we're going to make that an integer. Now let's also go b flag and go boolean. Sorry about that. Boolean. Okay, so now we have a boolean as well. So now we make b flag equal to, or it becomes, excuse me, false for now. It's good to say what it should be at the beginning because, you know, so because sometimes it might be true or false randomly, I don't know. I might just do that at the beginning. So you can go inum1 becomes 5 inum2 becomes and then let, let's also teach you something else let's add math here math now math is something that you use to do math work now in javascript you'd go math.round and then insert whatever you want to round but in here you put math right on the top there and then you go round so it's kind of like math around and then you go like let's say 5.89 now round will round this up or down to the nearest integer for let's say if it's 5.8 it will go to 6 if it's 5.4 it will go to 4 or it will go to 5 excuse me not 4 so yeah, and if it's 5.5, .5, it will go to 6 as well. So it's already halfway, you know. So now we go if i num 2 is equal to, it's going to be 6, then begin, and then we go b flag, b flag becomes true. Now this is a basic example, we'll get to more of this later. And then we can go if b flag equals yeah, if b flag. If it's if you want it to be true, you can just go if b flag. But if you want it to be false, you have to say false. So if it's false, but if it's true, you can actually just go b flag. Or you can go b flag equals true. You can go begin. Just make this a little bit nicer. Then you can go inum1 plus inum2 oh, wait, wait, wait. then you go edt out dot text becomes now note guys an edit cannot take in an integer it is a string holder especially if it's the text then you have to go int to string and you just have to convert these to into strings now the reason why i put all of them in one into string is because if you didn't do that it will basically say five plus six and then you'll just get 56 but if they're still numbers then you go basically five plus 6 which will equal to 11 so that is why you put all both of them into into string not into string this one plus into string item 2 okay good and then you say else so so if b flag is true it will display that else edit out dot text becomes error so let's see if it works calculate and we get 11 this is because b flag is true so let's just tidy this up a bit 
the very okay. So if we were to say if I num equals five, then B flag equals true. So B flag will now become false and it will give us an error. So let's run again. Calculate. See error. So this is just the basics of variables. We'll definitely get deeper into this as we go on because these are very important. You're going to use them a lot later on. So yeah. Now if you declare something here. Now let me show you something. If we're going to let's open it an on form create. So if I'm going to try to use let's say inum to here then it's not going to give me anything so for example let's show message inum wait, int to string inum2 let's run this but oh we are getting an error now why is that this is because inum is basically invisible to everything around it except for this procedure here because it only lasts for from begin to end now this is also very important because this also works a lot in other programming languages this includes javascript java um python almost it i think python i'm not sure it probably does yeah but these are very important to note so this is why you have a private section right there. So let's remove inum2 and declare it here. inum2 integer. Now we have an inum. So let's declare inum here. inum2 becomes, what was inum2? Yeah, let's just copy this. And then paste it here B now when we run it we get a 6 and then we can press calculate and we get an error because remember B flag is false but if we were to make this one invisible and go here to variable I'm I num two integer. We'd still have a bunch of errors because we didn't know what this I num two is. So that is why you have a private declaration place. Now the public one you will almost never use until you start doing projects. So yeah, we'll get to this one later. You don't have to worry yourself about this one just yet. Because we're we don't really we don't really work with those things just yet as either. So yeah. That's all there is for the variables for today guys. <clears throat> if statement in most programming languages is basically exactly the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take an basic example. Now, what an if statement does is, if something is like something, do this. That's basically what you tell an if statement. Let's create another variable called b flag. We'll get more into b flag later. Um, boolean. Now, recap, boolean is true slash false. Now, if you have an if statement, it returns true. Yeah, if the statement is true, then it will do this. If it is not true, it will not do this. Alright? But if the if statement is false, so if it is false, then do this. But we'll get more into how to make something if it's false happen. So for now, let's do this. Okay, so B flag becomes if 5 is bigger than 8. That's false because 5 is smaller than 8. Remember, bigger as sign, 
the this is a mouth remember if you don't know what a bigger ass sign is the big sign is basically a mouth it eats the biggest one so if it doesn't show to the biggest version it means that five is bigger as which is not so it will be false so this is false now this is just an example now we can go b flag now if it is b flag show message hello or well, we let, let's make it actually true okay so we make it true because eight is bigger than five so we make it true now if you run this and we click on this button we get hello now let's make this false again false now if we're going to run this let's also get the code in here like so okay can't move it all right so now we have b flag now when i click this button it's going to check if b flag is true now oh i should have actually started with something else but okay let's first go with this now if i'm going to click it it's not going to do anything because b flag is false good practice would be to just go b flag equals true so if b true so if b flag is true then begin now this is a way to um, kind of validate if it's true or false so you can also go if b flag is false which it is right now because an if statement returns a boolean if the if statement returns true now let's just go if b flag or b flag is true all right so if b flag equals true then it should run this code all right now we have b flag as true now you should be getting to this around right now b flag b flag equals false or true so if b flag is true do this else remember to always use begin and end because otherwise that will later on get errors and stuff like that so we can later go to how not to add begin and end but i highly recommend that you do now now we have a b flag that if it's true it should run this piece of code else otherwise if it is not true it should say show message oh, oopsie bye so if show message hello i mean if, excuse me if b flag is true which it is then run this piece of code run that but do not run this thing because it there does, doesn't have to be an else then but if b flag is false so then it will not run this piece of sorry they will not run this piece of code because then it's false it doesn't go down they will go to else i'm like okay they go something else and show a message so let's make it false so if it's false which it is not because here it says it's true it will say show message hello otherwise it will say bye but right now it will say bye because there we go bye because B flag is not false now i hope you guys are getting to know this a little bit better i'm trying to make it as simple as possible especially if you haven't coded yet like sort of proof programming and this is your first language so yes very important to know now let's let's bring strings in here let's go is name equals Netsu. All right. So now, if its name is equal to Netsu, take note there's a small n there, so that's not going to work. All right. 
then else it will show this now we already have done this so we're going to skip that so now we're going to go to else if now else if is basically like giving another if statement for example run this if this doesn't come back as true try this then if this doesn't come back as true give us this all right now take note you can have as many else if statements in an if statement as you want it's literally up to you you can have a thousand of them and the code will and the computer will be like okay that's fine in literally all programming languages so else if is name equals netsu now this is with a capital n begin always control d Ooh, again i should really start using my mouse okay show message Your name is net. Wait, wait. Your name is, and to use proper coding, plus. So we don't have to change it later if we were to add it, which we won't. But you know, just for the sake of it, your name is Netsu. So now let's run it just to show you that the small letter in will isn't the same as the big letter in. There are errors. Oh, sorry about that. Becomes. <laughs> All right, so let's take note. Is name, if it is equal to netsu of a small n, do this. Else, if it is netsu of a big n, do this. Else, if it is not either of those two, do this. Now, since it's the, it's the second one, it will run the second one. Now, it will always go through the first piece of code first. It will first see if this is true. Never will it begin here. Never in any programming language will it ever begin at the second if statement or at the else statement. It will always begin begin from the first if there is. All right. Now there we go. Your name is Netsu. Now take note. Else if is basically just having an if statement. Begin and then adding another if statement. Just the difference is if this if statement is true and this one is true, they will both run. Well, while in this one, if this one is true, it will run this and it won't run the rest. So that's basically the difference and it's just proper coding if you use an else instead of a bunch of ifs. All right. So now we have covered the basics of if statements. Now we're going to do and. Now what if you want to check if two things are true? For example, if is name is Netsu and B flag 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 is equal to false. Now how would you go about doing this? Because they gave you an error because this is not how it's supposed to work. Now basically what you do is you go like that. You add your brackets. Now, what it will do is it will read if is name equals Netsu. So if the name equals Netsu, they will go and see, oh, and, oh, okay, we shouldn't continue. And if it's this. So if both of these return true, then it will do this. Otherwise, it will start going to the next one. So now let's make this a small n. And keep that true because this one will now not run it will say bye because neither is this one here true because his name yeah his name is the same but b flag is not the same so this one won't run the top one will not run here his name netsu has a capital n so this netsu and this netsu isn't the same so it will go to buy now take note else isn't really necessary you can and of an else if it's just good coding to have an else to make sure if the user enters something they shouldn't or if an error happens in some way it should return something else all right now let's make this false 
Now it will return the first one because now its name and B flag are exactly the same. So the first one will be hello. Okay. Now this is where it gets nice. Now we're going to do or. Now also remember you can do and in as many as you want as well. It's up to you. Basically, you can do whatever you want. Okay, so now we'll do or. Or is the same. You add your bra brackets, put an or in the middle, and add the next view. Okay, so that's useful. Now, if is name is Netsu with a capital N, or B flag is true. So let's let's make it easy for a guy. And B flag equals true. Now remember in future I will not be using equals true in the tutorials just for now to explain. Maybe I will, it depends on how I feel that day. So if B flag is true or Netsu is name is equal to Netsu with a capital N, then get this. Which means if this returns false, this will most likely return true then. Depending. Because if I go yeah, it will most likely return true in this one. So if we go true, this one will be like, nope. Yeah. Nope, it does not. This does not return true. Then we'll go to else then like, ah, yes. Its name is not equal to Netsu, but B flag is equal to true. And it is an or. So we should return your name is Netsu. With a, not a capital N. Your name is Netsu. Now that's or. Now I told you guys about the bigger as or the not, like if not. Now basically how this will be useful is if you just put it around everything. So if his name is not equal to Netsu of a small n, and B flag is not equal to false. So if we go something like Netsu, this will return true because it is not equal to Netsu, okay? It's Netsu. And B flag is true. So if the B flag is true here, that's what it means because it's not. It will return this one. So let's run it and see if it works. We should say get hello. Yes, exactly perfect. And as you see, it didn't run the rest because why should it? It has already given us the first output. So anyways, that is mostly the basics. It is if it's not equal to that, if it is equal to that, if it is equal to this and that, or if it is equal to this or that. And then you have your else. Okay? But just because the if statement ha has an else doesn't mean it has to have one. You could, that is a very valid if statement. In fact, that is also a very valid if statement. That is a completely valid if statement. If statements are really easy to grasp. So today we'll be checking out an input box. We will be using inputs later on because this is actually a big part of Delphi and any developer should actually know how to like get a message to display up and ask a question. Because in certain times and places you might want that or like when a user signs in maybe and you don't want to use a form and you maybe just want them to enter the username or if you want them to search for something you want an input box. So let's. So we have a form. Here. There's a button and there's a edit. Now these don't do anything yet, but when we click on a button, an input box should pop up asking us what's our name, and then it should display it here. And this will basically be the basics, you know. All right. So we can open. Up oh, for some reason it doesn't want to. Let's just go on click. There we go. Now you can open it up and we can start. So 
first thing you want to do is you're just going to go input box because an input box is very easy. Now, input box takes three parameters and they're all three of them are strings. So it's one, two, three. I usually just do that so I remember that it should be free. Now, this part on the input box is like the title. So um, let me show you. Let's go um, name. Now, when we run it, you know what? I actually did something wrong, but anyway, see name. That is basically that part of an input box. Let's just disable this. Gonna be annoying. Okay, so when we click on name, we get an input box that says name. Now that's basically what that is for. Now, usually you don't want to put a lot of text there, just like the basics, um, stuff like what's what's the gist of it, you know? And here is what you put in, like, what is your name? Now when we run this, it's going to ask us what is our name. What is your name? It asks. And as you can see, you can't actually click off of it because you should first insert this, which is a good thing because sometimes if you want to like click off of it and you have to insert that, like if you make a game or something, then it's quite problematic. So what is your name? Now, basically, the third parameter is basically the input or the like what would be inputted, you know. Like, let's say you want a default value to be an input unless the user changes it. Or like, let's say, net. That's what I use on most of my games. It's my username, usually. So I go Netsu, and now when I click on this, it displays Netsu in here first. So, parameter 1, parameter 2, and parameter 3. What this takes in is basically the third parameter. But if you have been watching my video, you're going to already catch on something with what I just did um, because it's going to be a little problematic if we just want to display this inside of the edit so if you watch my previous video on variables you'd know we probably need something like a string let's go is name string now we have a string so what we're going to do is we're going to assign is name to the input box so is name becomes and then input box now basically when it runs it's going to read this and once it sees input box it's going to execute any function basically executes this is a function we'll later on we'll get deeper into functions because you can make your own in Delphi or the most program programming languages you can but basically a function you can assign like a variable to a function and once Delphi sees but hey that's a function it executes the variable basically so now we want to display the name inside of that edit right so now I can go edt output dot text becomes is name Oops, sorry about that is name so now it's going to read this, and once I've input a name, it's going to display it into the edit. For example, let's run it. So we want it to display Netsu, right? So now if we say OK, cancel will just stop the operation. Oh wait, no it doesn't. Okay, you'll have to go to cancel. Okay, so basically, let's start this one over. So let's click on name. Now it's going to display it to if I press OK or cancel. Um, you can code what happens here because this returns true and this returns false. But we won't be getting into that right now. We'll be leaving that for a later session. So now it's going to display Netsu if I press OK. As you can see, it displays Netsu. But it doesn't just display Netsu. You can also put something else like um, Steve's teacher. If you say OK, you get Steve's teacher. But if you put in something like 32, it will automatically turn it into a string.
today we'll be working with constants. Now, constants aren't really that important in Delphi, especially if you're doing Delphi in school, then most of the time you'll actually get the constants and you don't have to insert them, but still it's good to know how they work, how to add them and stuff like that. For in case, let's say you don't use constants, you're not in school, but you still use Delphi, but you know. So let's add a button and an edit. Now the plan is, well, let's, try, no, let's just add a button. So the plan is, once you press the button, you, a price will, or, or let's, add an, let's add an edit. That's, okay, yeah, so there's an edit. Sorry about that. Okay, so, let's just resize this to look perfect, select it, and just so we don't get annoyed, we can say, yeah, position, and we can just put it in the center. Okay, cool. So when you click on the button, it should take this value and add VAT to it. Since VAT is a constant and never changes, so a constant is something that never changes. If you try and change a constant, you'll get an error unless you change the constant where it was declared. Anyways, so let's just rename this button. We don't even have to give him names. Let's just rename him to uh, get VAT. And in this one, we can just this one I'll rename because it just makes that one easier. The button we can just keep it the same. Uh, e edt price, and then we can just change the text to nothing. Oh, wait, let, let's give it a value. Let's give it the vat of one hundred would be forty. I'm forty. I mean 15 because that is 15. Okay, so let's go into get that. Now, usually you kind of like put constants somewhere here, but we will not be doing that. Or wait, yeah, we will be doing that. Yeah. So under implementation, we'll be putting constants there. That is where you should be putting constants. So how to put a constant there? First thing you do is you go which is, oh man. Okay, cool. Now let's just do that. So it looks nice over there. So then we can go const, which will kind of like variable, you know, like var. It's just different because it's a constant. So you can't change it in code. You can't make constant that equal to, if it's already 14, you can't make it 15, you know. Okay, so let's go that you make it equal to 0 0.15 now this might ring a few bells in your head because like how does that constant know that that should be a double or a real now constants kind of work this out for you so you don't have to say it's integer you don't have to say it's something else for example um uh name name when you declare constants try and keep him you know, in capital letters, just for, just to make it easier. You know, like, because this is how most programming languages work. You just, if you declare a constant, you make it full capital letters, so you know when it should happen, or when it's a constant and stuff like that. It makes the reading easier. And anyway, so that's how you declare a constant. Um, basically, you don't have to go like the integers and stuff like that. You just like, okay, so let's leave it there. Then we can start going to, you make it our price become, oh, our price is in real. So let's just add a variable. So we add a variable our price. Now we're going to get our price from EDT price. And then we're going to get, we're going to get the VAT from it. And we're going to display it on a show message. So let's go our price becomes ed price dot text but then we go put this in brackets and then we go string to float. So now we will get a real because string to float. So now we have our price. 
Now we should probably like get. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's get comma or that. So that's not in. So let's make this fat rate. Okay. So now we can go or that becomes um, that rate oh, wait, wait let's go or price times the bat rate because if we if 0 0.15 percent is the is the bat rate in South Africa so if we times 100 with 0 0.15 we will get 15 right so let's do that. Then we go show message uh, uh, format float. Okay, so then we can go R zero point zero zero, and it will be uh, R bat. Now I'm pretty sure I did explain this in my earlier video, but for in case. Basically, what's happening here is I'm saying show the message format float. This will format your reel to a string. And unlike um, floaty string would work, you can like say R or you can put a dollar sign there or something like that. And it will round it off to the amount of decibels you want it to. So let's say you want it to only show an integer value or you only want one decibel after that. That's how it works basically. And then it, ta it takes it from this value right here. Okay, so let's go control D just to make things easier. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Okay. So now let's run it. There shouldn't be any errors. And then let's show you how that beautiful R VAT works. Now it's 100. So let's get the VAT value. And it's 15 Rand. Perfect. Let's disable this. Okay, so now let's try and change the VAT value since we know we can't do it, you know. So let's just to show you how it works. So VAT rate becomes 10. Oh, sorry about that, 10. Now let's run and compile this. There's an error, error. because left side cannot be assigned to. This one cannot be assigned to a different number because it's a constant. You can't change a constant once it has been declared unless you do it here and make this like 19 or something like that. Okay? That is also why once you do the like also complete and you go batch rate, it automatically tells you it's 0 0.15. It's not something to be changed. And yeah, that is the basics of constants. Noise. So today we're going to talk about something pretty basic, but you have to know this in order to be good at programming, uh, because otherwise you're going to get lost in your whole thing you're trying to do. So today we'll be talking about the IPO. Now IPO stands for Input Process Output. Now it's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll explain it anyways. So basically what it means is how your programming works. It gets an input, it processes that input, and it gives an output for that input. So here I have a small example. So it takes the input, which will be something like name or something like that. It processes the output, which we'll be looking at right now. Just give me a few seconds. And then it gives you an output. So let's quickly go here. And let's just add a lot of text here before I explain it. Okay, now we have it. So let, let me show you. So first, I'm going to put my name in here. That's an input. Then I'm going to process this input, which will, this is the process. 
This is processing the input. The, actually, this whole thing is a process. It's a procedure, but it processes the input. So, it takes the input right here, and it puts it in the output. You should be understanding this part by now, if you have been watching the whole tutorial. So, this is an output, but it's the input, but it takes the input, processes it into the output, and it says, take what's ever in the input and say that plus it is, is cool, like, Nitsu is cool, you know? And then this plate here, because that's the output. So this plate in the output. So basically the process is just making it work. So let me show you how it runs. Alright, so here we have it. So here's the input, so let's give an input of Nitsu. Now we're going to process, oh, I forgot to clear it, no, let's clear it like this, okay, so here's the input, so I'm going to process this input so it gives me an output of net so it's cool, so input, process, output, that's pretty cool isn't it, so that's, it that's all actually to input, process, output. So basically we need three images. So let's go image, image, image. Okay, we need one label, it seems. Label. We need three panels. One panel, one panel, one panel. And we need two buttons. But let's first. Um, save these panels from each other All right there and now I'll click on that and then we add two buttons button button All right now we can just do that All right, so in here we're going to add three images We will we can just uh, go here and add images here. I'm not going to code images in Rarely ever will we have to do that. I haven't done it even in a test So yeah we all know how to load an image, we have watched that video. Alright, so now let's go to my pictures. Alright, now pretend all of these are movies. Dorian the Franks is actually serious, so we don't have to worry about that. You can call... Okay, so these three are all movies. Okay. This is Linux the movie. This is Doki Doki Literature Club the live action. And uh, this is Darling in the Franks. Alright, so now we have our movies. Now let's edit label to say. Looks terrible, but it's fine. Okay, so we can resize these to be about this size. Now we're going to keep all of these in name, so there's going to be image Linux. Darling. Now these panels will be keeping the votes. So they just give me all names as well. Oop. Uh, name, 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 name. There, okay. PNL Linux. Okay, so we're getting there, guys. Now let's just change all of the captions to zero. Right, there we go. So now that we have this, we can maybe like move a little bit um, more up. Yeah, I guess that will work. Then there's one button for reset. Oh, that's a bit button. Hey, excuse me, that's my fault. Let's add a bit button. That's also a bit button. Oh my gosh. Bit button. Because now I have two bit buttons. So this one will be... Oh wait, let's first go to kind. Let's change your kind. Maybe we're lucky and they will change the name for us. Uh, wait, let's go... Bits BTN close. 
Okay, so let's put button close. And it's kind shall be close. I see the change for us. This one's kind will be a reset or retry. But we'll change the caption to reset. Name bit btn uh, reset. Right, then the caption can be and reset. Alright, so now we have the basic layout. So let's save everything. Alright, control shift this. So what's gonna happen is once they click on these, they're going to um their cursor will be turning to finger and once they click on it, this will increase and basically everyone can vote. The one that they choose will on the end of the day play like at school or something. You know, I, I'm not sure how to explain it. So yeah, we can maybe just go to cursor here and make it 10 points, points, and 10 points. We don't have to code that in. Then we can run it just to make sure that everything works fine so far. All right, so here we have it. 10 point, 10 point, 10 point. Once I click on it, these should change. Close works. All right, so I don't think we have talked about reset yet. Reset, you do have to code. Unfortunately, you can't just say reset because unlike close, which if you say close, it closes everything automatically. Um, so yeah, we ha will have to do this, but we'll get to that. So we're going to code these all of them individually. We can create our own procedure, but we don't know how to do that yet now, do we? So we're going to code them all individually. Individually. So then I'm going to go. I vote and integer. Just make sure that you say it's variable. Okay. So now we have a vote, and then when they on click. So then we can go I vote becomes I vote plus one. Something's kind of telling me this should be a public or a private variable. And in the on form activate, we should make it zero because otherwise we might find a problem. So let's do that just to be safe. We create a form activate or form create, whichever one you get. So then I'm going to go I vote, uh, which is the first one. We can remove this for now and we can remove this for now. Then here at private, we can go. Now, once they click on Linux, I vote Linux will become I vote. Ooh, sorry about that. I vote Linux plus one. Now, so for what we have is once they activate the form, all of these votes becomes zero. All right, that's good. We need that. Then once they click on I vote Linux, I vote Linux, which is now zero will become I vote Linux, that's 0, plus 1, then it's 1. And then if you click on it again, it will become 1 plus 1, that's 2. So it's basically, if you know some Java or JavaScript or any other programming language, it's basically I vote Linux plus plus. It's basically that, but sadly we can't do that. We can always, however, go inc I vote Linux. Now what ink does, it increments whichever and what is ever inside of here. So basically this whole thing is equal to this. So we're going to use that to shorten our code. So ink means basically I vote Linux becomes I vote Linux plus one. All right, wait, let's keep that earlier piece of code here just as an example. Slash, okay. 
and then PNL Linux dot caption becomes int to string I vote Linux. Now let's see if this works. So let's run. Okay, I click on it, it works. All right, that's nice. So basically we have our template for everything right now. Let's read just in that. So we can just click on that, copy this, paste it in there, just change it to I vote DLC and make I vote DLC. Then we can go in here, we can paste it again. I vote darling. I vote darling. P and L darling. P and L DLC. Okay, if you're going to be lazy, you should just remember to fix everything. Otherwise, you might have problems. All right. So that is basically for that part of the code. We have just all right. So. Throwing the Franks the movie, the LC, the live action, and Linux the movie. Basically, everyone can say which one they want to watch. We all know Darling the Franks is actually trash if it wasn't for 0 2, so it gets the least votes. Alright, we have the first part, but reset still doesn't do anything. Well, basically, we have already coded reset as well. There, let's, let's copy that, and then we can just copy that. I don't want to type all this out. It's a lot to type out, and if you're lazy like me, this just copying it just makes it feel so much easier. Press Control D, press Control S, run it, and now it should work because we did everything we need to. So if you do your code from the very beginning correct it makes everything easier later on so reset perfect so I'll start from one again reset perfect start from one again easy as that now I told you guys everything about ifs and else and stuff like that in the previous video right well you're wrong because I did not in fact, I kind of just scratched the surface and I kind of forgot really important expressions. Now, <laughs> so what we're going to do is not equal to, greater than, or equal to, and gray and smaller than, or equal to, or less than, or equal to, however you want to call it, variable is name. Okay, we will make another string. string. Wait, 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 wait. Let, let's go a little bit more around the table. Our total, let's go our total, and we make our total equal to a real, or if you like Java, double. But I enjoy real. Now, basically, we're going to make our total, it's going to be, let's say, 55.8 Okay Now if If Our total Now I'm not going to go through the whole thing about what's an if statement how it works and all that You guys know that I'm just going to show you guys The as they call it Rational operators That I forgot to show you guys Because I showed you equal Big uh, small, Smaller than Bigger than all that kind of shit okay so if our total and now I'm going to show you is not equal to in most programming languages it will be this but that will be like excuse me am I a joke to you so it's going to be not not equal so basically it's not if it's not bigger or smaller than okay and it is not equal okay no, just don't put it equal there right if it's not equal bigger than or smaller than then if it is not, basically it's the same value as not. 
it is just in form of a operator okay so if you like using an operator use the operator i highly recommend it use the operator but if you don't want to use the operator it is perfectly fine to just go if not or total is equal to whatever okay so if our total is not equal to 10.9 begin show message hello so we have already gone for your film about how this works and i'll let you guys should know that by now especially if you watched my previous video which was way too long than it had to be so if our total is not bigger than smaller than or equal to that means if it is not equal to 10.9 then give us this and our total is equal to 55.8 so it's definitely not 10.9 now if you would run this click the button you will get hello perfect right so now you have that now we can show you smaller than or equal to. So if our total is smaller than or equal to 10.9, show this message, but it is not. Our total is not smaller than or equal to 10.9. So this will not be working. Click the button as many times as you want. It's not going to run this code at all. Okay, we're going to put our total that all time. But if it is bigger than or equal to, this means if our total is 10.9 or anywhere bigger than that, give us this output. Which, in fact, it is because it is bigger than 10.9. So, now, basically, what we're doing here is we're just saying if our total is bigger than 10.8. But if you go big or equal to, we can go... 10.9 because now it takes into consideration the part it starts with when it's just bigger than it means if our total is 10.8 it will not run the code but if our total is 10.9 it will run the code or now let, let's um if it is 10.8 okay so if it is bigger than 10.8, give us this output. Okay, let's just do it and show you guys how it works. Now, press the button. Sumima saying what? I I thought that uh, I maybe did something wrong. It's because I didn't add that last decibel there. So yeah, just remember that. Because otherwise, it 8.0 and basically everything inside 80. Somewhat, not to say it is. Okay, so just remember that. So now, if you run it. It will not run the code but if our total is 8t is 10.87 which is bigger than 10.86 bigger than and you run the code you will get the output i total in integer okay i total becomes 900 okay so if i total and let's start over with that is bigger than 900 so now it will return false because our i total is equal to not 900 but not bigger than so press the button press many times you want it will not work but if i total is bigger or equal to 900 which means it takes this into consideration it will run the code okay so just remember reels are kind of a little bit of a gray area when it comes to if statements you will really ever actually need to compare them like this usually it's more like two variables you compare which usually works slightly better in some cases so yes now that's bigger or equal to and not that's basically what i wanted to show you guys So today we're going to continue with the if statement and we're going to go to more like if in. Now I'm going to tell you now where it is. So let's create two variables. Variable 
is text which will be a string make it three variables and in i i num and uh, i which will be integers now usually the algorithmic i num equal to five now usually let's say you don't know what i num would be because they entered it into an edit for example and you don't know what they're going to enter so usually you'd go like if i num is equal to one or i num is equal to two until you get to like 10 9 or 10 or something like that now you don't actually want to do this because this is a long and very um because it's bad practice, especially in Delphi. In other programming languages, maybe not, but in Delphi it is. So, and I actually hope they actually some at some point add these into more programming languages. But that I'm going to show right now because it actually is a is very useful, and you don't see it in a lot of programming languages. So let's go. If I count, I mean I know. And then n and right now this is basically if this is in this array which we'll get to later on so if i num is from one to nine meaning if the number in i num is one or nine or one two three four five six seven eight nine then it will do whatever happen whatever is here for example, let's make it, or let's go 1 to 5. Alright, so it is 5, as you can see. Or let's make it even more specific, 0 to 5. There we go. Then it's going to show, show message found number. Alright, so if the number in inum is 0 to 5 if it's one of those numbers 1 0 1 2 3 4 or 5 then it will do this otherwise it will not do this there's an error ah sorry about that it becomes there now let's run it and i'll show you now because inum is 5 it's going to return found number but now look at this if i num is six because it's not in zero to five it's going to not do anything this is because unless we actually increase this to like a nine it's not going to actually do anything So today we're going to be checking out the checkbox. Now, basically, what is a checkbox? A checkbox is basically giving you an option to choose something. If you click, if you check it, then you're choosing it. If you don't check it, then you're not choosing it. Not to be confused with a radio button. Because there's too many cases where these two are conf getting confused by. Now, the difference between a radio button and a checkbox is a radio button, let's say you have two radio buttons, only one of those buttons can be checked. With a checkbox, if you have more than one checkbox, then more than one checkbox can be checked. But with a radio button, only one can be checked. But we'll get to more to radio buttons later. So here I have my checkbox, you can go get it here in the two panel by, by, by um, searching for checkbox. Before you also do that, let's make this contract. Okay, that's a contract. And then the name should be, the name for a checkbox would be CBX or CMB. But I go CBX just because checkbox just feels better. And then contract. Alright, 
So now we have everything not really working, but we're getting there. So let's see here. What do we have? We have bit button one, which is close. You don't have to code there. Beat it, calculate. Now this is basically what's going to happen here inside the panel. First, you have the cost per SMS in cents. So it says 30 cents. And then you have the number of SMSs. Let's say they went ahead and sent 10 SMSs. Then it would be 300 cents on the end of the day. But if they choose, and the output will be here, and I'll be allowed, but it's here, you just can't see it, but it's there. But anyways, then if they click on contract, if they check it, then basically they the first 20 SMSs are free. Not really the best math question you can get, but it's in the book. You can go read it up. This is just to get you into the intro. You might do another video on this. Okay, now let's begin. We get to calculate. Maybe add a few variables. Then I price becomes EDT cost dot text. But this is an integer, so this isn't going to work very well. So it should be str to int. Now that will give you an integer. Now to make it safe so that it don't like um, add strings into it when they shouldn't, we can go here and there's a checkbox, checkbox as you can see, right around here that says numbers only. Just set that to true. So now they can't put letters in there. And that's what we want. All right, so now we've set the price. Then I num SMS becomes EDT cost dot text. Oh, EDT cost, excuse me. SED num SMS dot value. All right. Now let's just give a set value here for in case they decide to try and um, do something. They just click and not actually look at it. Um, it's just good practice to try and do that. You can also force it to have at least a value, but we're not going to do that. So let's go to text, and in text we just add a zero. Or let, let's go for practice. We make it thirty, thirty cents. All right. Then we get to calculate. Now we can go if CBX contract dot checked. Now this sees if the user checked the contract checkbox and it will return true if it does. So if if this is checked, then we're going to go so first we can do we, we have too many ways of doing this. So my suggestion is we go inum SMSs and we minus it by 20. But that might be problematic because then the price might go into the minus. So then wait, let's go if inum SMS is more than 10. Begin. So if it's more than 10, then it goes inum SMS minus 10. Or inum SMS becomes inum SMS minus 10. So basically, it will just minus it. Else, inum SMS becomes zero. So if it's less than 10 and this is checked, so they have the contract that might, wait, it's minus by 20, right? Oh, excuse me. So if it's more than 20, then on um, gets minus by 20. Else, it just becomes zero because then they have nothing to pay because they're in a contract. 
All right. Then we can go I price wait. Um, LBL output dot text. I mean dot caption becomes, and then we can just go here. The book says we should say total cost equals and a rand sign, all that. Okay. So maybe we should just add a real here. So our final price or total price, whatever you want. Okay. Then we can go. Our final price becomes inum SNS times I price. So now they will give us the amount. But this isn't really what I want. So let's put this in brackets. We don't want it to return that. We want then to divide. Wait, sorry. Take that and then divide it by 60. Because we want it in rands or in dollars or whatever you want. So we divide it by 60, which will give us rand. So total price equals and then we can actually go format float because I believe that would be better format float and then we have r 0, 0.00 comma and then our final price now let's just check here and see if we have everything the way we need so if it's checked then if the SMS is more than 20, that happens, else it becomes zero. If this happens, then the whole thing just becomes zero. Which might become problematic because you can't divide. Zero can't be divided by 60 because you can't divide with a zero. So that might become a little bit of a problem. So we can do this. All right, and then here we can go our final price becomes zero and then this will be the output but the output shouldn't be there if you want to be honest because this is an if statement we should probably put something outside of this if statement should we not put that there and then else if it is not checked else then our final price becomes and we can actually just copy this there we won't have to worry about this that it might be zero as long as their number of SMSs are not zero which it should not be because you know anyways so I believe this looks alright. Fine, let's run it and see if you find any errors or anything like that. Let's get a new label. Label, you replace it, and you go total so we don't get the same error again. Price equals, and basically it will just be replaced later with a number so then we can go just to the name LBL price then okay Oops, sorry about that uh, LBL price yes all right run it Okay, so now let's make it 100 again. We calculated it. it's 50 rand. Is that right? I have no idea. Uh, let's get a calculator out here. All right, so then it is 30 times 100. That's 3000. Okay, yeah. Divided by 60, that's 50. Yeah, okay, it's 50 rand. Just making sure. All right, now if we get to first 23 then we it's only 40 rand 
That seems about right. Yeah, 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 that is right. Okay, so it's 40 rand, so this works. So if it's checked, then it's 40 rand. If it's not checked, then you don't get the first 23. Now, since we made sure, if you do put two there and go like that, it's going to be zero because they're getting it for free, and without it, it's going to be one rand. Basically, that's how checkbox works. So, to just confirm with you guys, if CBX contract or check, that returns true, which means you can put it in a boolean. For example, B flag becomes CBX checkbox of checked, and it will work because it's a boolean. It returns a boolean, true or false. You can also, if you don't still don't quite understand, you can go here and you go to check. Here, as you can see, it's false, and if you check it, it's true, and it becomes checked here as well. All right, so that can help you. So a radio button, as you can remember, maybe when I talked about the uh, check buttons and as checklist or anything with check, you would have noticed that there were two things: a checkbox, right, this thing right here, and a radio button right here. So what is the difference? Well, if you can remember in one of my previous tutorials, the difference is with a checkbox, if you have multiple checkboxes, you can click every one of those checkboxes. For example, let's say you go to order something at the pizza store and they say, what do you want on your pizza? Then you check macaroni or salami, chicken, I don't know, but you can check all three of them. You don't have to worry. We're with a radio button. Let's say we talk about gender. Now, what you do then is you'd have a radio button because only one can be chosen. So then you'd have, let's say, three radio buttons. One saying male, other saying female, and another saying other. Then basically what you do is you'd let the user choose whether they are male, female, or a different gender. Easy as that. And that's the difference. A radio button can only allow you to choose one of the radio buttons, while a checkbox can uh, can check all of the boxes and still be okay with it. So, yeah. Now let's get to doing radio buttons. We won't be just doing normal radio buttons because they are inferior to what we are going to be using. We are going to use a radio group. Now basically what a radio group is, it's just a bunch of radio buttons in one group. It's the same thing as having multiple radio buttons from your, from here, like adding five radio buttons, but this time they're in a group. So which means if you move the group, all of them move along and you don't have to choose every single one of them because all of them will be moving along with this one. Also you can give the radio group a name, like let's say gender for example, let's actually go, for that. Uh, let's go to quick edit. Then we can go uh, radio button group gender and let's go here uh, gender gender there we go now you have a radio button group let's also add a button right here to add some functionality now how would you go about adding options to this well to do that you can go to items right here in the object inspector and then you can just add your items. For example, male, female, female, other. Now you can choose what gender you want to be. And another nice thing you might want to add is if you click on this right here, you might want to go item index right there. Now the item index is basically where the item will be. For example, let's say if it's at index zero, then it will start at male. If it's at index one, it will start at female, and if it's at index 2, then it will be other. Now let's put ours at other, and yeah, so for right now, this is fine. Now what we can do is, you know, just, we don't even need to edit the button, we can just click on it. Now to modify, on oh no, to, to get information from this, also before I forget, another thing about radio buttons, or oh, let's actually run this. Another thing about radio buttons, or I hate it when I can't move it, about radio buttons are, you cannot unselect. Once you have selected one, you cannot unselect. 
that's why it's good to give it an item index for in case they have to choose an option because then they have to choose one otherwise they might choose the wrong one so yeah with a checkbox if you select it you can unselect it easy as that Okay, so let's try this again. Uh, we can maybe just fix this, put it in the middle of the screen. Okay. Let's practice our case a little bit. So let's go case RBG gender dot item index of and your item index is zero, which is male. Then we'll go show message. You are male. If it's one, then they are female. And if it's two, then Okay, and so yeah, that's basic. So let's let's go over this. So it goes case RGB item index of this basically just goes like this. So it selects this RBG gender, then it finds item index. So then it goes item index. Here's item index. Then it goes here and it checks if it's zero. So if the item index here is zero then it's male then it checks if it's one if item index is one then it will be female and then it checks two and if item index is two then it would be other so let's run the program and test it out a little bit so let's say I am male you are male female you are female other you do not identify as male or female. And that is how the basic checkbox works. Of course, if you really hate it, of course, if you want to, you can go variable by num and just put it into an integer. And you just go cut this by num becomes, and you just paste that in there. And go by num. Easy as that. And it would still work. And that is all. That's how the basic radio button works. Okay, so let's talk about the case statement. Now, the case statement, also known as the switch case statement, is basically an if statement just improved a little bit but before we get to that I want to show you guys a cool trick for in the future when you guys maybe want to work maybe create your own GUI so you right click on a component and just say quick edit that allows you to not only change the name to let's say edit in the number and in the text to let's go let's make a one okay and then with the button you can do the same it is really, really, really nice. Eating a case, you just say click me, and boom, there you don't have to go for all that. Anyways, so let's go with the case thing. So, what? Well, let, let's create the case thing first. So, let's create a few variables and assign the variable. So here we have assigned the variable and we have created it. And also another interesting thing, um, if you ever wonder where this string to int comes from, it actually comes from system utils, which is kind of nice. But that's just some extra information. Anyways, so what we're basically getting is the number that the user inputs. Now I'm going to show you guys how you can go with using a case statement instead of an if statement to do things like this. So, let's quickly do this with an if statement. Let's say if i num is equal to 1, then what they should do is they should, let's say, get a message that says, hey, that's oh gosh I can't do that hey that's one okay and that's basic if statement and let's say else if the number i num is equal to two 
then begin. Show message. And we can then go number two is selected. I don't know. Okay. So basically, this is a basic if statement. Now, didn't that take quite a while to write? Now, let's quickly show you the case thing. If you type case and you press space, then a nice thing is. You can go case of i num, and then you can go to the inside. And let's say if it's one, then you put it one colon. And if you go to the bottom, you can get show message. We can actually just copy this if you think about it. And there we go. Now, if we go to colon and we do this. This is basically the same as this. For example, let's quickly comment this out and run the application and see what happens. Then right here, if we say one, hey, that's one. And if we make it two, that's two. Okay, now let's uncomment that and recomment this. Well, not recomment, just comment that. Now let's attempt it again. If it's one, it says, hey, that's one. If it's two, it says, hey, that's two or two, number two is selected. So you might be asking yourself, why use a case statement if you can use an if statement? Well, first of all, a case statement is faster. You just say case and you say which variable you want to check. In this case, that basically. And if it's one, basically, if you say if it's equal to one, then do this, do this. Else, if i num is two, if i num is two, do this. Now that's nice, right? But why? Why would you rather use this if if statements might be easier? Because reading an if statement is a lot easier than reading a case statement in most cases for beginners. Well, the thing is, case statements have a little bit of an advantage above if statements in most languages. If you are developing a game, for example, then writing a bunch of if statements could potentially slow down the game. Not that, it's not to say it will, but an if statement basically goes like this. It first reads, if inum is equal to one, then it's go, okay, let's go here. But if it's not, it's gonna be like inum, if it's equal to one, okay, it's not equal to one, okay, let's continue inum is equal to two, um, no, it's not equal to two, continue. It's going to go like that. But if it's a case statement, it's go i case, or, or not case, case inum. And it's going to check what the number is or what the value is. And then it's going to say nope, nope, and it's going to find the value it wants. You know, it's, it's a lot faster in terms of that. Now, what if you wanted to add multiple lines, for example? Let's say if it's free, you wanted to do multiple things. Then you can go begin and you create your own little code block. And you can say show message. Oh gosh. Show message free is the key. And we can then go, um, let's say, bt in case dot caption. Cap becomes free. Free. Let's put it that. Okay. Now you can add more than one thing here, and there shouldn't be any errors. As we put free there, boom. Free is the key, and it changes the caption to free. Now you might be also thinking. Okay, let's quick look at this. What if you want to do this? I'm. Uh, and else if inum is bigger than three, for example, and then write your begin and stuff like that, and else if, okay, and then write your code in here. Now, there's not a specific way, as far as I know, to actually do this in a case statement in Delphi, but what you can do is let's go for 
for dot dot and let's say 99. Now basically what this does is it says if I now is more or equal to 4 yeah it, it just says if it's more or equal to 4 and I num is less or equal to 99 dude th this is basically what this says so whilst you cannot specifically do that and not have this you can have this. You, it's just going to be in a specific little section. So if the user is like 100, it might not work. But then you can go show message. Uh, that's a. Oh gosh, I forget you can do that. That's a big number. And yeah, then. If it's between 4 to 19, let's just not slap the if statement run. And let's say we put in 89. That's a big number. But then you might go, okay, but what if it goes out of bounds? What, what if they cannot do this? What, what if it goes above that? Then what you can do is you can go begin. And you can add your begin and end there and you can go else. And then you can add your begin again and go show uh, show message oof no number found then if you were to run this and put 100 here oof no number found even though it is out of bounds with the 99 it will still allow you to do this, it will still give you the extra option. So basically, it's going to read this, and then it's going to see there's nothing else there, and it's going to say, but then it's going to decide. Okay, let's go in. Boom, it's going to go in. But that's why Delphi does this. Why right, this line, this else, is at this line when you press Control D. Even if you put it back there at the end. Press Control D. It's going to go back here because it's going to see. Okay, so. If none of these are working, then it's anyways going to skip to the else, and it's going to execute this. And that is basically the case. You don't need to use the case. If you like using if statements, then it's personal preference. I personally used to love using the if statement. I always used if statements because it was easy and you know, I just never struggled with it. But as I grew more experienced in programming, I switched a little bit more to using cases instead of ifs. Just because I find it to be faster. And not, not in terms of the, the code that executes, in terms of me programming. I can just say case and start typing. I don't have to write the entire if statement. I just find it faster and at the end of the day, even easier to read now. But if you're a beginner, or not even a beginner, if you're a, an experienced programmer, you do not need to use case statements. It is truly personal preference because the if statement is literally nanoseconds slower than the case statement. So even in time, in terms of making game, it doesn't really matter that much. But anyways, this is the basic case statement. You can use it, and you can. And enjoy using it, or not enjoy using it. You don't even need to remember about it. You just need to know it exists. Alright, so you all remember the case statements, right? Basically, you put in the variable you want, what it should be between. You get your output that you want. You can put begin, you can put end, all of that. Now, we are going to be covering uh, case lists. Now I don't know if this is exclusive to Delphi, but um, you can kind of put your case statements in a list. For example, case I mark of, and then you can go. Let's say like like the book does it. Twenty nine. Then show message. 
Oopsie. Eat. You chose twenty one. I mean twenty nine. Just my typing. All right. Then you have your what the heck? Then you have your um, next part of the statement that you can go like this. Let's say two, four, three, five, eight, nine. Show message uh, your number is measure equal to 10. All right now, basically this is kind of a list. This is where the um, case lists, the list part of the name comes in. Because you can kind of list the numbers if you work with numbers or even with strings, you list them there and you can get your output now but let, let's show you another example of this let's go um, so then you have 100 dot dot 200 in normal case statement uh, slash slash code or put your code there then it does whatever you want then you also have then you can mix them you can like get them all tangled up then you can have like uh, 23 comma 400 comma 600 to a thousand all right so basically that that's a case list so you can just make things kind of in a list there it's nothing special <laughs> But it can make the programming um, time decrease of quite a lot, and I think it maybe runs a little bit faster than an if statement. But don't take my word for it because I don't know. So, yeah. Today we are going to be covering the for loop. Now, what is a for loop? Or more perfectly to say, what is a loop? Now a loop is something that basically gets done over and over again. If you have ever like delved into game development or anything around there, you might have heard about a game loop. Now let's say a program runs. Let me see that some code here. So let's say we run this program. Now the thing that makes this program stay on top of the screen and not just automatically close is its loop. It's a loop that helps the application run. This is basically a game loop but for applications. Now this loop will stop running as soon as I press X. And then once the loop stops running, there's no reason for the code to repeat itself and stay on top. So let's give you an actual example. Let's create a variable i, which is an integer. And let's do a for loop. Now to do a for loop, you just have to go for and press space. Now if you should automatically create it all for you. Now for i becomes, let's say i becomes 1 at this moment. And then let's say 212. And it's going to begin at the end. Now basically what this says, i becomes 1. And run this loop. Then once the loop reaches its end right here, i becomes 2. And then runs the loop again. And then i becomes 3 once it reaches the end, and so on until i is 12. So let me show you an example. Let's make this smaller. Let's make this 5. Now I'll go a show message. And let me show you what will happen if you run this. Now if you press the button, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And i printed out i towards the screen. This loop will basically allow us to execute code continuously. But basically, just remember that this is just a loop that will continuously run over and over again until it reaches its end point. So, there's another way you can use this loop. You can use down to. Now, this is basically backwards. You can count downwards from 5 to 1. So i becomes 5 and it will basically 
what will happen then is r will become i minus 1. This is basically what will happen. And then it's going to drag until it gets to 1. So if we run this again, click the button, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. And that is the basics of for loops. Just note that the loop is basically just something that will run over and over again until it in reaches its destination. Alright, so here is our previous code. Now we're not going to be using, we are going to use for loop, but not down to. Well, you can use a for loop or actually any kind of loop to actually go through a string. So let's create a string. S string which is a string all right and now we're going to go s string becomes only chan okay so here is our string and basically what we're going to do is we're going to loop through this and look for characters like oh uh, you know the vowels and we're going to count the vowels. So let's go from i becomes 1 to then I believe I have explained this, but I'll explain it again. Length of s string. So basically what this does, this function, it you it gets the length of this. So this length of this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it will be somewhere around 9. And that, that's the length of this string. And that, that's what this returns. So let, let, let's quickly do this. Um, show message. So we can see how long it is. The length of is string. So basically just to turn, return is the length of something. There are errors. Uh, string, all right, excuse me. Int to string. So yeah, the kind of obvious, but remember it does take in an, it does return an integer because it gets the number of characters in a string, the length. So if we were to press this button, see we'd get nine just as I said. So it counts from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now remember spaces that will be attained because it's still a character. I think the ASCII value for a space is something like 32. I can remember, I haven't used that in a long time. So yeah, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go from 1 to the length of this, which is now 9. We can say 9, but it is more, um, it is safer and better practice to use length. Even, we'll get to arrays later, but you kind of use the same thing with arrays. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find each and every letter that is in vowel. So if s string at position i in, and then we're going to add a, or let's just use not non, non capital letters, okay? So just smaller, so we don't have to type in too much. A E I, O, and U. And then let's create another variable called I count. Alright. So basically, here are our five vowels. So if one of these are a vowel, it will increment. So let's go inc I count. Whoopsie, kind of start a comment there. Ink I count. Now, always remember to be safe and set your I count or any count variable with numbers in it at the top. There. So I count is here. So if it is a vowel, then I count will incre increment. And here are one, two, three, four. Four vowels that I can count. So now we're going to return I count. So basically we could use a for loop to loop through a string and find something we want specifically. So let's run this. 
click the button it's four so yeah this is just a basic way of going through it but what you can also do is you can go if upper case or lower case it listed how to use that lower case because this will automatically change this capital O into a lowercase o. It will change all of the letters lowercase. And then you don't have to actually type out all of that. So I can go Omni Chan and it will still give you the same amount. Oh wait, there's an error. Incompatible strings. Incompatible. Incompatible types. String and ASCII ch character. Alright guys, so it um, seems you learn something every, every day. <laughs> so it seems that uppercase, uppercase, that's for strings, and lowercase, that's for strings. Upcase, and I don't know what lowercase is, but it seems like upcase is used for characters. So that's very interesting. So remember, a character is just one thing, and we are trying to find the character it returns a character we see if the character is that and you know so <laughs> it seems like that okay so then we can actually just make all of these a e i o and u all right so remember upcase characters uppercase string all right so now if we run it we shouldn't have any problems and we should still get the same number even though not all of them are uppercase and you, they should here be uppercase because we're using upcase. See, we get the same number. So yeah, that's what I wanted to do with, with counting through the characters of a string to find what you're looking for. So yeah, thank you all for watching. Alright. So I'm going to just do a basic while loop. And show you guys how it works because the while loop is extremely easy. So let's put in I count. Let's let's make that. Or yeah, let let's make it zero. And then we change I to I num. And we change I num to one. So we have all done the for loop by now. For I becomes zero two here and I hope you guys understand how it works I really do so for I become zero to whatever number now we can rewrite this in our own way so we can go while I num is less or equal to let, let's just make to give us reference let's make this 15 if I num is less or equal to 15 or while I num is less or equal to 15 begin and end so basically what we're saying here is I becomes 1 to 15 and here we say while I num is less or equal to 15 do now the main difference between these two let's screen I so we can get rid of the error between these two pieces of code is this one increments its num its i automatically for example you don't have to go inc i you don't have to do that because it's it does it automatically but in the while loop you have to tell it to increment so yeah now you might be thinking now why in which world would you want this would you want a while loop now, with a for loop, once it gets to the end, it does increment. So it will go for everything and it will increment no matter what. But with a while loop, you can put in more conditions. It's more conditional. So if it doesn't meet this, run the loop again. So it's kind of like that. With this one, if it doesn't do this, just continue and increment it automatically. Kind of something like that. So you can go if... Um, I count is less or equal to less or equal to ten. Again, this is a ter a terrible um, example. 
just saying I just want to throw it out there because I use this a, a lot in my game I could maybe want to go through the code I used in my game and I can show you guys what happened there so basically if if it is like this then this will increment but usually it would be smart to add an else statement or in case it doesn't do this because this loop will run forever this can turn into an infinite loop which is not something you want but basically everything you do with the while loop you can do with the for loop and the for loop is in a sense more secure but also with a while loop you can also do this while is string string for example is ah is not equal to weave okay let's just do that if a string is not equal to weave run this or while it's not equal to it so run it and once it is weave end the piece of code this is not something you can really do for loop you probably can in some way but it will be a lot harder because a while loop is just so much easier it's also like once we get to text files and stuff and databases and all that you can also go while not end of file and then put in your file name there and stuff like that or database name and put in the code here so it does also help to like get to the end of a file like let's say we have a text file and there's a bunch of lines like let's say that's 100 lines so you say while it is not the end of that file while the cursor is still is not at the very bottom of that file run the code and execute whatever what is in what is in here now of course you can do it in here because not because but it will be a lot harder to do and it might actually have be more prone to bugs and in the future once you update that file or database this is really not a very efficient way to do it yeah you can probably in some way program like link or something but uh, or maybe to end the file I don't know but I say use a while loop in cases like that so yeah so let's go while inum is less or equal to 10 ink inum now it does matter where this ink inum is if we're going to put it at the beginning it's going to increment it at the beginning if we put it at the end it's going to increment it at the end so you should plan where you're going to put this usually you put it at the end and you can just go Um, is this equal to nine? Nine. See, and then begin. And, and that's all for now. Thank you all for watching. All right. So today we will be starting with a timer. Now, what exactly is a timer, and what is it used for? Now, a timer is basically something kind of like um, let's say you want to create an animation for example you use a timer to like set intervals for when the animation should move should it move every two seconds should it move every five milliseconds however you want it timers can also be used then let's say someone clicks on a button the timer will basically hold back the code for insert number of seconds or milliseconds until the timer has finished ticking and then it will display the whatever the next part of the code says it's basically like that so how will we use a timer now we will use a timer in terms of animations so we will be going straight out of the book and we'll be using everything they use i'll just be explaining it as we go along so we have a panel also, my uh, things might look a little bit different than usual. It's because I switched to Delphi Community Edition because we have Delphi 10 and Delphi Community Edition. Now, I don't really know what's the difference. They're both quite the same. This one has a few extra features that this one doesn't have. This one has a few that that one doesn't have. So to me, I just want to use this. And I must say this one actually runs slightly better than um, the other one but you know all right so they have a panel they have one image another panel 
and a button. So it's an image a button first before I have to do things and in another panel. All right. So the image is right around here, there, and then a button. So let's quickly design it. So we want to put an image in here. So we'll have to save our files first. Save all. Right. So now we can go to that file. We can choose an image and go to that file. So I have a bunch of pictures here. Paste the image here. Oh, you really had to process for that one. All right, so I'm, not, I'm just going to make it easier on it myself and just make it one long or one short string, the name. Hello, PC, can you respond? Linux, okay. There, that should make my life easier. Now, I believe I did tell you all how to insert an image. So I don't think I need to explain that again. Can you run PC, please? And then we can add the image by going to picture in the object inspector for this image. Then we can go load. Then it should appear in the same folder. Yeah, there we go. Linux to JPG. Open. Okay. We can do this in the code, but we shall not. We, we try to do it like this. For now at least. And this one can be welcome to no, okay, we're not gonna do that. Um come to PC world, I guess. Alright, so now we have that. Let's add a little bit of color because they make it look colorful. I can't really see it in black and white, but we make it red. And uh, then we gotta change the font. Okay, we can go terminal maybe. I don't know. Just make it really big. Uh, can we make it like 20 pixels maybe? All right, here we go. Welcome to PC World. And then we have a button. Uh, we should probably name these. Okay, let's name them uh, before we continue name img linux all right this can be whoa please appear at name pnl wait can you get there pnl um, welcome all right and then button bt in enter okay so then we can just go to caption if i'm correct yes caption could you please okay so that's something that this delphi does click to enter shop okay that should be all i should have actually done this in the background now to think about it all right but then anyways there we go so what's going to happen is, oh, and we also need a timer before I forget. Timer. There we go. All right, so timer is not visible by default, and I don't think you can make it visible. So yeah, um, this will be TMR, I don't know, animate. Okay. Now, interval, this is, let me explain this. Intervals is in milliseconds. Now, what happens is basically milliseconds, we know every thousand milliseconds is one second. Interval is how many times, so we have like over one second to do this, then over the next one second, start with this. You know, it's new intervals. I don't really know, that's some kind of something you should know by yourself. But anyways, so basically we can go into the timer if it will allow us there we go and now we're in here let's create a few variables variable 
by right side then I write border which is an integer both of them now basically what are we going to use this for we're going to use this to kind of find out how far the image can move you know like how we want the image to kind of scroll we can say so if we were to go here the image would go like this and then back here like this back here constantly like that that's what we want so let's go so I write side excuse me becomes image Linux but left plus image Linux dot with now you might be asking yourself wait 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 what does that do I thought we were going to make it move and stuff basically we're figuring out where is the right side of the image so we kind of want to find out the y coordinate we can say remember x up and down y left and right y increases x increases to just to go back to that anyways so now we find we, we find we kind of figured out what the y coordinate is of the right hand side of the image also this is on page 112 if you have the book so you can go check there then i write border becomes so this is where i should most likely uh, probably name you before I continue we can't see your things so I don't have to really clear your name oh no not padding name okay PNL uh, PNL form let's just, let's just go down it is a name for now we don't have to worry about that okay becomes PNL form if I am not mistaken PNL form Well, technically, we shouldn't have used that. They say with. I'm just gonna go with and see, and just go with that, okay? Then here we can go. If I write, whoopsie, I right side is more or equal to I right border now I don't know if this is correct because I accidentally added a freaking uh, freaking panel because I thought that looked really much like a panel but anyways so then you go image Linux the left becomes 10 and basically what this does once it kind of once the image goes the image's right side goes for further than the right side border of the panel it will go back to its original place or a little before because i don't think we do that 10 anyways and else begin so let's just first write the code and i'll explain image linux dot left becomes image linux dot left plus 20 so this will make it move every one second with 20 pixels all right so here we have our whole thing 
Let's uh, see. As you can see, it does actually work so far. So this is basically what it does. It moves it every one second. One, two, three, four. As you can see, now let's see if it goes back there. Yeah, as you can see, it goes back there. So now let's explain. This finds the right side of the image. It finds image to the left, how much left it is, plus the image is width. Because remember, we find kind of the X because width is X. So we start here. Now it finds this point and then adds the width of the image. Then it finds the actual where the image actually is. Then as soon as it hits this part, this as soon as this one hits this part and the, the timer ticks again, it goes back here. Because now, yeah, anyways. So I hope you understand that part. If you don't, I do recommend go checking out the book or just comment in, in the comment section and I'll explain it further. Then I write border. I didn't actually need this. It's just to kind of um, make it easier to understand. You know, the variable just makes it easier. Basically what this does, it gets the width of the panel. So it gets this. And if this, if the x coordinate, if the coordinate of this part of the image is more than this width, then it goes back and it starts again. All right. Then here, if the right side is more equal to I right border, then it yet yeah, see then it starts again, and otherwise it goes with twenty. Now you might think if you wanted to go faster you'd make this 30 or 50 or something but it doesn't work like that you should stay 20 because if you want it to go faster this is where the timer comes in you change the interval to 500 milliseconds or even lower if that's what you like run it again and you will see this will go quite the amount faster As you can see, it now takes off every 500 milliseconds. So yeah, this is a basic version of what it can do. Now, of course, you can make this more intense and even change the background color of this or something because this basically it just ticks. It just gives you something to time with. Like let's say, for example, that save the ball game I made, link in the description. That, for example, uses a timer to animate the balls going toward you. And the timer says, hey, this ball shouldn't move until this timer is at this point, you know. And then it kind of keeps the ball from moving until the timer reached it, okay. So yeah. Alright, so today I'm going to tell you guys about the val method. Now, basically, what this does, it validates things for you. So let's go... Here we have a GUI before we go to that. So here we have GUI, we can click enter date, and here we have a place where you can insert text. They're going to insert the... the let's say they're going to insert maybe the month. So just this is very basic. We're not going to put any major things in it to make sure because we're just going to test. So they're going to insert the month, but as a number. So it's 01, 02, or 1, 2, 3, you know, like that. So then we can go to enter. Variable is month, which is a string. Then we can have, then we should actually have two types of them integers or one type of integer and one type of real you can choose so the type that must be an integer is i code or whatever you want to call it the one that doesn't need to be can be something like i month whoopsie all right 
So here we have our variables. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go s month becomes edt date dot text and now we're going to go val. As you can see it takes in a string, a var, this var is either a real or an integer and then the code. So then we can go s mun i mun and then i code. Now what will this do? Let's just i mun just for in case we put this at zero. Just for in case you know. So what will this do? Basically what it will do is it will take is mun. And it will validate that it is an integer. And this will just say if it is or is not. It's kind of like a boolean, but as a number. This can, but this basically um, converts this into the string into an either an integer or a real. And it will validate it. So after now we can go if I code. So if it is not zero, then it is an invalid value because minus one, if I'm correct, is false and zero is true. So if it's not zero, that's the best way to go for in case you forget. If I code is not zero, then show message date is incorrect. And then if you want, you can go else. Just show message. All right. So let's explain this once more before we run it. It takes in the string, converts it to an integer at this moment, and then make sure if it's true or false. If it's true, it will not be zero. If it's false, it will be any other number but zero. That's all you have to know for now. So if it is true, this will display. Oopsie. Date is incorrect if it's not true because it's not zero. If it is true, this will display. So let's run that. So if we enter, insert anything here that is not a number, for example, let's first enter something that would be true, 23, thank you. But if we go 23G, for example, then date is incorrect, because now that's not an integer. Now, if you want to make this a real, you can always go or month and just go real. And just, you don't have to do this, but I feel doing this is just a safe way of doing your things. So we go to our month. Now if we go like this. So let's quickly check here. If we go 22, it still says thank you, even though we haven't added a dot or anything. That is because it, it converts 22 to a real, it's going to go 22.0, it's not going to change anything. So we go 22.0, it's still going to say thank you. But if we go 22.g, hmm, that date is incorrect because that is a string. And that string cannot be converted into a number. So yeah, I hope you all kind of understand this. But basically what it does is just validates that something is a number and that it can be used. Alright, so today we'll finally be starting with files. So we'll just be doing the basic reading from a file. Now, in my source code, um, I do recommend you build your own one of these and just save it and run it. But in my source code, I have two files test1.txt and test2.ownextend. This is just to show you how to read from two different files of two different extensions. So this own extend is just my own extension I created, it's not something specific. Now if you are running a Delphi 10.3, then I recommend you take these two files 
and you just put them in this here Windows 2 Windows 32 just put them in here and it will be able to read them but if you're going to try and run it from this button here and it's not in here you'll have to redirect it back to folders to read this but anyways let's continue so let's just open up this so we can keep an eye on this part here now basically when we read from a file we're going to click on this button and it's going to display the text inside of that file inside of this rich edit now let's get to it first thing i recommend you do is to always clear your memo or rich edit whichever you have here i have enrich edit so i'll go readout dot lines dot clear and to read from a file it would be read output dot lines dot load from file this is all you need to read from a file just basic reading from a file nothing specific just getting all the text and throwing it into the read output now here we have a test1.txt now copy all of that including the extension .txt because we can't let it get confused between test1 and in no extension it's just not working correctly there so then you just do that press ctrl d press save and just run it and we'll see if it runs and reads from the file so inside of this file we have your reading from a file all right and in here read from file you are reading from a file as you can see it does display and because we have a read output that lines to clear you can click as many times as you want on this button but it will not affect the how this is displayed now to read from a different extension is the same process you can just copy the whole name including the extension and then just replace it it's exactly the same as what you do with a normal file because it's just a normal text file because Dalphi will take this as just a text file I'm pretty sure if you you were to put an image in here you'll probably get the image code but I am not sure so I'm not going to do that as you can see you can also read from custom extensions and as you can see here we'll open that with sublime text put it in here you can also read from custom extensions and that's all guys that's how you read from a file it's very simple and it is something you'll use a lot in the future so here in gamers.txt i have four names and the people whose names are their age so josh hendrix he will be 18 Linux Zum, he will be 16, Kai Maggie will be 21, and Lily Zeller will be 10. They are all gamers. Now just copy that, go into the Win32 folder, into debug, and just paste it there so it can read the project file. Or you know what, let me teach you guys how to navigate the file system with Delphi. Okay, so so it's deleted just making sure you guys know that file is deleted now what we're going to do is we're going to add a button and two rich edits all right so here we have a button called btn display two rich edits which one of them is called junior and one of them is called senior now basically what's going to happen is let's just go here all right so if they are younger than 18 they will appear in the junior rich edit if they are older than eight or if they're 18 or older like Kai and Josh they will be in the senior all right so what we're going to do is we're going to just open up display or beat in display 
we can go variables and then we have team names now this can actually be anything like t file which i actually prefer i'd rather go t file um, but it's up to you i just prefer t file so you can go t name and that is a text file you use control d and control s all right so basically this is just to say we're going to have a variable that can be assigned to a specific text file unfortunately you can't put a string as a text file as far as i know but text files it's pretty possible then you have s line s name S line S name which is a string. All right, so we're going to use S line to read a line and S name to get the name. Then we can go I pause and I age, which are both integers. All right, so let's continue. Now, first thing we want to do is we want to clear both of the rich edits because if we're going to print the lines and we're going to click multiple times on on this button we don't want it to just continue going downwards of the names repeating themselves for example let's say the program lags for some reason and you you're going to and you're going to press this button 5,000 times because the program is lagging and you don't like it then it's just going to paste a bunch of, a bunch of things and it's just going to be very inconvenient for the user on the other side so you can go oopsie red junior dot lines dot clear or you can go red ooh, sorry about that red senior dot clear both of these does exactly the same thing. I don't think one of them does something that the other one doesn't because they both clear the rich edit. I personally like this top one because it clarifies more what you want to do. Um, not that it really matters that much in this scenario, but you know. Then what we want to do is we're going to go, want to go rate junior dot lines dot add and then we just want to go junior gamers this is just to clarify that the people in the next in this rich edit are the junior gamers and with this one we can go so now we have clarified what we are going to do now another thing we might want to add is just a plus hashtag 13 now what this does is this Good. this goes to the next line it's like an enter this is basically enter what you could also do as an alternative is you can go red c ooh, why do i do that red senior dot lines dot add and just do that because that will add an open line oh wait sorry this is my fault um, yeah, this does go to the next line, but we want there to be an open line. So what we can again do is you can go hashtag 13. This will create, this will have the same effect as this one right here. It will press enter two times. Alright, so let's go. Alright, so here is where the things start. Now, this what I'm going to be doing now it isn't generally generally necessary to do that usually in an exam you won't lose marks if you do it if you don't do it like I'm going to do now so you can go try and you can go reset oh, wait I'm getting ahead of myself uh, before we do that we actually gotta assign the file or the variable to the file so we can go as no okay. we can go assign file and as you can see it first wants the file and then or it it first wants the variable if the open file that's variable and it wants the file name which is a string so what we want to do is we're going to want to go t file and then the name of the file 
Now the name of the file in this case is gamers.txt. If gamers.txt was in here, we could have just said gamers.txt. But because it is outside, uh, you should also just consider that um, the file will not always be outside of um, this Windows 32 file or the debug file. Uh, but in this case it is, so we're going to go and search for it there. Now, let's see if this works, because I don't know if it works, I haven't tested it out yet, but I do really want to test it out. So, point, point, slash, point, point, slash. This, in a basic computer language, this means go back to files. For In case if we open up the terminal or um, the console, I believe, uh, CMD, then if we go uh, to the documents, Alright, so here we are in user Steve documents. If we go point point slash, as you can see there, then you can see we went back. We went from documents back to Steve. Now if we do that again, let's see, we go even back, even more back. So this is basically what it means. I don't know if it does work in that way, it should. And as you can see, we are two file folders back so we are in here so since we're here it's point point slash point point slash file name so it would be gamers.txt whoopsie remember the extension.txt this is actually very important we can save that and now that we have assigned the file we can finally do this. So first thing we gotta do is we gotta reset an empty file. What this does it it moves the cursor to the top of the file. So let's say you Delphi opens up the file and the cursor is here. You see that thing that blinks? That's the cursor. Now if you say reset, it does that. So now the cursor is there. Because if it's going to be here and it's going to read, it's going to start here. We don't want it to start here, we want it to start here from the top. So we reset, because this is a problem if someone tries and click the button again, and they try and run it again, because then the cursor is here. It's not going back to the top automatically, so we have to tell it, go back to the top. We want you there, and then read from there. Alright, and then we need to add accept there, and so finally, and then show message. Could not find gamers.txt. So, this is basically if you watch my previous video, this means try and find this file, try and reset T file. And if it can't reset T file, do this. Ooh, sorry about that. Do this. Tell this. Because we can assign the file, but that doesn't mean it's going to give an error. It would actually be best practice if we were to do this and do that. Because this will make sure that if it can't assign the file, if, it does, if an error does pop up, we will see it first before anything else. Alright, and then we can just exit the program. Alright, now that we have that, we can finally start reading. So first thing we gotta do is we gotta go while not end of file t names. Now this not does not need that. We can do that. But I prefer having it like this. So but you don't need it. We can even remove it if you guys don't want it there. Alright. So basically this is while it's not the end of file, while, while the cursor is not here, read. So if the cursor is here, it's going to read. If it's here, it's going to read. If it's there, it's going to read. But as soon as it gets here, it's going to stop the program because then it doesn't need to read any further uh, because we don't want an infinite loop. At your begin and end, that's always good practice. Control D, Control S, and then go read line now 
this is going to store the text inside of a line into a variable. So we can go t file and then s line. So basically, it's going to store everything. When I when I say read line, what it's going to do is going to take this and store it inside of s line. That's what it's going to do. So read store inside of s line. Okay, then we have I pause and it becomes pause and then comma is line now what I'm telling it to do is I'm telling it find the position of this character inside of S line so what it's going to do is going to check is this a comma no it's not is this a comma no it's not is this a comma no it's not until it gets here is this a comma yes it is so it's going to go up until here that is now going to be i pause so it's going to store the position of this one in i pause for example position 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 this one is in position 13 why don't we just tell it it's in position 13? Because we don't always know. This one will change. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 11. It's in round there. So it will change constantly. Now, his name, is it just name? No, it's his name. His name becomes, becomes copy is line from position 1 to I pause minus 1 okay what I'm telling you it here is store in variable s name basically everything in s line up until I pause minus 1 so I'm telling it store everything here until I pause, which is the comma, minus one. So it goes every, it goes just up until the comma, but it doesn't consider the comma itself. So everything after it is not considered anything else, or is not considered part of its name. Okay. And then you can go delete. Ooh, not delete file, don't do that. And you can just say S line from one to I pause. So this says basically this says do this. That's what it says. Take this and just delete. Don't don't care what. Just as long as it's delete. Oh man. Don't save. But yeah, that's what it's saying. And then IH becomes uh, string to int. And we can go S line. Why can we go S line? Because this is all that's left. And it will consider this the end of the line. It will not continue because this to it is a paragraph. This is one line. This is line. This is next line. That's next line. That's next line. Delph is smart enough to figure all of that out on its own. So it just says convert that last two digits into a number. Now what we can say is if my age is more or equal to 18 then begin is more or equal to 18 that's read senior dot lines dot add and we can go is name because we just want to display the name and if you want to display the age as well you can go plus Plus into string i age plus and just add this. Alright. That is if you want to do that.
and then what you can do is we can just go else begin we can copy this line because it will do exactly the same thing if we were to just you know all right so we are not done yet though now what we got to do is we got to go outside of the while loop and just say close file and t file why should we do that you ask that is because if this file stays open in the background one it takes more ram and two it can cause errors and we don't want that it can also affect the program in terms of the loop and stuff and if we try and edit it again it might give us a pop-up that says eh, you know i don't think i can open it again you know because the sound file basically opens the file all right so let's run it and see if we have any errors okay so we go here Junior Gamers is Lina Zum, which is 16, and Lily Zeller, which is 10. Senior Gamers is 18-year-old Josh and 21-year-old Maggie, or Kai. We click there, it doesn't repeat itself. That is because we told it not to. We said each time they click, it should clear. Alright, that is basically how to read from a file. Now let's just revise, what did we do? We cleared the edits, we added our text that should be there once the application starts or once the button is clicked. We assigned the file, which in fact did work by doing dot dot slash dot dot slash. to uh, gamers.txt then we try to reset t file and if it would give us an error we would display this and exit the rest of the program and then while not in the file so while it's not the last line of the file at the very last character do all of this read the line and put it in s line Find a position of the comma in S line. Copy S line from position 1 to I pause minus 1. Delete the whole line up until the comma, and that includes the comma. And then get the IH by just taking what's left. After you've done that, check what IH is and just categorize them into their different places. There are different rich edits, and after all of that, we have to close the file. But remember not to close the file within the while loop because then we will get errors. So, yeah, that's basically all we did. There's not that much to it. So, let's see. Today, I'm going to show you guys how to create a log file. Now, if you don't know what the log file is, it is something like this. You will have maybe the username, then the date and time they came in, like the time they logged on, and maybe even when they left, or what they changed, especially what they changed. That is usually in a log file. And you say what they have changed and stuff like that. But we were, what we're going to do is we're going to do this each time someone logs in it's going to write who logged in and at what time and date into this specific file right here so let's go through about what's gonna happen they're going to put in the username password we're not really going to care about the password we don't care what the password is but remember if you don't have that windows 32 folder and you're running delphi 10.3 then i you should run it first because once you run it it creates all the folders and that's all three saved it okay save it then run and then you will have your debug folder and everything okay so we're going to make it work completely let's do quit i don't know why they didn't just use a bit button so we're just going to go frm i mean form 2 this is form 2 if we go here and we click here we can see this is form 2 
in the caption and in the name it should also probably say form 2 yeah um, I recommend you change that but for the sake of this video I'm not going to dot close this will close it it's that's basically what the close bit button does it's just that little bit of code if you run it you click it it's closed I believe it's not running anymore all right and let's see now that we have that we want to do the logon okay so let's see first thing we got to do is we got to we want the the username the date and the time And then we need a T file or a T log or anything you want, but that should have a T for just so you know it's a text file. I like to go T file with my files. Text file. Okay, so this is the basic variables we'll need. So then we can go S name becomes edt name.txt we're going to actually create a login file they don't need any passwords or anything like that we're just going to capture what's in it and we're going to put it into a file is date we can make that become date to string and then date but i never got it so i don't really you know time to string and then just time uh, of course there can be parameters in there like saying what format should be year 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 um, day 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 and stuff like that whatever your format is you can change that but for now we're just going to use the pc format this is going to take this format of the pc and throw it in there and, and now what we want to do is we want to go assign file and then t file to log.txt here is log.txt that should be a g so here's the log.txt let's go control d control s then rewrite and then just t file i'll explain all of this right now and then we want to create a new string now to think about it so then we go s log now s log that will become s name plus a rigging or, or the limiter will be a space plus s date plus mm, but that's going to be a little bit of effort so a little bit too much effort so we're going to use a hashtag as our delimiter not that we're going to use it right now, but you know, it's just good practice to have a good limiter. Alright. So this is going to be the log, and then we're going to go right line, and then we're going to say t file, we should write into t file s log. So what we're saying, wait, 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 and then we close file. T file. T file. Okay, so what we are saying is put all of these in the variables. We all know what these do. Uh, except for these, as you guess, the date and time. That's pretty obvious. Okay, oh, that's a state again. S time. There we go. Okay, then here in assign file. This assigns, we already know that, assigns T file to this file. And then rewrite. What this does is it erases everything from the file, and that just erases everything from the file. It also assigns the file, um, or opens the file because it's not assigned. It kind of opens it as well in some way. If we're going to remove it, you might get an error. And then you have write line t file is log. This is writes to t file what is whatever is in is log. Then close file. That just closed the file okay pretty easy so let's test it out right now in this file there is nothing okay we'll put the username in uh, 
e to that is man in uh, Japanese if I'm not mistaken the uh, posture can be anything that we don't that doesn't matter log on okay we clicked on that go back into the log file there's our username the date just as it is here in the format and then the time now if you click on it again so let's click on it a few times okay and then if we open this up again now in a log file if the true log file it should add more um, the newest one should either be at the top or at the bottom that is usually up to the programmer but uh, usually the newest one is at the top now this doesn't do that let's say it only writes one it erases everything and it rewrites that we do not want that in a real environment this would be completely incorrect but if you're try just trying to remove everything and write something new to the file this is a good way to do it it's easy it just clears the file and you can put everything on it but what we should do is we should go append and then t file we already know um, let's reset that puts the cursor at the top of the file and then it reads you know but resetting here won't work but prepend will do this that's prepend append will do that it'll put the cursor below all the other things so yeah just to explain and in t file now theoretically this should work they should write the everything new underneath each other so let's go username is nani that's what in japanese free japanese lessons anyways in care and then we are going to spam this button but we spammed the button now let's open it up again as you can see now it writes all the time to the new file so it starts at the first one it ends at the last one in the file now basically this is how a log file should look as you can see this guy he was logged on and then this guy logged on quite a few times this is how a log file should look you shouldn't reset anything because a log file is to keep logs Dalphi also has a log history this history is a log it's basically telling you what you did so yeah this is how to write to a file and create a log all right so today we are going to be focusing on creating custom columns now when you display things on this form and usually let's say it's just text output like name and then the name age then the age you don't want it to be like let, let me show you i can show you here basically like this name whatever your name is age you don't want that you you want this sorry about that as you can see it looks a little bit neater and this is usually the reason why we highly recommend you create your own tabs because on Delphi that does not usually happen where you where it will create the tabs perfectly for you all right so first thing we want to do is we want to click on the form go to events and then on activate or on yeah on create you can choose any of those two both are basically the same thing all right so here we have it now what we want to do is first thing we want to do is we want to add this little piece to the code red output and uh, just so we know this is red output it's rich edit and this one is bt in click which is just normal button red output dot paragraph dot tab count and this will become however many tabs you want so let's quickly show you this 
let's go you know what let's just create let's just open some text here all right so let's say this is your name age you go ahead your thingies and here you're putting your name and here you're putting your age all right now this one and maybe two you can go two to be safe but as you can see there's only one stop so what we have here is basically saying how many tab tabs we should have inside of this reach it and right now we only have one tab here now you have to go red right output dot paragraph dot tab this time and here is where it gets a bit tricky you have to start at zero not one but zero this is something to do with arrays we'll get to that later but just for now no arrays always start at zero and this is an array so it starts at zero and then you go becomes and however big you want this i don't know how this is actually measured usually you change this you run the program you see does it look fine if it looks fine you keep it if it doesn't look fine you change it so let's go here and then when we click on the button it should do this display the name plus and hash nine this or let's for show you let's for show you and then we go like I should put this in a variable but anyways name is Josh put it there plus hash 13 and then we can go age and go like 13 or something all right let's run that and just show you how the output looks so you can get an idea of what we're trying to stop you see we don't want that because that one it can be pretty hard to read it if it's like that and it's all clustered up against each other so that's another reason uh, apart from it does just doesn't look neat now if we go plus hash nine and in here we go again plus hash nine basically this is saying create a tab this means tab tab is that button right above your camps lock that does this or let's do it in here it looks better okay, this is space okay and this is tab you can see there's a pretty big difference programmers usually use tab to index their things we use tabs to make everything look better but tabs can also be used to make things look nicer in different ways but for now let's just quickly comment this out so you can see how it looks without our added code maybe it looks okay but then we can still use it okay i see as you can see in sometimes this does look okay it doesn't matter then it's actually then not too bad and this is a lot of times it, this is the case but there are a lot of cases where this is not the case and where you'll have to add your own ones like these such as these like i don't have any specific ones that can be very useful right now but as you can see 100 may be a little bit too much we can decrease this but let's say your age or this word like the first tab was like what here now let's say here was another word that surpassed that and that's when the tab things will start doing weird things where it wouldn't work out of anything else because then this things tab would be something like this or whatever something well these are all around here you know so yeah that's something you, that's why we use this so let's just show you that you can change it by decreasing this to 50 that will make it half as big As you see it already looks better but it's still a little bit big now in this case using this is kind of useless and yeah that's all about custom tabs thank you all for watching see you all in the next video
So today I will be um, explaining to you guys what an array is. I'm not going to use Delphi because arrays do change depending on what you decide to, what language you decide to use. So an array, it is what you use to hold a ton of information. Unlike a text file or a database, which we'll get to in later, um, arrays can keep little bits of information inside of it. If you're familiar with any other program, programming languages, you would know what an array is. So let me give you an example. Our name. So this we can call an array. Now what our name has inside of it is John. Or our names. Let's make it our names. Luca. Jim. Maggie. Okay. So as you can see, it holds some information, some data, some form of data. You, you can even go something like our age. Now our age will be something like 23, 40, 20, yeah, 23 actually this time, and 10. Something like this. And it just holds the data. Now you might ask yourself, in what scenario would something like this be useful? Well, if you're getting interested in any sort of game development, then this will definitely come up a lot. And if you, um, and just in general programming, sometimes this can be very useful to quickly get some data from, in a, you just populate an array, which means you put some things, some data into an array, you take that array. And this is the very basics of what an array does. It just holds some little form of data. Which means you can create an array of anything. You can even create an array of characters. For example, the alphabet. That is an array of characters. A, B, C, and so on and so forth. So this is the, that's basically the alphabet. And then you use the, the array, which is the alphabet, to create words like John. Now, this is where it can get a little bit confusing. The positioning of things in an array. Now, I don't want to confuse you guys, but I do want to warn you guys if you go to a different language. If you start learning something like Java, JavaScript, I believe Python also does like that. Um, PHP, any other language, most languages, with an array, it starts at position zero. That's where it starts. And A here, it will be at position or index zero. And then it has index one and then index two. So this will be index zero, index one, and index 2. Now let's say we want to get A. Then let's go with output dot lines dot add and then this is just an example. This won't just work. You'll we'll need to go through how to create one before this would work but this is just a very basic example. Our names at position and let's say we want Jim. It would be 0, 1, 2. That. But do not, do not take this in. Do not. This is just for future reference if you do decide to go to a different language. Delphi, on the other hand, which is a beginner friendly language. Well, if you're going to create an array, it starts at 1 in Delphi. Um, in most pro other programming languages, if you just go to one, you can definitely get a few errors. But because Delphi is a very beginner-friendly language, it starts at one to teach you on the easy way. So for Delphi, you just count one, two, three. 
and there you have it so index 1 that would be a this would be at index 4 this would be at index 2 index 3 that is easy enough to remember right and that's an array that is all there is to an array you can even go something like um, our name at position one is, and then I'm not going to use an interest string, this is just as an example. Our age at two years old. Now you should be able to read this by now. So we go here, our names at position one, okay. Here's our names, here's position one. So this is John. John is our names at position two. Here's our names, one, two. John is 40 years old. This is what this says. So, last time we talked about arrays. And I told you that it can be used to store a few things such as names, age, the size of things, you know, it can be used to store a lot of things. So what I'm going to do, uh, because we're going to declare it for the first time. So while I'm going to declare it, I'm going to kind of explain more on what we did last time. Now, what you want to do is you want to just double click on that button. And here in the private section, this is where you would declare an array. So how you declare it is usually by starting with R to tell yourself it is an array. Then giving it a name such as monsters, because we're going to store monsters inside of it. You're going to say it's an array. And how many things are going to be inside of the array? Now, in some programming languages, such as Delphi and Java, in some cases, if you decide you want to set a specific value, you have to give it a number from where to where. It will start from 1 and it will end at 5. That's an example. Now, of course, you can have more than you need, so we're going to start 1. You can have 100 if you want. We're going to have five monsters, nothing more, five should be enough. And then you have to say of what type of is, type it is. Is it an integer? Is it a real? Is it a string? We're going to say the type of monster, for example, is it a zombie? Is it a vampire? Something like that. So of string. That is how you declare an array, basically. Feel free, free to press Ctrl D. So now we can start populating the array. That is, that means putting something inside of the array. So we can do something such as r monsters, and then you have to declare the index. Like, where are you going to put it in? Is it going to be inside of index one, the first one, and five, the last one? So we're going to go one because we want to put, make the very first one. We want to make that a monster. So you can go becomes, and then whatever the monster should be in this case. So we can go zombie. Now we have one thing in this array. It can hold up until five things. So let's just for now go show message. So this is going to um, display what in position 1 is, and in this case it is zombie. Perfect. Now what if we were to make this position 2? There's nothing in position 2 though, so let's see, what will we get? We get nothing because it results into an empty string. Also, if you go into a number that doesn't exist, 
you'll also get an error because that number doesn't exist. Same if you do 6 right now because 6 doesn't exist. We said up until 5, from 1 to 5. So what can we do now? Now we can add more monsters. So now we have two monsters. Now if you were to make a game, this would mean that there are now, now two monsters in your game. Whether this is monsters the characters can be or should fight, that's up to you. Let's say you're making a menu, then you have your options stored in an array. Bad example actually, but you know. So then we can go our monsters and we can go free. And that can become women because we all believe women are quite monsters sometimes. So what we can before root for I which we should declare up here. So I as an integer becomes one to the length of our monsters begin. So then we can just copy these two and just fill it up with five monsters. So now we have our five monsters. Now we're going to loop through it from position one to the length of our monsters, which is one, two, three, four, five. Exactly why it starts at one in Delphi to make it easy for beginners. So if we're going to run it. We can see it displays all of the monsters we've added, all of the things inside of the array. So what this will do is this will, if you were to program this into something, this will allow you to go into your RAM, get something from the RAM, which is in the array, quickly pull it out and use it. This is a lot faster than storing something inside of a text file and trying to get it outside of the text file. If you know the, the difference between or, um, between RAM and storage, like normal hard drive storage, if you know the difference in speed, you can kind of compare it here because this is inside of the RAM. So this will use the RAM speed, the very fast speed you get. And a text file would use something as the hard drive speed. So it's going to have to like move it from the hard drive, you know. So yeah. That's how you make an array. All right, so today we will be searching an array. It is actually pretty simple and it's kind of self-explanatory on how to actually do it if you have watched up until now. But it is not always that easy to see something if you don't know about it yet. So if, to me, of course, since I know it, it's easy. But I don't remember how it was before I didn't know about it. I can't remember if I actually struggled with it or not. So I'm still going to show you. So what we have is we have an array or animals from one to five. And it has five things in it. Of course, dog, cat, bird, monkey, and snake. Now we're going to search for it. The user will click on the button. And once they click on it, they pop a input box should pop up asking them what animal they're looking for and if they search for that animal it should tell them okay the animal does exist or it does not exist if it does exist where in where was the animal found at what index in the array all right so let's begin first thing we'll need is we need to create variables so it is is search which is a string i which is an integer and um, b flag, which is a boolean. Now, uh, this part I'm going to show right here is optional, but I'm still going to show you how to do it because this is a safer method to use it with a flag. Once you know how it looks, you will be able to figure out how to do it without using b flag, of course. But anyways, let's continue. So the first thing we'll need is we need to make a search into whatever the person wants to search for. So this search becomes becomes input box one two one two one two 
and there we have our first thing you can just type search to oh, i hate it when i do that but where do i even find the insert button there it is okay we can do that and we can do that then we can just type in uh, what animal are you looking for and here we can just give it a default value of dog for now no need to give it a default value i'd like to give it but anyways then the next thing we need is we need to set b flag as false and i as zero so i'm going to explain all this right now which is for declaring the variables, there's not too much you can actually say about it, so... Yeah. Ooh, it's really messed up. Okay, there we go. So then, what we gotta do is we gotta go um, while. And then we can go B flag is not equal to true. Or you could just say it while not b flag or while b flag is equal to false it is up to you and also remember if you're adding two different arguments to a while loop you should put them in brackets or any if statement or something like that always remember if it's more than one in brackets i always put mine in brackets just since it's safer but just remember always in brackets and then while i is less or equal to the length of our animals do begin please press ctrl d because that just looks disgusting if you don't all right so this is the basic wall what we're telling it is while b flag is not true it should continue running and if i is less or equal to zero i mean less or equal to five it should continue running as well first thing you should do is we should go ink and we should increment i um if you don't know what ink does it's basically in code it means i becomes i plus one that is what it says if you write it out in code if at the position of i is the same as is search then <clears throat> then begin and if it is we should go b flag becomes true and if i'm correct that is actually all so what we're saying here is go into the array and then increment i because i is zero here we need to increment it to one why didn't put i why didn't i put i underneath this it is because it can cause errors or here it's because it can cause errors if it's here so i just put it at the top um because it just works better so then i say if our animals at index i is the same as the word in a search which is dog so if this and this is exactly the same, then go B flag becomes true. And because B flag becomes true, the while loop will now stop because, oh wait, B flag, it's true now. So I can, I'm not allowed to run anymore. But if it's not, it will continue running until I is the same length as the array. In which case, this will tell it to stop. So this is kind of a fail safer in case that word does not exist. So yeah, and then after we've done that, just to make sure everything works, we can go if b flag begin. And then after you send it, you go show message is string was found in index why am i getting an error message there 
a string of oh, its a search excuse me a search was found in index or more, more at at index plus int to string i and if it was not found which means if b flag is not true then show message s search was not found all right so let's run it and then i'll just re-explain so we can get that behind us search i'm going to search for dog it was at index one what else do we have we have snake so let's go snake search it it was found at index five now i want spider but spider is not there so okay spider was not found so let's go through it again a search finds whatever person puts into the input box as soon as they click the button this is dog or cat or whatever b flag is set to false to say no i didn't find it you can also go like be found if you want like they do in the book but generally we use b flag because it's just i don't know we just use it i becomes zero this is because once you click it i has to go back to zero otherwise we're going to run to troubles with the while loop then while b flag is not equal to true and i is less or equal to the length of our animals increment i making i one if our animals at index i is the same as search so if this and this is the same thing then return b flag as true this will also stop the while loop if it's not true continue running the while loop until you either find it or i is bigger than the length of our animals or the same then after that if b flag was made true so if it was said that b flag is true then show message the search was found or else if b flag is still false then it was not found all right so today we are going to be looking at constants now first let me explain what a constant is now as you can kind of figure out of what it's called it is something that doesn't change it is constant now we have already talked about variables we have talked about creating them manipulating them to become something or to change into something else and just using them in general now a constant is a variable but it's a special type of variable and it can also be found in most languages and it is one of the most useful things to have especially if you're doing something like creating a game or just trying to set something specific that shouldn't change for example you know when you buy something there's like that little bit of extra tax that comes with it um, in south africa i think it's 0.15 percent of the cost that gets added to that amount which gives you the amount that is that you have to pay in order to buy it it's very confusing but that is constant now first let's, let's show you what a constant is now a constant is declared right under uses um, it can be declared on different places let's first start by putting it under the uses all right so first thing we got to do if we want to create a constant is we have to say it's constant by going const and that will say hey everything underneath this is going to be a constant so then we go um, let's go tax and then we can say 
equals 0 0.15. So in South Africa, this would mean that's the amount of you have to pay extra with whatever you buy. So let's put it into an example. So here we have um, our price and our total, which are reals, in case you don't know. Here we can just go our price. Let's say we're buying a milk. And the milk originally costs, after everything you know, it costs us 7 grand 57 cents. That's how it originally cost. Then our total would be something like our price times our price or not times we should add and make a plus plus our price plus and then tax now because it's declared up here it, you can kind of think of it as a private uh, you can use it anywhere within the code in this form I am not sure if you can use it between multiple forms, but you should anyways not do that. If you're going to do that, we will get to clauses later, but that's why your clauses comes in. Now, of course, you can do this in more than one line. I just decided to do it in one line. And we can go show message format float. First of all, uh, this should be times, not plus. Uh, second of all, it should be 0 0.00. Because just putting R there isn't going to do much, is it? Yeah, so that was my own stupidity. It is quite late at night, as you can see, and this is two hours late or early. So, yeah, it's like 11, 12, it's 1 a.m. in the morning. So, yeah, there we have it. Milk will cost us 8 rand and 71 cents. Now let's explain it. First of all, why do we put it in all caps? This isn't necessary, but we do it in order to be able to differentiate it from a changeable variable to a constant variable, something that cannot change. Just to prove that it cannot change, let's go here and go tax becomes 15. Now if we run this, we get two errors because left side cannot be assigned to which is that that's actually all just this cannot be assigned to this because this is a constant so it cannot change anywhere inside of the code let's say your birth date you cannot change it so that date would be constant also just take note this kind of yeah, you cannot there can be anything so if we go like this go name so it can be anything it can be a, a real a string pretty easy things to use you can manipulate it um, all caps just to clarify that it is something you cannot change uh, we also don't have to like put a name or something like that in front of it, it just all caps. That is enough to kind of explain to us on its own. So today we'll be talking about functions and procedures. You may have heard me mention those things in the past where I said it's a procedure, so it doesn't return something, or it's a function, so it returns something for you. So I've, I may have gone over a few things like that in the past. Well, now we'll actually be covering them. We'll actually be going through them, creating our own, and things like that. So we just have a normal form and one button here. We don't have to style anything. They're going to be very basic. Okay. Now, we can, for right now, we can ignore that this button itself is a procedure. Well, we're going to create our own procedure. But let's first talk about what a procedure is. Now, when you think about a procedure, you should think of, this, of the amount of steps that should be done. 
and that's it. It should just do a few things. For example, let's say you need to continuously copy and paste, uh, let's say, a sorting algorithm that sorts a global array. Now, what you can do is instead of every single button and instead of every single whatever you make, you can insert that sorting procedure and you can just be like, uh, you know, write out your entire. I'm not going to write out the sorting, or, or let's just go make a for loop just to make it a bit more realistic. Uh, I don't know there. Okay, so you can go for and make say i becomes one to let's say 15. We don't need anything specific right now. Begin and then again for j becomes i plus one to 15 and then begin and then you know control d. Now you can do this and then let's say you have all your extra code in here slash slash code. And now, now you decide, okay, I'm going to add another button. So let's go add another button. And whenever the user clicks this button, it should display whatever it should display, but it should also sort the array again, for in case the array was unsorted. So then you're like, okay, then we can just copy this, copy, paste it here, forget to add your your variables try to run it you get an error now like oh okay never mind I gotta paste this as well oh yada 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 you paste that as well now you run it and you do that let's say five times because now there's five buttons each button needs to do that that is unnecessary that that way of programming is quite unnecessary you do not need to do things like this because doing this is just you're wasting space for one a lot of lines of code is just going in for you know, creating a bunch of for loops and you're copy and pasting, which is a programming world is seen as very bad practice. You never copy and paste code, as they say. Not that anyone listens to that rule, everyone copies and pastes codes. But yes, now this is where a procedure comes in. Now you can make a procedure, and the procedure would basically copy and paste this code for you, but in a neat way. So let's create a procedure so I can show you what I mean. So in the private section, you can also make it public if you want, but private for right now is fine. So inside of the private section, you can create a procedure by typing procedure. And in the procedure name, for example, sort array. And that's all you need to create it. Then you press Ctrl and Shift and C. This will create the procedure. Now you can actually just do this, remove that throw it in here, take this, and throw it in here, and now you can just say sort array. Same here, we can actually copy this now, you know, just to prove those who say copying is wrong, wrong, and then paste that there, and you can remove that. We just made a very now imagine you did this five times, you know, you, you just made a one procedure that basically did everything for you. Now this procedure, if you call it, it's just going to do this. It's going to do whatever you tell it. Now let's take a more practical example that's more easy to understand. Uh, because sort array is going to be difficult to understand. So you can actually delete this procedure because we're going to remove it. But that was just as an example to show you how much better your code will look if you use procedure. So let's call this procedure um, say hello. And now we can go here and we can say say or wait, wait, wait. let's let's first create the procedure. Um control shift C and we can just keep these boxes of code on here. Okay. Now we can say it just says show message Hello there, Netsu. And now we, if someone clicks this button, they can just say, say hello. And now if we run this, and we just drag and drop it here, okay. Now in button one, we say, say hello, and here is the say hello procedure. So if we click it, it's executes the procedure because basically what this procedure does it, it just copies and pastes this code here 
um, in very simple terms, in very, very, very simple terms. Take that with a huge grain of salt, a huge grain of salt, each. But take that with a grain of salt. It doesn't just copy and paste, but it's, it's, as an example, so it's basically like copy and pasting the code here for you. But you, it's like ba you're basically creating another button without actually creating another button. Because as you can see, both of these are procedures. They just execute code. You just tell it to do a bunch of things and they will do it. For example, I can even say here um, input box and like put things in there and stuff like that, you know? It's nice. So now let's get to a bit of a deeper pro, uh, place in the procedure realm. This is taking in parameters. Now, what's a parameter? If you look here at the button, which is a, quite a good example of a procedure. It has a one parameter, which is the sender parameter, which is an object. I have no idea what that means, but this is actually a, a, a parameter. And we can add parameters to work procedures as well. So we can go like this and say, um, is name, I almost said std, my freaking C++ skills. And we can say string. And now it's taking in a name. We can just copy and paste that here. Okay, so now it takes in a variable. And now we can say hello there, and we can actually create the string to be even better. This name. Because now it's dynamic. Whatever I put inside of here now gets turned into his name. So let's say my name is now John. John Jushin. That's a fine name. That's such an annoying place to open up each and every time. You click the button. Now it says whatever we put in there. Now we can create an input box, you know. Uh, we can say um, whatever is in here should be what's returned from the input box. So we can go input box. And now it's really dynamic. Now the user can tell it what to say back. And that is basically what you use when you use a parameter. You can also add more parameters. So let's say we want to get the user's age as well. So then we can go I age, and that's an integer. Now, now we actually take in an integer as well. So now I'm just going to uh, remove this input box because that's going to make the browser running everything very annoying. So let's say the name is Lucas and his age is 19. Let's just copy and paste this here because now that's going to be a bit of a problem. Okay. Lucas and he is 19. So now we can go plus and you are plus int to string i age plus years old press ctrl d now if we run this we can click the button and you're 19 years old now the nice thing about procedures is that now let's say if you didn't make this procedure here and you wanted this to basically be he here the whole time but you wanted to say different names so you'll have to change this name the entire time then you had to copy and paste it like this you know like you had to do this you had to copy and paste and then fix and that's disgusting, right? You don't want to do that because that makes the entire code just look yuck. But now, because you have a procedure, you can just say copy and paste how many times you want. You can change this to, let's say, Caleb, um, Neil, Josh. You can like, change their ages to 10, 15, 20. 122 and now it will do the exact same thing as it did before but this time you didn't have to copy and paste a long line of code which 
will just make your code look more disgusting. So we click the button. As you can see, now it's going to print out each and every one of them. And we didn't have to basically scavenge through this where to change what or anything like that. And it's dynamic, so people can change this if you ask for input. Now that's great and all, and you can see where it's useful, you know, you don't have to constantly repeat yourself the entire time because you have already written it once, so you don't have to write it again. I want to give you a few examples of procedures. Beep is a procedure because beep has code inside of it, which executes whenever you call it, and then it makes a sound. Show message. That's a procedure. It creates another form. So if I just do this, it's going to create another form to display the sound. So let, let me show you. So now first we're going to hear a to do 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 sound, and then we're going to see the show message. I hope you guys heard that. I don't know if my uh, sound recording is on, but as you can see, it actually creates a like a different form. No, it's not completely a different form, it's actually something a little bit different, but it does classify as a type of form. So it basically creates a form for you, you can just say OK. And another procedure that you can maybe think of is the delete function for a string. So you know we can go like um, delete, and we can say uh, nil from position 1 to for 2 so it's just going to leave us with IL that's a procedure because it just manipulates whatever is thrown in here and then it keeps it like that as well so if you throw the variable in there you don't have to say that variable is equal to delete you know delete the manipulates that variable for you automatically but then there is something called a function now, now we can finally get to it. Now, a function is basically a procedure. It is, it is a procedure, but it has one trick up its sleeve. A function can return a value. If you're getting where I'm going right now, well done. So basically, let's say we want to uh, get the radius of a circle. I don't know how to get the radius, I don't know the exact mathematical way to do it out of my head. But, procedure wise it won't really work. Because, let's say we need to store that inside a variable, but how do we do that with procedure? The thing is we can't do that with procedure. A procedure just executes a bunch of lines of code for you, so you don't have to rewrite the code each and every time. So let's create a function. Oh gosh. So function, and let's say uh, no, not something like calculate radius. Let, let's say sum, and this sum will take in two parameters because remember it's just like a procedure. It just has a trick up its sleeve. So it's sum and it takes in num one and num two, which are both integers. But then, but then. It should return an integer itself. So remember, a function returns something, and whatever it returns should be its return type. So it should be of type integer if it returns an integer. So let's control shift and C again, and it will create the function for us. So now we can go result becomes num1 plus num2. Now what did I just do here? Basically I said result is what is what gets returned at the end. There's an invisible variable here. A, an invisible variable. So we can just go variable and it's called result which returns of type whatever is here. So in this case it returns an integer. But it's invisible, you know, so you can't see it. But it is there. And when if your code reaches its end, it returns this result. So you can do everything above here or, or everything below this, 
and it would return the same result. But it's good practice to put everything your code should do at the beginning before result. Only use result when you finally really get to where the result should be. Uh, which is, we'll get more deeper into things like that in the future, but for right now, you don't need to know too much about it. Now let's say, let's show message it. Show message. And we can go into to string. Jeez. Okay, into string, and we can say sum. Let's say 2 plus 5. Now if we go here, let's move this back here, and if we click no, if we click this button, it returns 7. It actually added 2 plus 5. 5, 6, 7. It is actually 7. Now you might be asking yourself, or me, or whoever you're asking, why though? Why? Why use this when you can just say show message inside of the procedure? You know, that's kind of stupid. Why use a freaking function? Like you can literally just say show message and you'll get the same show message. Well, let's say you have a variable. Uh, variable user sum which is an integer. And now the user inserts, inserts two numbers, and then you have to find the sum of it, and you have to work with it in your code. Well, when you have a function, you can quite literally do this. User sum becomes sum, and then whatever the user inserts. So they insert, uh, let's say, 5, 5 this time, which is 10. Well, let's go 5 and... Yeah, 5 and 5 will work. Then you can do the same here. Use your into string and then user sum. So then you can work with it. You can literally manipulate it. So you can go user sum. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's go inc. Yeah, user sum by 2. So now it's going to basically add 2 to user sum. And then you want to display it out, but now you've manipulated it outside of the function itself. Isn't that pretty cool? And just to show you that it is a procedure, you can do whatever you want in here. I'm going to, uh, let's create a variable. Uh, variable, uh, let's call it uh, is, uh, is message. And this is a string. And then we can go as message becomes, and we can put in there and right here, code is processing. Excuse any spelling errors. And then we can say show message is message, you know. And then it will return what it should return. Let's run this because the, the code is getting quite complicated right now. We should run it so we can actually see what we're getting a return. So now let's click the button. First it says code is processing. Because when you call the sum function, before it returns anything, it shows this message. So only once I click OK, it's going to return the result. If I say OK, it returned the result and it's 12. Now you might be wondering what way we added 5 plus 5, but then we incremented it by plus 2. And we stored it inside of a variable and then displayed that variable after we manipulated that variable. Isn't that cool? And a function can return basically anything, any type of value you can think of. You can return a string, you can return a real, you can do anything. Because basically, if anything is you can do inside of a button, anything you can do in the button, almost anything that is, you can do in a procedure. And anything you can do in a procedure, you can do in a function. But a function can return a value. But you shouldn't use a function if it doesn't return anything. You shouldn't just use a function because you can. Function should only be used in the right time.
if you're not returning anything, if you're just not saying result anything, and you're just using it as a procedure, then you're actually using it incorrectly. And that's bad programming. So only use a function if you have to use a function, if you have to return something. If you do not need to return anything, then use a procedure. So if we go here and we search for calc, we should get a LibreOffice calc. Now LibreOffice calc is quite a lot like Excel. And Excel itself you can kind of see as somewhat of a database-like application. So to explain it, this is a database. And, or this is the table inside of a database. A database basically holds data. It just holds information of things you maybe need to keep track of. For example, this is a table CD. It gives you the CD's artist, the name of the CD, its genre, its replacement value, and its owner ID. We'll get more to what owner IDs and stuff like that are. But for now, just note that it gives it in columns and then there are these these are seen as rows so in each row there are there is something that is special to that specific thing you're trying to do so artist the artist of cd 10 that's the name is al al cool j the genre of cd 10 is jazz its replacement value is 130 owner ID as well. If we go down maybe to like here. The artist Ashley Simpson. She has created the CD autobiography. It is of the genre pop and its replacement value is 120 and its owner ID is 2. So as you can see it just holds the basic information. It's it's basically an Excel sheet. You insert something like um, cost or um, user name, and then you can go to like age. Then you can insert something like John, and he's 22. And then you can go Lucas, he is 15. As you can see, it just it's kind of organizes data. It kind of keeps it in an organized way. It's the same thing when you go to databases. It is you, you create an organized a table with a bunch of information stored in it, a bunch of data. And that's the brief overview of what a database is. It's just something that keeps a bunch of data together. Alright, so today we will be taking a look at more databases. So we'll be connecting a database to our VCL application. So let's create one. Alright, so what you want to do is you want to save all. You want to save this because we need to find a specific folder for it. So here in my studio slash projects, I'm going to create a new and a folder. All right, then you want to run it just to make sure you create all the necessary folders. All right, so now we can go to our documents and here I'll choose the music database. And then inside the folder you created, inside of the Win32, inside of the debug, you want to paste it there. So what you want to do is you want to go to new and then other. And here in database, there should be something called a data module. I'm going to say, okay. Now you have a data module. All our database things will go on here. 
So then you want to save this. We can go DM connection. So first thing we'll need here is to place an ADO connection. Now, basically this just connects to the database. If you run it, it will find wherever the database is and it will try its best to collect it. Now, another thing you can also do is to avoid troubles. You can just paste that there as well. What you want to do is you want to go to connection string, click on the three dots and then say build. And then you want to say Microsoft JET 4.0 OLE DB provider. You want to say next. Then you have to find wherever the database is. We can just select it here or you can go in here and select it here. It doesn't matter. Then you say open. And while this doesn't really uh, do too much, it would be smart of you to delete all of this. And just have that because otherwise if this is on a different computer and that doesn't exist that pathway it's going to throw an error so you can just maybe remember that the next thing you want to do is you just want to test the connection if it succeeded it means you have connected it correctly if it doesn't succeed it means you need to try again then here at advanced, you want to tick read write because that would be that will give us the ability to read the file or to read the database and write to the database. Now you can just say OK and you can just say OK again. Then here at the object inspector, you want to say here at login prompt here. You want to say false because otherwise it's going to give you a pop-up the whole time asking you to insert a password and insert a username and you don't want that so you want to disable that we can save this then you want to add an ADO table to your form all right so if we go open database we open the music database module you will see we have a bunch of tables in here one I created for fun and two that were here from the beginning Now the table we want to see is I believe it's TBLCD so we are going to try and get TBLCD to show up but first let's just rename this because this is it would be better if we can go con music and this tbl music so this will find a table if you have more than one table then you can use more than one of these then we want to go to connection and we want to connect it to con music because now this table is connected to this database then here at the table name you want to go down here and you want to select one of these we can go tblcd so now it is connected if we go here to this table You can see that if we try and list everything inside of it, it will list everything inside of this table. But if we try and list TBL owners, they will list something else. This is because this database has more than one table. We'll get more into that later on, but for now, just know that the databases can have multiple tables inside of them. Also a good thing to note is you can do exactly the same thing that you did with this, with this TB, this um, ADO table. If you go here, you can build a connection, everything. But if you want to have multiple tables, if, if you have multiple tables in your database, then that wouldn't be very good practice. 
because then each one of them has to reconnect or in their own way or you can have one connection and that connection will connect all of the tables in that database just something for you to note but you can if you don't want to use a ADO connection you can just use an ADO table the next thing we need is a data source then you want to change the name to DS music and the data set you want to say TBL music the data source is basically a way to read from this TBL music so while the table is connected to this music connection right here we cannot directly read off from it we have a special component that will interact with this component so that's just something you may note you want to save this and just resize the form to look a little bit nicer since it just kind of looks a little bit too big all right now what you want to do is you want to go back to your connection form and press F12 and here in the users clause you want to say whatever this name you gave it comma dm connection underscore you okay so now that you have connected this and this with each other we can start to go further once a d b grid right here drag this right on here and you might see that it looks kind of familiar even in this state this is a db grid this is a db grid being used right here and basically this is how it looks from the beginning it may be resized this to be a little bit longer go down a little bit more so on the db grid you want to change the data source to basically this this data source music these two are now connected so you can now use this data source to connect to this table music now we can go back to this dm connection and this tbl music we want to make it active then if we go back here suddenly it displays the table As you can see right here so now we have just connected our database to our Dalphi form of course you do not per se need this DM connection you can do everything you need to on this form here as well but that will look unneat in the design and it just wouldn't work out as well as what it will on here I'm going to show you all how to use a DB navigator. Now, when you start with Delphi, it's not, you don't need to really navigate the database using code and stuff like that. It's always good for a beginner to first use something other than, you know, code just to get started or just get the basics. So there's a component called DB navigator. Now, if you have your DB grid on your form, and you place a DB navigator on it. And then all you have to go is you have to go to data source. And here on your DM, the one we created in the previous video, here is your uh, D data source. And basically, remember this connects this form of, or this uh, unit with this form. So it's always good to have that data source there. Then you can go to data source and you can connect it to whichever one you want. This data source right here is connected to this DB grid. And because we're connecting to with that data source to this DB grid, it's this DB navigator. So if we run this, then right here, if we go like, you can move around, uh, we can go back to the top, we can go to the bottom, we can add things here like, um, 
example example uh, let's go let's say rock replacement value is one and it's owner ID we can make that 46 and now that we have added it it basically stays there it is now part of the DB grid we have refresh button and uh, we have a remove so if we want to remove this we can just say remove but these two here are mostly to us uh, to delete and or not to delete to save and stuff like that for this example uh, let's edit it as you click this it allows you to edit and let's go someone like use just to make it sound weirder if you go like that it's now saved in the database so that is all there is to this video guys i just want to show you all that you can use this to navigate through a through a db grid that has a database inside of it but we on the next video is are going there but we are going to in the next video then we're going to just replace this with something else and we're going to basically make our own and to insert stuff to remove stuff to search all of that all right so today i'm going to show you all how to add data so everything that's updated is here is the, the table we just changed the table from tbl music to tbl owner as you can see here at the table name or tbl cd to tbl owner just to make things less complicated and that's all we did here in here we just added a button called add data with the name bt and add right there so what we'll be doing is we'll as the button says we'll add some data to this so to do that first thing you gotta do is uh, just you don't need to do this but you click double click on this say add all fields if there's nothing here and that will just help you through everything now when you click the button we first want to get all of this information from the user and unfortunately for right now there is only one way to get it and for right now and it is through in an input box so let's first create our variables got to keep that there just for in case and if you are unsure of which to add and where for example how do you know that's a boolean how do you know that's an integer feel free to go check here as you can see grade is only numbers so it will obviously be an integer Owner ID, that's only numbers, obviously be an integer. String, string, this, you can maybe think it's an integer, but it has a zero at the beginning. That means it's a string. Numbers, such as phone numbers, are always strings. Remember that. String or character. And string, true or false, that is a checkbox, so it's a boolean. And that's a string, because it has slashes in them. So just something for in case you didn't know. And now we're going to use input boxes to get all of the data. Now uh, I'll just skip forward with this, but you can do it alongside with me. Alright, so that took a little while, but I also gave all of them their own special little value, which they will have automatically. Now, this is where we start inserting things to the database. So, first thing we got to note is that the database has states. It has quite a few states, but the one we're focusing on is the insert state. We want to insert data, so we of course have to change this into its insert state. 
Now, before we continue, just remember if you didn't rename your data module, do so now or remember whatever is in here. Okay? So let's get to adding stuff. So let's go with DM music do. Also remember you have to import it. So here's my theme connection underscore u. Just mind the spelling. <laughs> or don't mind the spelling, I mean. So now we have to change the state of the database. Right now it's in a no, it's not in a state, it's just in a displaying state, we could say. So we have to put it into an insert state. So to do that, we have to go tblowner.insert. This puts it into the insert state. And uh, let me show you. If I were to drag this outside of this width and paste it there, it will give me an error because it doesn't know what to do. So basically what this does, it just does this. It just adds this to the front of this, if you didn't catch that video. So basically if we just do this, we get the same but it's less code. And we're going to be using the music a lot in front of these, so it's good to have this with with us. Now to access data or to get a a specific part in the database where you can insert something, you have to kind of use like an array. Sort of like TBL owner. And then kind of like a at index. And in this case, at index owner ID. So we're basically going to kind of like change it like we do with an array, but without numbers, just text. And we'll say becomes I owner ID. And we'll just be doing this for all of these. So I'll just fast forward again. Okay, now before I forget, because um, we ran into a little bit of a problem, is here, or actually just here, yeah, I just actually have to get that. It is a read only, so you can't edit it, so you have to just disable that, save, and now when we run it, and if we go down all the way here, we can see there's up to owner ID 70, and we can add the data. And as you can see, there's now a 71 Jackson Kelly with the number and everything we added there. Now, if we close this, before we run it, what we need to do is we have to go tblowner.post. Basically, this just tells the database to save whatever's happening there. The new Delphi does it for you automatically. And uh, you don't need this to save. But just put it there for in case, because you never know when something might go wrong. If we say run, okay, so now it added the data. And that is how you add the data to a database using Delphi. If we close this and we run the program again, it is there and that's how we add data to a database easy enough so let's just uh, continue before we actually go and just recap we added a bunch of variables we inserted all the data into those variables and remember the correct data if it's an integer if it's a boolean then we said with the music because without this, we'll have to add DM music dot in front of all of these. And we added everything. First, we insert it. We add, put it into insert mode. We added everything. 
and then we set post to save it not necessarily need it anymore but for safety sake say post this time it's about time i show you how to edit the data into the database for example change this here at grade to something like 10 for example just change it so the only things I changed was I changed what this was connected to. So now it's connected to TBL owner and not TBL CD. Make sure that all of your things are active. Here I didn't really change anything. And here at the button, I just added an edit button. Nothing special about that. So let's get straight into it. So in the previous video, I did talk about state and I did go over those things and you should by now have some sort of idea what we're going to do everything now in order to edit it. So first thing we have to do is if we run the program right now, you'll see that there's like this little pointer that like points to a specific row, you know, like to a specific record. And it's if you 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 can click on it if you click on things it focuses on that specific record you are clicking on now it's there for no reason it in fact has a reason to why it's here this is to show you where the database currently is focused on like if it's focused here and i'm going to edit the database it's going to edit it here to whatever i say it should be uh, if it's here it's going to edit the database here if it's here, it's going to edit the database here. Okay. Okay. So now that you know that, that, that's basically all you need to know. So we're going to give the user an option to um, choose what they want to edit, which is not the owner ID. Or, or let's make it a little, a little bit more simple. We're going to make them be able to edit the grade they can change the grade to whatever they want it to be that sounds fair right okay so we are going to find whichever one they want to edit using the owner id we can we can found it we can find it by uh, using the owner first name or owner surname but I feel like there might be repetitive things here. For example, there might be two people with the surname Curry, or there might be two people with the name Kevin. So then we'll have to add in surname as well, which is going to cause extra code. And here I want to teach you the basics. So we're going to search by the owner ID. Okay. Okay, great. Now well, let's go back here and double click on the edit button. So first thing we will need is we'll need to get which owner ID we want to edit and what we want to change the grade to. Now, last time I told you the value types, they actually matter, which is a number, a number or an integer. This would be a string, 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 character or string and so on and so forth. Okay. Remember that is very important. I'm saying, okay, way too many times. So let's create variables and we're going to and we're going to I can't talk today I ID which is going to be the user ID and I grade which is going to be the user's grade integers so first thing we've got to do is we got to find the ID I ID oh my gosh I ID becomes string to str to int and we're going to use input box again of course you can use an edit or whatever you want to get all of the data we add our default parameter thingies and then we go a user id which user do you want to edit? We're going to give it a default value of two. And then I grade, which will be in here. str to int, again, input box.
Mm. We'll give it default value of 12. Okay, and then we can do that. And press Ctrl D, Ctrl S. And now that we have the data, we have to actually find the location that we're looking for. So to do that, let's go um, also before I forget, I did change this um, this whole thing. I just changed the name to DMCon. Just take that as a note. And remember to import it as well right here. Anyway, so now you can go with. You don't need to use with. I just like to use with to decrease the amount of typing I have to do. DMCon do begin. So yes, we want to put it into edit mode, but we don't do that just yet. First, we got to make sure that that ID does actually exist. Let's say it only goes up to 70. And now the user types 71. We don't, we can't edit that. That's going to throw an error. We don't want the user to see that error because they don't, they're not going to know what it means because they don't know how to code most likely. So what we have to do is we have to personally make sure that it's going to work. To do that, we have to constrain them. So the first thing we have to do is we have to take this TBL music. We're going to search through this thing, or we're going to use this to search through this right here. So we're going to go TBL music dot locate. Now locate is basically just going to find everything we are searching for. In this case, we are searching the user ID. So first we have to s specify what column we are searching through. In this case, we are searching through owner ID. Remember, spelling, very important. If you're going to spell owner ID with a small O and not a capital O, you are going to get an error. Remember, very important. So we can go owner ID exactly the same as here no spaces nothing and then what are we searching for in this case we're searching for iid and then all we have to do is just add empty braces here this is for uh, something way in the future no need to worry about this right now okay then what we want to do is we can go equals true but we don't need to so I'm going to leave that out. That is up to you. Now we can finally turn the table or turn the database into edit mode, which would be tblmusic.edit. And we can at the bottom tblmusic.post. New Delphi is not really needed, but always good practice to still use that, to still say tbl music.post. Post is still very important because it still says even if Delphi does it for you, do not take it lightly. So now we want to edit the grade. So now we can go TBL music and in square brackets. As I told you before, it's basically like an array but you use words. And we want to edit this right here, grade. So we turn back and we go grade becomes I grade. Okay, now this is great and all, but what if this doesn't get found? Are we just not going to do anything with it? Or are we just going to skip everything out? The user is going to click the button and it's going to he's going to wonder like why isn't it working? So what we have to do is we have to go else. I have to give it an else statement just to make sure that the user knows what's going on. Show message. User ID not found. DS. Okay. And this is the basic structure which you will use to edit your database. So let's run it and see if it works. So we are going to edit this one that says 10. Okay, we're going to edit. It's user ID 2. And we can, yeah, no, we can check anymore. It's user ID 2. We're going to say, okay, we want to change it to 12. We click it. 
it's 12. That's great. Now, if we close this and we rerun it again, does it stay the same? Yes. So we successfully edited a entire record in the database. And all it took was actually just these few lines if you exclude what you need to get from the user. So, so here we have a new button. I'm not even going to name this button. I'm just going to say delete. Because we're going to learn how to delete some records. Now, I did change the database we're using because the previous database had more than one table in it. And those two tables were linked and it just causes a lot of problems if you try and delete one thing from it. So we are going to work with a database that has only one specific table in it. And today the table I'm using is uh, whatever is in Visual Arts of MDB. I can unfortunately access it because I don't have access. But this is whatever is inside of it. You can see it's basically the same thing. Did we change too much here? Just the connection string. I changed where to find the new file. And then I also just changed what table it's using. In this case, it's our competition entries. So yeah, now let's get to deleting. Now, since we have already learned about insert and edit, yeah, deleting is pretty easy. So what we're going to do is we're going to get input from the user. For example, the ID we want to delete. For example, let's say we want to delete ID 1, which is Risa. Then we can just delete it if the user asks it. So what we got to do is we got to go variable. Okay, so we got the user input. Now, right up here, I still have the previous code, which we can actually work off with. So we have a with here, and it's basically going to stay the same. We're still going to use a with. So, with dmcon do. Then, remember the locate we used? Which basically, if you can remember, it just finds whatever is in here inside of this thingy. So in the previous one, it would have been owner ID and it's going to search for the ID. In this case, we're going to say learner number and it's going to search for the learner number. So we can just go if tblmusic.locate, ooh, whoopsie. Put locate very basic. <clears throat> so first let's code the else because it's basically going to stay the same. Never mind. And then in here we can go like in the previous ones we had a state we had to put it in before we do it. But basically what's going to happen is the cursor is going to go to whichever one it should, for example, let's say 10, we're going to go there and we're going to put it in state delete and it's going to delete that row. Easy as that. We don't have to tell it to do anything. Once it goes into the delete state, it deletes whatever it is on at that moment, in which case it would be one because we're going to ask it to delete one. So tbl music dot delete oh, damn. oh my crap what am I doing what am I doing with my life dot delete please okay so that's just going to delete it and if it did delete that then we should just go show message deleted record there we go So let's quickly test it out and then we'll explain more on it. Okay, so we're going to try and delete one, which is one Ariza 
Ooh, okay, yeah, all of that. Delete one deleted record. Okay, great. And then let's try and delete 10, which is Megan. 10. It deleted a record. Now let's try and delete something that doesn't exist, like 1. Lunar number not found. It works perfectly. So let's go for it. First we get the user input. And then we make sure it's an integer because we are working with the primary key, which is in this case a number. So then we say, if you find wherever that number is inside of, whoopsie, inside here, if you find the number here, then you should delete it. The, the, even, if, even if it's the state, it's still going to delete it. Because once it enters the state, it's just going to be okay. I don't need to have anything else, I just gotta delete it. Unlike with edit or insert where we have to actually add some data, here you don't need to, so it just deletes it. And it shows the message. Otherwise, if it can't find it, it says can't found. Now, you might be wondering, why didn't we go tblmusic.post? Because we have been doing it in the past two tutorials. Well, this is because once it deletes something, it just posts automatically because it doesn't need to know when to stop inserting or stop editing. You know, it just knows as soon as it says delete, it just it just got to delete. It doesn't need any extra information. Unlike with these, where I tell it what I want to insert, and then after I tell it what I want to insert, I say post that new new stuff. You know. But you can still run it and see how it works. But of course, I grade is declared whenever you no 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 can't create. Oh wait, never mind. Boop. I forgot to close that. So you can run it. And remember, now there's a post there. So we're going to try and delete two. Now it's still going to delete two. Take note, but. It's going to give us an error because it's not in edit or insert mode, which means it doesn't know what to post. It can't post anything. So you can have it there. Just know that you are going to get an error and you're not going to like the error. So we can delete it. So today we are going to learn how to filter. So we know how to add, we know how to edit, and we know how to delete from a database. Now, what if we want to filter this? For example, what if we just want to see the people in the school um, Astra? What, what if we just want to see the people in the school? Then we will have to filter that. Or what if we just want to see the grade 11s, or the grade 10s, or people with stories? Or people that are in grade 10 and in school Astra, wherever that is, there is. So let's get started with that. Let's go add a button and let's let's just put it there. We don't need to code it, just first I want to show you something. Here in your DM connection, where you are probably connected to your database, as you can see here, there are different categories or different um columns which all have their own rows of specific values all of that things now let's say we want to without code we want to filter learner name we want everybody with the name cd however you say that or wait, let's let's make it easier we just it would be easier if we just go with grade so we want the, everyone that's in grade 10, we want to display all of those people. So without code, we can actually go here to this TBL music, which is an ADO table, because we're, ours might not be the same. And all we got to do is we got to go here to filter it, we got to activate this. So now it's true. And then we go grade is equal to 10. So now we will see everyone that is in grade 10. Only those that are in grade 10 are being displayed right now, as you can see. Of course, if we change this to something else, such as 
all the grades that are more than 10. Oh gosh, cancel. Then of course you'll get grade 11, 12. So yeah, that is how you will do it without code. I'm going to go deeper in how to do it with the code because that's what we're focusing on. So without code, that is all you have to do. And if you have been following my tutorials up until now, you'd probably know what to do in order to do this with code. But I'm not going to take any chances, I'm going to assume you don't. So go back here and this button that we added, first thing we want to do is we just want to change the name. Then we want to click on it. Okay. So first thing we want to do is if we go here and we look at TBL music and we go to filtered, you'd see it's set to false by default. Of course you can come in here and activate it, but for just to be safe, it's always good to go with and then just go DM and put your DM there. Just so we don't have to do all the extra code. TBL music dot filtered right there becomes true so this will make sure that it's being filtered if you run like this there should be no errors that pops up so just having it there doesn't really do anything wrong As you can see it doesn't do anything wrong so you can you can add that there as many times as you want now what you want to do is you want to filter it so tbl music oh whoa, what what whoopsie that was my mistake TBL music dot filter, which takes a string. So if we go here, you'll see that there's a filter and we put everything in there. So let's read to which let us try and recreate what we did. So let's go grade and we make it 10. So if you click on it, it should filter all the grades to only those that are equal to grade 10. So we go here, we see all those grades there, we click on filter, and now it's only grade 10s. Pretty neat, right? Now, what if we wanted to do schools, you know? Now, first thing you might want to do is you want to, or first thing you might do is you want to go, I'll go say that, first thing, you probably are going to do, if you see something like this, you're going to go school. Oh, that's school. School, and let's pick school. Astra, because that's easy to spell. A-S-T-R-A. A-S-T-R-A. And this should work, right? It, there shouldn't be any errors that pops up if we do that. But if we click on filter right now, Arguments are of the wrong type, are out of acceptable range, or are in conflict with one another. Now, that's because it this takes in a string. But the thing is, this is a string. So, you might think to yourself, okay, but why don't we just do double quotes then? Because that's also a string in most other languages. Even in SQL, that is considered a string. Well, filter and uh, that's not supposed to happen, right? Well, this is a part where Delphi specifically gets really ugly. Instead of using your instant double quotes, you should go quote quote, single quotes here. Basically, this is a double quote and this is a double quote. You can even do that just to make it easier to read. So double quote, double quote. You have to basically create your own double quote for this to work. So we click on filter. Now, as you can see, everyone, oh, there it is. Everyone in the school Astra is being listed. So everything you need to note here is just this is not the same as this. Or I should actually do this just to make it there. That is not the same as that. So yeah, now what if we wanted to choose everyone, let's go back here, 
and we go grade and we make it equal to 10. But what if we also wanted all the grade 11s or all the grade 12s? We can go or grade is equal to 12. Now, when you use or, it's a very good idea to just put everything in brackets, just so you can miss any errors that might come your way. If we click run, filter, and here on grade, you see grade 12, grade 10, no 11, nines or eights, just 10 and 12. And that's the or. Basically, it's just like an if statement. If it's this, or if it's this, you know, same thing. But what if you wanted to make sure that if they are, let's say, grade 10, right? And they do, yeah, yeah, and they, let's go expedition. And they are, I don't know what it's supposed to mean, but their expedition is true. So grade 10 and a true expedition. So what we do is, uh, now I've got to try and remember that. So then we can go and expedition equals true. Now if we run this, we go here, there's the grade, there's the expedition, filter, all the grade tens with the expedition of true. Okay, that's good and all. But what if we wanted to also take the grade 11s with the expedition of false? Then you can go or, and you can actually just copy this. And just to make it easier for everyone to read, plus, and then we can go to the next line, paste it there and make this grade 11 with the expedition of false. If we run this, we shouldn't receive any errors and it should just give us what we want. Go here and then we say filter. Grade 11's, expedition false, grade 10, expedition true. Fairly simple. Now let's start over. Now, what if we wanted everyone that is in a grade lower than 10, but not equal to 10? Then we can go where grade is less than 10. Go here, all the grades. Now it's only eight and nines. And what if we wanted equal as well? We get less or equal to. There's a tense as well. So basic Delphi operators also work in here. So yeah, the basic filter, there's nothing too special about it. It's fairly easy as well. Like we could do all of this in just two lines. If we remove this, then it will just be two lines. So yeah, that's been basic filters. I hope you all enjoyed this video and learned how to filter your own database results. Alright, so today I'm just going to go through a little bit of refresher with you guys, just so we all are on the same page. We're going to do a little bit of a calculation. So we are just going to do this. We're going to go through all of the prices here and we're going to calculate what all of them are in total. And then we're also going to return how many people there are in here. So let's go into calc. First, we'll need two variables then. Variable, I count, to count how many people there are. And I total, easy enough so far. Then what I want to do is we want to set both of these to zero. And now we want to start talking to the database. So with, now, we don't really need this in this case, but first thing we do want to do is we just want to go tblmusic.open. It's not necessary, but it's good because we want to read from the database. And in tblmusic.first, just so if the cursor is not at the first position, 
like let's say the cursor is there then it will go to the first position and start from there then we want to start the while loop well not tbl music dot end of file begin I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it's raining and it's noise. So first thing we do want to do is we want to go R total, R total. I mean I total. Oh wait, is it I total? Are we working with just integers? Yeah, it seems like we're working with just integers. Yeah. Okay. We're working with just integers, so it's our I total becomes i total plus I'm gonna go control D plus TBL music. Now usually if we want to select from here we just go like that. And believe me when I tell you there is nothing wrong with this. There is absolutely nothing wrong with doing it this way. But there is another way to do it. It's a little bit more effort. That's why I don't usually do it. But it's good for you to know. So dot field by name. And then in here you put whatever you want here. In this case we want the price. And then you have to say as what type it is. In this case dot as integer. Of course, there is also boolean and I believe string, yeah. Okay, so there is a bunch of data types you can use. And in this case, we want as integer because we want to receive integers. And then we can just ink I count. Show message into to string. I count there now this code should not give us any errors uh, you know what I did wrong yeah that was my own stupidity I'm not gonna lie because I accidentally started a while loop uh, because I did not go inside of this while loop tblmusic.next so it just kept on adding this one yeah that was my fault I'm sorry about that okay so 106 number of learners has been counted and they paid a total of 42,138 so that's basically all of this now just to show you, you don't need to use this, you can still use the previous method, I'm going to, that was not the outcome I was looking for, but I'm going to do this. Okay, we click run, 106, 42130, same effect, just one is a little bit more specified not really necessary for you to know how to use that i just want to throw that in here while we're doing this little assignment you know so let's say we want to sort this whole thing by the learner name in this case it's already sorted by the learner number as you can see it starts at one and ends at wherever this is 106 so let's try and sort it by the learner name and uh, yeah so let's go sort so we can go with dmcon do tblmusic.sort and it's going to take in what we want to sort by and how we want to sort it so this is where we get to ascending and descending. If I'm correct, ascending, that would be from one to to wherever, I don't know. And uh, descending 
would be from wherever to one you know so this is up this is down so let's try and do the names so we're going to go learn a name and we're going to sort it by ascending And to sort by ascending, all you have to do is you just have to go ASC or ASC, but ASC is best. So now, if I'm correct that ascending is from small to big, then we should have all the A's up here. Yes, Albert, Alex, Anil, Ashley, all of those people. Now, what if we were to remove this, you ask? Well, nothing much, it just automatically sorts by ascending. And then, of course, if you want to do it other way, you can just go descending. There you go, from Z to A. Now, you might be like, but what if they have the same name, but not the same surname? Now, that's a good question. Because how would you know which one to show first? Usually this would not matter in a normal scenario, but in this scenario it does. So let's go in learner surname. So this is all you have to do to order it. Basically it's going to order by learner name. If it finds a duplicate, it's going to order by learner surname. So sort now it does that. So this is how you sort with more than one thing at hand. And that is literally all there is to sorting, or at least most of it. We're going to search through this and try and find whatever we should find. In this case, I would like to find if there is a person called Diana. Let's go to search. So what we can do is we can just go with so that the basic structure and then if TBL music dot locate now Dalphi oopsie now Dalphi already gives you everything it's going to do it's going to take the key field string the key value and the options and if you were me then or if you're like me you probably don't understand what any of this means that's why i'm here to explain to you what all of that means now just take note that locate does return a boolean true or false so that's why you don't need to go equals true or whatever so first thing you want to do is you want to say where to search for it so in this case it's just search in learner name Okay, now that we have that, what next? Now let's just tell it what to search for. So we can, we want Diana. So D-I-A-N-A. -A. Right here we go, we search for Diana. And in the previous videos, I went up till here, you know, leaving this open and just showing you how to use this. Very simple, so let's first use like that before I continue. So let's try and do something here. Let's go learner found at, and then we just go and we try and get learner number. Let's wrap this into an int string just to convert it into its integer. And then we can also go here just add an else. Okay, so let's try and run this and just see if it works. So here is Diana. We say search. Learner found at seven. That is correct. Learner number is seven. Learner name. Now let's just sort it just so we can get a little bit of, you know, just out of it. Search. Learner found at seven. Well, that's kind of true because learner number is seven. But anyways. So yeah, that is how you just 
do a very basic search. It is automatically set to case insensitive, but if you do, this is where these options comes in. This is basically to say if it's case sensitive or not. In this case, no, we can reset it's not case sensitive. We can say it's case insensitive, meaning if it has a small D, find it in it. As a big D, find it. No matter what this D is, in this case at least. And there is another thing you can add here, except for the making it case insensitive. You can go hello partial key. Now basically what partial key means is if I go Dia, then it will see that Diana contains the three letters Dia. See, found it seven, Diana. But without this, it will say learner not found. And that is mostly just because of safety measures. So if you want to make sure that a learner, in this case a learner, uh, gets found, even if it's not the full name, even if it's just a specific few letters of the name, then in this case you can just go hello partial key. Easy as that. And you can use it for any of these fields, how it doesn't matter. But this is basically how you do a basic search. You just say TBL to locate, and it will ask for the column, it will ask for what you want. You can say if it should be case sensitive or insensitive. And here this will just say if you have to if you can do that, or if you need Diana, or you can just get Diane, it will return Diana. And if it finds it, it will say it found it and at which um, item it found it, at which at which key it found it. I, I, I didn't know what the name is right now, but whatever that is, learner number. It will return the learner number, and if it doesn't find it, it will say learner not found. That's very basic, but that is how you do a search. Easy as pie, am I right? So today I'm going to show you guys how to work with multiple forms on one project. Now you may be wondering, wait, what's a form again? I have no idea. This is a form. This this thing here that that's a form. So if we run it, the form pops up, and we can do things on the form. So what I'm going to show you guys to do is how to manipulate the database, but from a different form, because this form is becoming a little bit you know, full. So we want a second form to make it look less full. So let's add a button. And this button, we can call it B10 Manipulate Database. And this button is going to basically hold a form that's going to allow us to manipulate the database. So we can delete these two buttons to make the form look less full. Then we can maybe create another form, not in this video, where we can do all of this, you know, searching and stuff like that. So let's put it right here nice and big for the user to click on. Okay, now to create a second form, we first need to go to new or file, new, and VCL form, not VCL forms application because that will give you an entirely new application. A form because we just need a basic form. Boom, now we have a second form. Now first thing you'd want to do is you want to go to file and you just want to say save or just control this, both works perfectly fine. And then you want to give it a name. In this case, I want to go FRM manipulate FRM underscore U because it is a unit. Just like these, this form right here, that's a form. So FRM and as you can see underscore U. So we can just click save and Yes, okay, just ignore that you shouldn't get that pop-up, but I did. So I actually made a checklist of what we'll need to do. So first we'll need to learn how to show the form. So, but before we do that, let's just make it look beautiful. Let's just give it a button or two. 
Okay, and then before we continue, let's just give it a name. This will help us later on in the process. You don't need to, but it does make the process easier. And I just like to make at least one button work to show you guys how it works. So I'm just gonna copy everything inside the delete. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna paste it. And okay. And before we continue, just like in this form, we need to import. So we have to import DM connection underscore U because we want to manipulate the database. And we can manipulate the database by using this data module we created. Okay, now you just go control D, control S. That should fix any problems we may have. Now let's just run this very quickly okay now that it's running let's quickly click on this button that we created you might notice that nothing's happening we're not getting another form or anything like that that's because we have to add special code to make the form appear firstly we have to import the form because this application doesn't know the form exists so we have to import this Okay, and that will import this. And let's see, right here. Now, remember how we gave our form a name? We called it FRM Manipulate, as you can see. Now, that's how we're going to address this form. We're going to address it by saying FRM Manipulate. And then we want to open it, so dot show and we said dot open now basically dot shows just says okay we have the form just show it to the user and invisibilize it if you want to do it like that so let's run it again and let's test it out okay now let's click on manipulate database as you can see a second form pops up we are lucky enough to be allowed to use both forms without any problems although this form does stay on top now let's say we want to delete the, from this database. Now because we did already do the code, we can just click on delete and let's delete one. Beautiful, the record was deleted. Now let's close all of this. Now you might be wondering, okay, but what if, just hear me out, what if we tried to hide this form, this one right here, because what if that was a login form? You don't want that to stay there the entire time. Or what if this was a login form? I mean, you don't want this to stay here the entire time. So what you'll need to do then is you'll have to go um, self dot hide. Basically what self means is self says select this form and hide it. You can also, if you want, you can go here and just click on that. This is a form connect. So if you want, you can go fromconnect.hide. It does the same thing. This one just specifically shows this form. And this one just says, find this form and hide it. So both works the same. This one is just more specific. No, or not more specific. It's actually less specific, but it shows that it's this form. So if we're going to run this, now if we were to click manipulate database, it disappears and we can do whatever we want now if we close this you might have a few problems trying to run it again and we'll get to that on a later stage but right now it keeps running in the background as you can see right here go to users select your user and just stop it from running in the background okay once you've done that you can run the application without any problems and what's next on the checklist or to-do list? Okay, so now to close the form. What if you had a button on this form? And that button had to close the form because maybe the user doesn't click the close button or they can choose when it should close or whatever. So then you can go self.close. Basically, it's just the same as self.hide. 
it closes this form it terminates the process it is basically the same as clicking this red button right here so if we run this and we click on manipulate database and on the edit button which we coded to close it will close the form easy as that you can also hide it and whatnot okay so I just showed you guys how to work with form 7 I explained that it keeps running in the background let's say we hide this and we run this and with it in we close it keeps running in the background no matter what right so what we then have to do is we cannot cross reference in Delphi which means we cannot go here and say frm uh, connect tb underscore u that's the other form we, we can't say that because even if we run this right now it's going to tell us hey, that you can't do that you see it gives you the error there because you are not allowed to cross reference here circular unit reference you only one may be referenced per form or not one like if i reference this one from this form then on this form this shouldn't be referenced and then on this form it should or, or it's very confusing but just know that this form cannot reference this form right here if this form is already referencing this form and vice versa why are you giving me errors what did i do i didn't do anything you're just full of nonsense okay now let's go back to where we were now let's say we do that and we then try and show this but we cannot show it we can't go frm connect db dot show we, we can't do that Delphi doesn't know what frm connect db is we didn't import it but we can't import it because Delphi doesn't allow us so what do we do then before the self dot close because remember once self dot close closes you cannot run anything else basically it stops the whole process so what you're gonna do is we're gonna go application dot main window or dot main form dot show basically this will just show the main form so we do not cross reference we just tell it take hey, select the application find the main form and please show it and now if we run it we shouldn't get any errors we shouldn't get anything running in the background because we're going back to the main form so now manipulate database main form hides we click on the close which is just inside of the edit and there we go now if we close this the whole process will stop before it didn't and that is how you basically have cross reference and stuff like that and what's also important to just go to your projects options and then inside here go to forms and just set your main form because if you don't set your main form it's going to or if you don't set the one you want to be your main form is going to open the wrong one so your for your login form is not your main form that is just a login form that should open first but it's not your main form just remember that all right so today i'm going to tell you all about the bubble sort and how to sort of arrays so yeah we're going back to arrays after taking a slight break so imagine for a second that these numbers here these are an array and we want to sort the array so it isn't one two nine seven five it is one two five seven nine like that so we're going to, to use an algorithm called the bubble sort now it is one of the most easiest sorting methods to learn it's not the only one out there but it is the easiest for beginners to get and even as someone who has been programming for three years i still use it a lot of the times uh, not that much because actually because you know javascript already gives the option to sort for me but anyways so what's going to happen is we're going to put our pointer right here and we're going to tell it, hey, what's this number? And it's going to say it's 1. 
Then we're going to make it go to the next one. And it's going to put its pointer right there. And you see it's going to go to. But it's still going to have a pointer. Let's just change the color to something we can see as well. But it's still going to have a pointer right here. A reference pointer, if you may. And basically it's going to say is to smaller or bigger than one. Now let's say we want to go from small to big, right? And it's going to say two is bigger than one. So two should stay here. And then one should stay there. Okay, so right now we know it is one and it is then two. Now the pointer is going to go here to nine. And it's going to check again, but this time for two. So it's going to check two. And it's going to be like, okay, so nine is bigger than two right okay good so that means nine stays here because we shouldn't move nine forward okay okay then it's going to go to seven and here is where it's going to like check back at nine as it's going to be like wait what seven that's smaller than nine and we want the smallest from smallest to biggest so Okay, then let's go again. So it's one, two, and now we put seven there and nine here. Now the computer thinks, yeah, I'm very smart. I'm so smart, I just fixed this whole array. Then it sees, oh, there's another one. But now remember, nine's here. So this here is nine now, and this here is seven. So then it's going to compare nine right here. Let's go back to it. It's going to compare nine with 5. It's going to check, okay, so 5 is smaller than 9, so I should rewrite the array again. So now it's going to go 1, 2, 7, 5, 9. Okay, good job. Now it's going to go over again, it's going to loop through it again to make sure everything's correct. And that's where we go here. So this is now our new array, and now it's going to start with the array again. Let's change to black. So it's going to check one. One, okay, we have one. Now it's going to compare one with two. Two is bigger than one, so two stays where it is. Then it's going to compare two with seven, right? As you can see, okay, seven, that is bigger than two. We can leave it right there. Then it's going to go again. Okay, ooh, what is it? Five, five is smaller than seven. Oh, okay, let's rewrite this. So now it's 1, 2, 5, 7, 9. And now it's going to compare, let's change the color again, to red. Now it's going to compare this 7 number right here. We should actually work with indexes. So it's going to compare index 4, as we know in Delphi, with index five or nine so it's going to compare seven with nine and you can see okay but nine is bigger than seven okay now this is our new array one two five seven nine so now it's going to loop through it again and it's going to be like okay one that's fine two two is bigger than one so two should stay there five five is bigger than two so five should stay here seven 7 is bigger than 5, so 5 should stay here and 7 should stay there. 9, 9 is bigger than 7. This is going to be like, okay, but there's nothing left. And we did check thoroughly through all of this. So this array is sorted. And that's basically how the bubble sort works. It's going to loop through the array the whole time until it's array and make sure that there is nothing to make sure. And make sure that there's nothing out of its place. It's going to go through it a bunch of times. Now, if you don't quite understand this too greatly, we're going to code it anyway. So you're going to see how it goes in action. All right, so let's close this. So this is basically the bubble sort. You can use it in almost any language, and it will basically work the same. It doesn't really matter how big the array is, but just know the bubble sort is not the fastest sort in the world. It does take a short while, and that is why there are better sorts out there, but they're more complicated. So let's just negative all of that. 
Now I have created a small form, just read display, uh, read it, uh, reject it, BTN display, BTN sort, which this one just displays the array. And we click on this, here are the arrays, our names, which were declared up here, and our age. And here are just a few and a couple of names, and here are the people's ages. Okay. And then here we have just a basic display. It just displays everything, it doesn't do anything specific. And we're going to use this to display everything the whole time. So let's go to sorting the array. Now, how would we go about sorting it? Now, what we want to do is we're going to sort both of these because these are their ages and their ages should stay with the people. But for now, let's focus on first sorting the names in alphabetical order. So let's go variable and then let's add an S temp. This is so we can have a temporary variable to keep a name in while we move things around because we can't remove a name from an array, replace that name, and then put that name back without adding a, a variable. Which means, if we go here, if we take, let's say we're here, if we remove seven, so we can add five here, then it removed seven. We didn't store it in a variable then, so how's it going to know seven has to go back here? It's not going to know that, so we store seven in temp okay we, we make temp to equal to 7 and then we make this equal to temp okay and then we can continue and we can do that the whole time so let's go first we want to create a for you for let i equals 1 to the length of our names and then begin. So this is just going to loop through it one time. Now let, let me just quickly show you what we're going to do. So we're going to go S temp becomes R becomes R names at index I. And then we're going to say R names at index i becomes our names at index i plus one and then we're going to say our names at index i plus one becomes is temp and and this is just basic, but this is not how we're going to do it. We're just showing you right now. So basically, it's going to set this name. This is let's say this is one. It's going to set one e or is temp equal to one. So this right here is is temp. Then it's going to flip them. It's going to make the one after this one. So it's going to make two equal to index one. And then. It's going to make where 2 was equal to S10, which was 1. So now the first two numbers would be 2, 1, and then 5, 7, 9. But now I might be thinking, but how is that going to sort it correctly then? It's just going to scramble everything. Correct. That is why we create an if statement. We say if our names at index i is more than our names at index i plus one and how might this work you may ask now for some of you this might be common knowledge and for others it may not but let me quickly explain something all letters in the alphabet has a specific let's say a specific number value to it for example if i'm correct a is equal to 97 i'm not sure if that's correct but if i'm correct then it is and b would then be equal to 98 and c would then be equal to 99 so 
it's going to go on like this. And what's going to happen is, if it finds a name, let's say the name is A, then it's going, going to say, okay, the name's number value is 97. Or let's say the name is AB, then the name's number value will be 97, 98, you know? And then you have one that's BA. The name BA would be 98, 97. So it, the computer sees everything as numbers, and we see everything as not numbers, we see it as letters. And the computer is going to check, okay, this one's 97, and this one's 98. 97 is smaller than 98, so 97 is obviously going to be before this one. We can also go AC, which would be 97, 99. And then it would be 98, 97. And it's going to check, oh, but that's not correct. Okay, so this should be here because this one is less than this one. And it's going to check here, 98, 99. It's going to say, okay, this should stay the same because 99 is bigger than 98. And that's basically how it's going to compare everything. Ooh, that was a lot to explain and a lot to take in, of course. But you might also be thinking about, is this good practice to do it like this? Because I can see how if you have multiple, if you, have, if you just use this, it's just so much to type. And not even just much to type, it just looks like bad practice. That is also why it's a good reason to go for and create an extra for loop, which takes in J this time. One to the length of R names and we can just go at the begin and add our end and now we can switch it from from i plus one to j and now it also suddenly becomes a lot more readable so before I forget, this should be i plus 1. So it's the same thing. But this time, it just has, you know, this. <laughs> so, yeah, that's basically how it's going to work, how it's going to format everything. So it's going to set i equal to 1. Right, let's draw that. And now let's get started. So where were we? Okay, so we were here at 4 i equals 1. Okay, so let's create an array. There is 1, 2, 9, 7, 5. I do not like that brush, so let's say enable that. Okay, 1, 2, 9, 7, 5. That's our array. And we say i, the variable i, we make that equal to 1. So it's going to be equal to index 1. This is index 1. Remember arrays? This is index 1, index 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, and then we say j is equal to 1 plus 1, because it's i plus 1. So this will be 2. So this is j. So let's just create it right here. So this is i at the moment, and this is j at the moment. And this can go here. If our names at index i, so if this one right here is bigger than this one right here, but only if it's bigger, then take s temp, the variable we created, so we'll just call that s, and make it equal to the one at i. But right now, nothing will happen because this hasn't been confirmed. Okay, let's erase that. So now it has confirmed that those two are safe. Now let's continue. Now i has become... Ugh. Let's make that red. Then I'm going to draw over it. Now i has become 2. So i is 2. And j is now... Because it's i plus 1. And i is now 2. It's going to become 2 plus 1. And 2 plus 1, as we know, is 3. So i is going to be at index 2, and j is going to be at index 3. 
and it's going to compare them again. Is 2 bigger than 1? No. I mean, is 2 bigger than 9? No, it's not. So we're not going to do that. Now, i has become 3. So this is 3 plus 1. And 3 plus 1, as we know, becomes 4. So i is now at index 3. j is now at index 4. So this is i. This is j. Okay. Now it's going to check. Is i bigger than j? And it's going to see 9 is bigger than 7. And it's going to set 9 right here. S temp becomes r at index i. This is i. So it's going to say s becomes 9. I almost did a 7 there. There. Okay. And then it's going to remove 9 from the array. Basically. And it's going to re replace 9 with 7. So now it's 1, 2, 7. And then there's an open index, which is also 7 right now. 5. And that's what's happening here. I becomes J. I has become J. But J has not changed. And now here we say J, this is J right here, that's J, becomes S temp right here. This is S temp. So then it is 1, 2, 7, 9, 5. And that's how the array works. I hope you all understand that because that is very basic. So, but it can be quite difficult to understand, that, especially at the beginning. But it's good to try it yourself and see what you can do. So now if we're going to run this. So display the array. Here is the array normally. And the one that should be first is Caleb or Carla. Actually, it's Andrea because that's an A. So if we say sort array and then display again. Now Andrea, Caleb, Jack, Jenny, John, Lucas, Macbeth, Mark and Stephen. All of them are in the correct order, but not the ages. If you can remember how it looked before we said sort, the ages did not change. I just ran it quickly. The ages did not change. See, 24, 10, 19. Sort, display, 24, 10, 19. Now that's a problem. So what we do is we create an item variable because we're working with an integer array now. And we can actually copy this. Not, not literally copy the template, but we can kind of copy that. And we can go item becomes our age at index i and then r h at index i becomes r h at index j and then r h at index j becomes i temp now this is basically in literal representation of what i have just shown you numbers and all not the specific numbers but it's the same type of numbers so now if we go just control e control s and we run this it will arrange the ages as well so let's keep track of an age just to make sure so andrea's age is 33 and macbeth's age is 100. let's sort the array this split array 33 is andrea's and macbeth is 100. So the ages are getting sorted as well. But you might be thinking to yourself, what, wait, wouldn't the smallest age be first? That's a no. That's a big no-no. Because this only compares the names. It doesn't compare the ages. So the ages just changes along with the names. If you wanted the ages to change as well, you'd have to go if, and then create an if statement, r h at index i is bigger than r h at index j. You don't have to create your own if statement in order to do something like that. 
how long has this video been? 22 minutes of me just explaining the bubble sort. But that is how you sort an array. And that is basically how it works. So just remember, if you're getting confused, letters are just numbers to the computer. You can actually go search this up and you will find, I think these are called ASCII values, I'm not sure. But you will find them. And yeah, that is how you sort an array. And that's also what the bubble sort is. Two birds with one stone. Now what if you want to sort the age? You can just go R age and then R age. And then we'd sort it by the age of the people and you can sort it like that. Display the array, sort the array, and the youngest is John which is five and the oldest is Macbeth. Sorted, Macbeth is there, John is there. Isn't that perfect? So today we will be learning about the text-to-speech recognition on Delphi. So the first thing we'd want to do is add a button. This button will just do the basic of getting everything set up. Okay, so you can just double click on the button and before we start, we need to import something. If we go here to the top, all we have to do is just add com object. This will allow us to use the AI inside of Microsoft to allow us to create an object that will talk to us. Then inside of the button, we can create a variable and we can call it voice. And this will be an OLE variant. So all we have to do then is we just have to initialize it by going voice becomes and then create OLE object. And inside of that, you have to keep the spelling right here. You have to keep it very, very, very specific because if you're going to mess up the spelling, it might not work. So it is S A P I dot S P voice. And once you have that, you can use the voice dot speak. And then you can add your text inside of there. In this case, hello world. World, world. Should do just fine. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay, now we can just click the button and... Hello world. Your voice might change depending on the computer you have, but that is the basic output you get. Now what if you wanted to create an application that would take user input and turn it to speech? So then we can just add an edit. Now whatever the user enters in here is what will be said by the computer. So to get that we can just replace this part right here with edt text dot text. Hello there. My name is Jack. And there you go. So this is the only two lines you actually need in order to get the whole thing running. And that's the basics of text to speech. So today we'll be talking about math operations. We've lightly touched some of the operations you can do in the past, but never really went full out on all of them. So that's why I feel it's time we, we go through a bunch of them and just explain what they do. So I just, I'm just going to have a button and I'm going to use a show message to basically, to basically display everything. Let's just make sure this like displays in the middle somewhere of the screen. Anyways, so let's just double click on the button. We didn't need to name it or anything. Now the first thing you want to do if you want to use math operations, we can actually just make that smaller, is you can go comma math here in the users clause. Because this will import the math class, which in return will allow us 
to let's just run this to make sure everything works will allow us to use math op op operations like round, floor, seal, uh, random range, stuff like that. So yeah, everything works. Now let's start with the first one. So we're going to use we can create a few variables. Variable i num for if we're going to use integers. So that's integer, and then r value or r num instead num, which is if we're going to use a real. Okay, instead of a show message, we're just going to go here and start typing rich edit. Throw rich edit on here and we can just display everything inside of rich edit. Alright, so now here we have a rich edit called RED display and we're going to display all of our things in there instead because that will just make our life easier. So let's go and just go RED display dot lines dot add and we can just start adding things here. So first thing we want to do is because we are going to be returning integers with the round function. So we want to go int to string. Now we want to add round and then we want to add a number in here. Now what the round function does is it basically rounds any number for you. So let's say 5.6 we turn into 6. 5.4 now we turn into 5 and so on. So let's go 5.6 and then we can use this a couple of times C B V V V to show you just the difference. Then 5.4 then negative 2.1 and then like 9.9 or 9.0 then I can show you all what happens. So if we run this and we press the button 6, 5, negative 2, 9 5.6, that has to go to 6 because if you remember in our normal math, as soon as you get to 5, you just round up. Because if you're going to walk halfway to the supermarket and then you're like, okay, no, I don't want to go to the supermarket anymore, or you have a choice to go back home to the supermarket, you're already halfway to the supermarket, so why turn around now? You know? So that's, so 5 and up, that goes up. So 5.6, that's 6. 5.4, that's 5. 2.1 that's negative 2 or negative 2 1 9 that's just 9 and it returns a normal integer so this can be a a double that goes in there a real and then we have another function so we can go off here or actually we can yeah we can do that now this function right here is called trunk now what trunk does it it Round or not round, it removes the decimal values. So let's say we have 5, 5.5. Trunk will make so it is 5. Or if we have 6.1, trunk will make that it's 6. So we can just go like 5.9, and then we can just like delete this. I can copy this, C V V V V, and then we can go 8.1, negative 3.4, 2.0. Then if we run this, as you can see, 5, 8, negative 3, 2. 5.9, that turns into 5. 8.1, that turns into 8. Uh, 3.4, negative 3.4, that turns into negative 3, and then 2.0, that turns into 2. So it just removes this right here and makes sure that this is an integer. And then on the other side of this spectrum right here, we have something that does the opposite of trunk. And that something is called frac. Now, what frac is going to do is, let's say we have 19.8. Uh, then it's going to return 0 0.8. Unlike trunk, which would return the number, this returns the real value only, the decimals. So we can go 8.92, and we can actually copy this C V V V V uh, 2.12, uh, negative 2.2. 
1.00. Let's run this. Oh wait, sorry, this has to st turn into float to string because now we are using or returning a real instead of an integer because this return is zero point something. Now if we click this button, zero point nine two if you drag this here, eight point nine two, zero point nine two, two point one two, zero point one two, and negative two dot two, just negative 0 0.2 and then 1.00 that automatically just returns 0 because that's the decimal you know so yeah then here's something we that we most likely will use in a lot of situations and we can just go back to into string in into string this is called seal seal now what seal will do is it will round everything up. So you know math to round you know round. Round will round it to whichever is closest. Seal, on the other hand, no matter if it's 8.1, it's going to round it up to 9. If it's 9.1, if it's 9.9, .9, it's going to round it up to 10. You know, so it's it's always going to round up. It's never going to round down. So let's go 9.1 and see where that takes us. So C V V V B. And if we go here and we say 2.8, uh, negative 2.1, and maybe 98.4. Now let's see what they return. Click the button, and as you can see, it returned as we thought. Jeez. Okay, so there's 9.1, that went to 10, 2.8, that went to 3 negative 2.1 that went to negative 2 why negative 2 you ask? that's because it rounds up negative 2 is bigger than negative 3 just like 0 is bigger than negative 1 but 1 is bigger than 0 you know so yeah and then you have going up to 99 okay so next up we have the opposite of seal we have floor uh, you might see a uh, uh, something here that kind of looks familiar, right? Seal, ceiling, so it goes up, the ceiling is up. Floor, that's down. The ceiling is, the floor is below you, so it goes downwards. So floor is going to do the exact opposite of seal. If you click this, it's 9, 2, negative 3 this time, because 3 is smaller than 2, negative 2 and in 98, so it rounds down. So that's enough of rounding and stuff like that, we don't need that anymore. So now, we can just delete all of that. Now we can get to the real mathematical stuff. And we can maybe use format instead. Uh, I think it's float to, float to string. Most of these will most likely return floating point value. So here we have a value, or value, here we have a function called squirt. Now what will squirt do? Squirt stands for square root, and it will get the square root of something. So let's put 25 here, and if I'm correct, the square root of 25 is 5, because 5 times 5 is 25. And that's about all I know when it comes to square root, so I'm just going to put 2 here, because it's... Uh, we can actually add more of them because now I think about it, it's easier. So 2 times 2, that's 4. Uh, 4 times 4, that is, is 16. And then we can go 10 times 10, that's 100. Okay, so we took a few very basic numbers here. And we show them their rooted value, their square rooted value, as you can see, is 5 because 5 times 5 is 25. Then you have your 2, because 2 times 2 is 4, 16, 4, and 10. So yeah, that's square root for you. Then next up, we have not square root, but square. Now this is basically the opposite of square root. So if I'm going to put 5 here and I say square, this is going to give me 25. 
This was a lot easier because now I can like you know free will give us three times three, and then we can go ten that will give us a hundred, and then here we can go three put another number here like seventy or something. So we click this twenty five nine one hundred four thousand nine hundred. So as you can see, this gives you the to the power of two. You know, to the power power. Now sometimes, just sometimes, you want to do something stronger than just square root. You know, times two or times two times the same number once. You know, you sometimes you want to do it like let's say three times. In that case, you have something called power. And let's just delete all of this because that's gonna get in the way right now. Now let's say you want to do this because normal uh, square normal squaring will just do this five comma two so five times five so yeah they're just doing two fives that will trans literally translate into five times five and if you add a three there it will translate into five times five times five so yeah it puts it to the power of whatever you put in there so let's try this out with a few things let's go c b b b b and we can go like 2 to the power of 5 and 10 to the power of 2 and then let's say 5 to the power of 4 this time okay and if you click the button as you can see it does return the valid values 125, 100, uh, 625, 32 so yeah that is if you want to use something stronger than just squaring a number. Next up, we have absolute. Or in this case, we can go ABS. Now, this can return either an integer or a real, if I'm not mistaken. So you can use so you can either use into string or for floaty string. I'm going to say floaty string because that's the easiest way to get everything to work. Now, what absolute does, it returns the absolute value or something. Now, uh, I never really, s or you don't really see this too often, actually, but usually you get the number like they say negative 5. And the absolute number of negative 5 is 5. Same here, negative 2.3. The absolute number of negative 2.3, that's 2.3. So basically, the absolute value is just the positive version of the number. So yeah, so we can go like negative 23, and we can just copy this, C, B, 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 and we can go like negative 3.29, then we can go, give it a positive number, let's make this 9, and then maybe 23.24. Then if we run this, we click the button, as you can see, everything is now positive. <sighs> The next we have pi. We all know what pi is. It's like three point one four one five nine and whatever comes after that. So basically, we can just go and say pi, and it will literally give us pi. I don't know until where, but it will give us pi. And then we can like go pi times two, or you know pi divided by two, or you know, uh, 2 times pi, now we can actually make this a bit bigger, then we can go, um, is it pi squared? Is pi the one that gets squared? I do think so. Um, is qr, we can square pi then, and then we can find out the thing of a circle. I have no idea what this is, but it does something to a circle. <laughs> and then basically, we just click the button, and as you can see, it gives you the pi. So 3.14159265 and so on and so forth. There's pi times two, there's pi divided by two, and there's I think a radius and then a radius. Is it a radius? Circumference? I have no idea. This is something of a circle. Uh, but I can't remember. Okay, and then next up we have random. Now let's say you need to get a random number. So then we can go random and we can say let's say for example 10 and what that will do 
is that will give us a random number between 0 and 9. So if we just click run, and we have to create the variable i. And as you can see here, it gives a bunch of random values from 0 to 9, but not 10, because it does not go up to 10. It goes from 0 to the number you give it, minus 1. So it wouldn't be 10, it would be up to 9, from 0 to 9. And if you want a random number between 0 and 1, you can just do that, random. Then we have a nutter, nutter, another one. Now, let's say you like to uh, not like add to a number you want it to give you between a certain two specific numbers. But then you have random range. So a random number between two numbers. We've talked about this one in the past, and now we're just going to see it again. So if we go between 1 and 100, it will return everything from 1 to 99, or 1 to 9. So let's run this. Click on the button. Everything from 1 to 9. Click the button again. 1 to 9. So it does the same thing, but you can give it a minimum and a maximum value. And yeah, that's... And if you want to make it more random, because sometimes the values you get is not completely random you know it's sometimes they are repetitive and you can kind of see a little pattern in them so what you can do then is you can just go randomize what randomize will do is it will make sure that whenever you get a number it will randomize it more so it wouldn't you know follow a specific pattern or something like that it will be something new each and every time all right so next, we have a few extra mathematical functions, which I found to be quite useful in times that you don't really want to type a lot. So the first one I want to talk about is, why did I delete everything? Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is, let's go uh, and just... Okay, let's give you guys an actual example. So let's go while i is less than... 10 begin and let's just like make i equal to 1 equal no becomes 1 and then right here at the end press control D now let's say we want to run for everything so we can go uh, read uh, display dot lines dot add and then int to string and we can put an i there now what you can do is what the okay I see now what you can do is firstly you can argo i plus or i becomes i plus one now I find this to be rather tedious because why just why so something you can do is that the equivalent of that is you can go ink and then just put your i there. Now that will increase i by 1 each time, each time the loop runs. So instead of you having to type out that entire sentence in code, you can just literally do that. And if you go i, comma 2, it will count by 2 instead of 1. One free five, as you can see. And, of course, if you get 3, it will count by 3 instead of 2, and 4, 4, and 5, 5. It continues like that. So, yeah, basically going i, 2, that will be the equivalent of i plus 2. Now, also, the opposite of ink would be dick. Now, it does the same thing. So, let's just, while i is more than 10... Let's make i something like 20 then. It does the same, it does the opposite of ink. So it goes i becomes i minus 1. So if we click this button right here, see 20, 19, 18 until it gets to 11. Because it's the equivalent of saying i becomes i minus 1. Min minus 1. 
And of course, if you go there, comma, let's say three this time. There's I minus three. So if we run this again, twenty seventy fourteen eleven. So yeah. So yeah, that's all I have for this video. All the mathematical functions I wanted to talk about. Alright, so today we only have one button and it's not customized or anything, so you can just plop it on there. So today we'll be talking about string manipulation functions. And if you can remember, a function is something that returns a value. So let's say it does a specific task and then afterwards it returns a value. For example, if you create a function called sum, then it returned the sum of two numbers. For example, 1 plus 2 or 1 comma 2 if you entered it into the parameters then we return a 3 and you can put that inside a variable. Just do not get confused with procedures. Procedures on the other hand does not return a value, it only completes a task. So let's just click on a button. We're going to put everything inside of a show message just to keep things simple. So we're going to create a variable and we're going to call it, let's say, s name. And that's a string. And now here we can go s line. Or we can just do that, can we? Alright, so then we can create another variable called s line or what you want to call it, a sentence, or s hello or what you want to call it. Then you can go s line becomes hello and just add a space there and then once you've added that you can just say show message and inside of that you can go concat and basically what concat will do is it will concatenate strings together so you can add two or more strings into one string so you can just go s line and s name we didn't set his name, let's just set his name equal to Netsu. And then if we run the program, and if we click the button, as you can see, it says hello, Netsu. So basically, concat is exactly the same as going S line plus S name. But here we can just go concat, and we can say S line, S name. Okay, then here is a another thing we've actually used a lot. This is the length function. So let's create another variable. We can call it ilen, and ilen is an integer. And let's say we want to get the length of this word right here, my name. As you can see, it is five characters in total, so the length would be five. So then we can go ilen becomes the length and you can say his name and that will return the length of this entire string right here so then you can go int to string and we can say i length then if we run this click the button as you can see it returns 5 this is very useful when you want to loop through a string, but you don't know the length of the string. Next up, we have the pause function. Now let's turn this i length into i pause. Now let's say we want to get the position of something inside a string. So let's modify this as line, and let's make it something like a code. So we can go hello net. Now let's say we want to split up this into two words. So it goes hello and then it turns it into a space net. So then we can do is we can actually find the location of this right here by going I pause becomes the position of whatever you're searching for inside of that string and the string you are searching from. This will find the integer index 
of this. So in this case, it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It will be at index 6, right after the L. And then what we can do is we can actually display what is in the place of I pause. So we can go his name and in brackets so we can get a specific character we can go I pause. And if we run this and if we click the button it returns nothing. Oh never mind I found the problem. Uh, so we should just change this is name to is line because the comma is not in its name so we will get an error if we try and run that so if we run this we click the button as you can see it returns the semicolon same if we were to put an in there so then we can say is line and if I pause it we can actually call for the position so then go int to string and then we can say I pause and then we will find the position of the in character and since this is 6 in would be at position 7 so if we click the button as you can see we get 7 alright so here is another one we are quite familiar with and it is copy so let's say we want to copy let's see we want to copy L L yeah let's say we want to, no let's say we want to copy E and L out of S line so let's change S name let's just remove that from S name then what we can do is we can go copy and we can say copy from S line starting at position 2 because 1 is H and then 2 and then how many we want to copy, which is 2. Because if we want to copy just 1, we'll copy just the E. If we want to copy 2, then we'll copy the E L. Alright, so then we can just display its name and we should get E L. So if we run this, we click the button, as you can see, we only get E L. So you say copy and then what you want to copy from, in this case we want to copy from S line, at which index you want to start, this is index 2, and then how many you want to copy, how many spaces you want to copy. So it is 2, so it will start red where the cursor is, blinking, and if we go 1 and then 2, and then we have another one, which is actually quite useful. And uh, let's, instead of putting it inside a string, let's show you here how it will look. If you don't put it inside a string, because it will still return the same thing. So this is called uppercase. So as you probably know by now, uppercase turns a word uppercase. It makes all the letters inside of that word uppercase, or inside of that sentence, or inside of just inside of the string in general. So we can go it's line. So then we can go hello, and we can actually add more here, so hello world. So then if we run this, if we click the button, it returns hello world, but in all caps. Similarly, we can go up case, and we can go S line, but this time up case won't capitalize the entire word, or entire string. It will only capitalize whatever you tell it to. So we can go up case and we can say specifically index 1. Now in this case, we will only receive that H. We won't receive the entire string because it is only capitalizing the thing we're telling it. So it's only returning that thing, that one character. So if we click on the button right here. We click on it, it really turns to H. So let's put it a bit together. So let's go concat and inside of concat, let's do that, we have uppercase and then the first letter and then we say and then we want to add 
copy and then we just want to maybe just clear that copy and then from S line from index 2 and we just put a random number there because it's just going to copy until it finds the end now look at this as you can see now we have the entire word but this time with a capital H so we basically by just using the basic functions we just learned create a pretty complicated function so let's break it up because you might struggle to understand this if it's in one line so then we can just do that and we can do that so what we're saying is we say concat and if you can remember what I told you this just adds two strings together so it's basically like saying uh, str1 plus str2 and then that so it copy or it concatenates and it puts two strings together so then we say take the first character from this s line and make it a capital letter and then it's going to return a capital H and then we say copy everything from H up until the end of the string and then put them together now if you understand this then we can actually do something even more interesting we can go this line then we can say copy from position 2 to the position of the space in S line minus 1 minus 2 and then we can concatenate one more thing so then we can say comma and then we can add world so we need to go minus 1 then if we run this Sorry about that, we have to move this minus one after the pause. And then we just can just run this. We click the button and we get hello world, but this time with a capital W. So with everything we just learned, we created a very complicated function. So isn't that amazing? So we just said add together concatenate a bunch of strings then we said the first letter of this as a capital letter so it's a big H so this returns big H and then we said then copy from S line <coughs> at from index 2 then up until the position of this the space minus 1 but we get the space included because it's not up until as, I, as I'm saying right now it's actually this is the amount of position it has to move forward so it's moving 5 or it's moving 6 so it's actually since it's moving from here it's actually going to W but then we say minus 1 so then it goes up until the space itself and then after it's copied that so this copies so this copies hello and includes a space and then this just adds everything to it, so world. It just that just add all. And then after the concatenation, it should say hello, world. And yeah, those are some basic string manipulation functions I wanted to focus on today. So today we'll be learning more about string manipulation. But this time, instead of focusing on functions, we'll be focusing on string manipulation procedures. Now, the difference between a function and a procedure again. Functions return something. Procedure does not. Procedure only executes steps, while a function will return a value after executing the steps. So yeah, let's get started. So then we can just go and add a button. We don't need more than a button. So yeet and you double click on that okay so we can just create ourselves a few variables variable 
is my str and let's just go um, is str1 and then is str2 which are both string and then we can go and add i num and i code which is integer and then just r num which is a real press control b and we should have a beautiful variable list okay so the first one we're going to learn is probably something we already know so let's just populate that first string we can make it so it says hello darkness my old friend okay and then we can just show message and ssdr1 okay so if we use the show message now we obviously know what's going to happen it's just going to display this so the first one is one we probably already know and it's called delete which deletes a part of a string so let's go delete Ooh. and then first as you can see it's first the string so it's ssdr1 and then where to start let's say we want to delete darkness so hello is 5 and then there's a 6 character and then there's darkness darkness is 8 characters long so let's go and start from position 6 which is right here and wait let's make it position 7 because we want, don't want to delete this space we want to keep that space so we start here at the D and then we want to delete nine characters why because darkness is eight characters plus the empty string right there you know the space or we could have just deleted this space which would have worked the same but you know we don't want that so then nine then if we run this then we can just maybe bring that up here. and if we click this as you can see it says hello my old friend so as you can see we said select this string right here and then from index 7 and it's 1 2 3 4 5 and then 6 and then from index 7 that's where the D is so it includes the D itself delete 9 spaces so it's 1 2 3 4 and then 5 6 7 8 and then 9 so it did that okay so that's delete now we can continue to one we haven't learned yet so let's say I want to add darkness back in here right after the space so then <coughs> I can go insert and then we can select the substring we want to add in this case it's darkness with a space because we want the space between darkness and my and then the string we want to insert into so it is str1 and then where we want to insert this so we want to insert it here where m is no go away here where m is why where m is because we don't want to move this space because whatever wherever it's going to start is basically going to push everything up so if we're going to say right here after o where the space would have been we just push the space upwards we don't want that we want there to still be a space let's just make everything correct so then we can say so that's five six seven and if we run this click the button hello darkness my old friend so what do we do we just inserted the word darkness into the string so the substring the string itself and then where what's a substring you ask well each word in here is a substring it's part of the string this is the string and hello is a substring of the string itself so that's a substring so this one we already know it's pretty basic so inum or so is str2 
that's going to become let's say dip 22 okay now we want to validate that it is in fact a number so if we go val and we can say the string we want to validate uh, what type it should be it should be of type integer and then the code it should return so basically this will just validate if this is an integer if it's an integer then I code will become zero but if it's not an integer I code will become the index of which it stopped being an integer for in this case let's say we added D right here so I code will then become one two three because this is where the problem began because that can't be converted into an integer we remove that there will be one two and both of them are integers so this will be zero so if we output int to string i code we uh, should make this string two. Sorry about that. We run this again. We click the button. It returns zero. And if we were to add a let's say d in the middle of the two, we try and run it again. Click the button. It returns two because one, two. Okay. And the same can be said if you want a real value. So 22.22. .22. And if we were to change this from inum to rnum, we should get zero because now it's testing to see if it returns a real value. Click the button. As you can see, it does return a, zero, a real value, so it returns zero. But if we were to put a T right there, we run it again. Click the button. It returns five because one, two, three, four, five. T is at index five. And that's all the string manipulation procedures I wanted to cover today. So we can just click on the button, there's nothing special about this page, you can just create it by adding a normal button, you don't have to worry. So there is something called a message line. Like you know what a show message is, right? But a show message is boring because if you use a show message, you only have one answer. So let me show you, show message, and we can just put in whatever we want in here. We don't need anything specific, I just want to show you how it looks click the button it's boring because you only have an okay what if you want a yes a no or a cancel button or something like that you can put it there because a show message has one thing it has to do it just has to show you something and then you can say okay it's just a message box nothing special about it so that's why today I'm going to show you a way you can kind of make it look even better so the thing I'm going to show you returns an integer. So we can go variable int hello or int uh, i message. I mean, I don't know what happened there. Uh, and that's an integer because it returns an integer, which is nice. So then i message can then become, and this is called a message dialog. So we can go message dialog and it takes in a few parameters. First is what you want to ask. So let's say, um, is it okay to delete PC now? Is it okay to delete your PC now, sir? And let's say we want them to say yes or no. So then we can just go and create like this. And this is the dialog type. Now the dialog type is uh, something you can kind of make custom. So let's go and we say, uh, let's make a confirmation. So this will be in T and then confirmation, which will just basically, it, they're confirming something. And then we can say in brackets, because this is basically the buttons that will appear. Then we have MB yes and MB no, because we want to know yes or no, I mean no there. We want to know can we delete their files and stuff can we delete their PC yes no and then we can run this 
and before we run that because now I see we have to add zero click the button is it okay to delete PC now so and then you can say yes or no so let's say no don't delete my PC and then of course you can put this into an if statement so you can say if I message is equal to and you can do something like um, MR and MR is just a way to uh, reference an MB if you want to use an if statement you can use MR instead of MB to reference it so MR and uh, let's say yes if it's yes then begin and then it, because it returns an integer so this basically returns let's say 6 for example then I message becomes 6 so MRES yes is just a variable used to store the value 6 so you don't have to remember which value each of these are because this could be something like 10 and this can be 6 that's going to be confusing so they made a, ver a variable that's built in which you can use and then we can go show message now you can say PC was deleted and then we can go like else begin so this is if they didn't say yes you can also use an else if you want show message fine PC will not be deleted 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 is fine we don't need to fix that so if we run this if we click the button mm, so it says is it okay to delete PC now if I say yes it says PC was deleted if I click the button and I say no it says fine PC will not be deleted just fix this zero but and there are a lot of dialogue types you can choose from uh, not just the one I made the confirmation one let's say we want one that warns someone so MT warning it's a little bit it does exactly the same thing I just think it looks different um, let's see we go empty warning and we say underneath that we can go empty and let's say error for example we run this so it will first display empty warning and then empty error so let's first see the first message as you can see it has an exclamation mark there and it says warning you can say like yes or no and then at error it has an X a cross basically and it says delete PC now it just says error so you can have multiple of those there are also a bunch more so we can go empty custom empty custom and there custom and then we can also go MT information. Let's run both of these and see how they look. If we click the button, information has an I there, which I can display information. And this one basically, as you can see, doesn't have anything here. I believe you can somehow edit it, so it does have an image there and a name there. But we will not be getting into that right now. And then let's get to buttons. Let's add a bunch of buttons. So you can do that. And you just do that. And do, uh, fix everything up a bit so it's not that. Okay. So we have been ha using MB yes and MB no the entire time. Let's remove that. We don't want that anymore. So instead of MB yes, let's go MB okay. So if they want to say okay. Or MB cancel. Or even MB abort, MB retry, MB ignore, MB all. So let's first use let's first use this, and then let's we can continue with them because there's quite a lot actually. If we run this, then if we click the button. As you can see, it has all of these options now. It says, okay, cancel abort, retry, ignore all. So yeah, and also remember, all of these do have counterparts. So you can use MR OK, for example, or MR cancel. All of these have their own little MRs you can use when you use them in F-Sting. Just in, replace the MB with MR and you should be fine. 
Okay, now let's go and check out the next. So then we have MB and then no to all and then MB yes to all and then MB help. If we run this, if we click the button, as you can see, no to all, yes to all help. Yeah, help is supposed to display something. It doesn't close anything. <sighs> and as I told you, help doesn't return any value. So help doesn't have its own MR. But the rest do have MR. So MR no to all has the its own MR. And then we have MR help which doesn't exist. So just remember, help does not return anything. If you click help, something else should pop up. We're not going to cover how to make something pop up if you click help, uh, but for right now, that should be fine. All right, so today we'll be looking at a few extra functions. I just have a button and everything, nothing's really styled. I just made it so it pops up in the center of the screen. That's about anything that you might not have. Now, first thing we want to do is we're going to actually look at date functions. So what you want to do is you want to open control panel and under by categories, you want to go here to clock and region and say change date, time and number format. Click on that and this should pop up. Uh, if you don't get this format specifically and you like this format, it's under English United Kingdom. I know English South Africa and English United States doesn't all have the same ones. So yeah, if you uh, would like this format, go to English United Kingdom. So that's the date format. You can change that to however you want. That's what's going to appear here. But yeah, just, just as a side note for later. Or actually for now. So if you click on the button and we can start coding then. Then I'm just going to use a show message because it is not that important right now that I add anything more. So show message, but you can put these because there are there are functions. You can put them inside variables, but it's optional. And then we can say time to string. And this will basically just convert the time now into string. So you should just say, you can just say time. And if you run this, click the button, as you can see, 11.58.38. And that's about it for time. And then we can go to date to string, date to string. There are more ways you can use these. I'm just showing you the most basic ways of using them because we don't really need to know the more intense things right now. So then we can just go either date or now. Both means the same thing. We can actually do both. So let me just copy this, CV, and then we can go date. Then if we run this, we click the button, now here's data string now, as you can see, it's exactly the same format as here. So you can string manipulate this to find out what's the current date. And then you can press OK, and here's same thing if you use date. So it's optional whichever one you want to use. Of course, you can make more complex ones than this. So let's say we want to change the color of this form's background. Then what we can do is we can go FRM1 form I mean form one because then name it form one dot color and then you can either go something like CL red for example or you can go form one dot color becomes before I show that let's make first let's first make sure that this works. Now this will change the background color of the form to red. And if you can remember from the first few videos where we did a few a little bit of this, it will just change the background colors. Click the button, as you can see it turns red. Now there is an alternative method which you can use. And then you can insert RGB values. Now if you don't know what RGB values is, I will give you a quick explanation and if you don't understand it then it's fine. So RGB stands for red, green, blue. If you have a gaming PC, you kind of would know that, red, green, blue. 
Now the first value between 0 and 255, if I'm not mistaken. So that would be red, how red it is. If it's 0, then there's no red. It's Then red is basically black, you could say. So let's say 255,0,0, 0, that would produce red. But if you go 255, remove that 0 and make this 0, then you would get green because then there's no red or blue here. And if you make that 0 and you make this 255, then you would get blue. So let's run this and just make sure you understand how it's working. Click the button, it turns blue. Now, of course, you can mix them. And if you go 0, 0, 0, you get black because then there's no color at all. If you go 255 and 255 and 255, then you get white because, you know, 0 is black and the maximum value is white. And then you can like mix them up. You can maybe go like 50 and make this one 125. I don't know what color that will produce, but it will produce a color which mainly consists of red. Click the button. As you can see, it turns a pinkish color. Of course, you don't need to have a 255. You can literally make this like zero and none of them actually the maximum value. Click the button and then you get a kind of bluish color. And yeah, that's something interesting if you want to ever know that. Then we get a, another beautiful function. So let's go uh, show show message. And then we say bool to string. And then we can say odd. Now this will determine whether a value is an odd value or not. So if we put like 15 in here, 15 is odd. You can't divide that by two. Then it will work it out for you it and you see you get negative one which means it is odd and if you go like 20 for example which is not an odd value they will return true which is basically zero zero equals false and one negative one equals true only in Delphi will get such an, a really really bad way of doing it but anyways then you also have another beautiful value, so we can just go uh, show message again. And uh, I forgot to tell you about this one, so you can also go bool to string. And we can go is leap year. And then we can put something like 2020. 2020 is a leap year, so it should return negative one. But 2019 is not a leap year. So it should return zero. So if you click the button, 2020 returns negative one because it's true, and 2019 returns zero because it's false. Then another thing you can do is we can just remove all of this and this as well. So another thing we can do is we can say return an ordinal value type which is, let's say, for example, the ASCII value of something. For example, A's ASCII value would be 65 because all letters in the computer language is basically just numbers. And the capital A's number is 65, where uh, lowercase a would be something like 97, I think. And B would then be, big B would be equal to 66. And I guess you can probably see how it's going to go on. Yeah, it's good to going to go on, go on and stuff. So yeah. So every character you know, where is a space where it, whether it's enter. Uh, I think enter has, but I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, enter does have, but you know, anyways, whether it is capital A, capital Z, lowercase a, exclamation mark. All of them do have ordinal value types. So we go int to string and we can just go ord and we can go something for example a which will basically be 65 and then we can go something like lowercase z to give another example and then we can do something like an exclamation mark 
just to make sure you know that basically everything you see when you look at text can be translated into numbers because of computers and how they work we click the button 65 as I said 65 one two two which is the small letter Z small letter Z is one two two and then 33 is that okay we click on X we can close all that and then we can just remove this because now it's getting a little bit clustered okay now the same thing can be done the other way around so let's show message and then we can go uh, let's see uh, we can just display char now basically if we were to put 65 in here it would return 9 no, 90 it would return 65 because I mean it would return capital A not 65 because the letter A is basically 65 in computer language as I just told you and uh, let's even copy this and see the, the and then we can go here and make this 97 which I'm not mistaken is lowercase a that's about all I know in uh, these actualities but yeah we click the button we get a capital A as you can see here and we get a lowercase a so yeah, in computer language, these are actually letters. And then you have one of my personal favorites, sleep. So let's go show message. And oh no, let's try to do this. If for form, form one dot color becomes becomes cl black. And then let's oh geez cbb then you can go sleep and in milliseconds we can say something for example uh, let's say 1000 milliseconds which i think translates into a second and then after a second we want this to change to uh, red so let's run this so what sleep basically does it just tells the computer wait and in the amount of time you asked for in this case we asked for a second so if we click the button it turns black and then it turns red click the button it turns black after a second it turns red so yeah sleep basically just gives you a option to slow it down if you if you remove the sleep and we click it now click the button as you can see it just instantly went red we didn't get an option or a chance to see black because it does it so fast our eyes can't really see it so yeah that is all the extra functions and procedures i wanted to tell you all about today and hello everyone welcome back to a new video so here i have a basic form called frm rich underscore you and it has a button called bt and click me and a rich edit which is called red display so we'll be checking out a few things you can do with a rich edit, which is pretty nice. So let's first start with the basic, you know, what we always use. So first we have, of course, our red display dot lines dot add, and basically we can just add something here. So hello world. Let me run this. Now, the difference between a rich edit and a memo is a memo cannot be formatted. With a rich edit, click the button, it displays hello world. While with a rich edit, you can like, change the text color, you can format the text to look better, you can do a bunch of nice things with it. So, it is better than a memo in a lot of ways, so that's why you'd rather use this. But, that is just how to display something, I think we all already know that. Then we have our uh, red display dot lines dot clear, clear, or red display dot clear. Both of these do the same thing. They clear the text from the screen, so or from the rich edit. So let's run this. 
and then if we add some code here so like this or some text here and we just do that if you click the button it clears it in this case it clears it two times we can uh, we can like disable either one of them and it will do the same thing but yeah so that's how you clear it that's pretty basic still then here is something that we also know about so read out or read display dot lines dot load from file so this reads from a file and you got to choose the file name so in this case our file name would be something dot txt ac and then we can go here and we can just inside of quotation marks put it there i have to move the file sorry uh, copy that file the text file and just paste it inside of the debug folder and also if you want to know what's inside of the file here you go. Hello, dear reporter. My name is Netsu, but you can call me Luke Warm Dude Six Nine. Thanks. So now, if we run it, click the button. Hello, dear partner, and it just prints everything like that out straight out of the file. So you don't have to like open a file and then write line by line. You can just say this, and it will read everything and put it there. Then you can also save to a file. So we say read output dot lines dot save save to file and we can just like put the file in here that we want to save so, uh, so control V I something dot txt now if we just control D and control S maybe yes allow and if we run this so we click the button I didn't do anything like this is add some random text here we click the button then if we open up something.txt wait is, is this a new one that I accidentally spelled out one something okay. okay but anyways here you go and you have a bunch of weird text this is a bunch of um, if you're going to load it back into it this is like styling and stuff like that as you can see that uses Dharma and stuff like that and then this is the text that's actually inside of it and then yeah so this is basically just a way of formatting it because if we're going to open it up again inside of a rich edit then the formatting should stay the same so let's say the text was big and red then right here it should say the text was big and red and then here it should display the text in this case we didn't do any formatting so that's not going to change and then we have uh, one that you probably won't use that much, but it is useful to know about. We can just go red display dot lines dot print. Now, basically, or not dot lines, just dot print. Now, basically, it will use your default printer and it will print the text. So, I don't know if it will actually print. I don't have a printer, so I can't actually check it. But it's a nice thing to know. So, we can just go like... Um, name of print I don't really know what to call that but anyway so if you run this so I don't have a printer so it will just save it as a dot PDF if I'm not mistaken so let's go here and say hello world how are you and if we say click me then it will ask me how do you want to save it so now I'm just going to be like um, default dot no, I don't need to say dot anything. I can just say save. It takes a while, uh, as you can see. One document is pending for Stephen. It's, it's probably trying to print it, but it can't print it. So, what it does instead is it goes here to documents, and it just puts it there. It doesn't actually print it. So I get printer. Can this will actually do something? But if you don't, then it will just basically store whatever you said into a PDF. Hello world, how are you? So yeah, we can now uh, like change a few things like design and stuff like that. Now that we've gotten the printing out of the way. So let's first go red out the red display dot font dot size. And this will just change the font size to whatever you want. So let's make it something like a 30 for example. Now, of course, if you want to know how what you can change and stuff, you can always go here and click on the rich edit and search through here. So let's say font, there's font, and then he, here is size. The size is currently 8. 
so you can just like check here what you can change everything it's just like normal changing things so then here we can maybe just actually decrease this to 20 so we can actually add a few more things so then you can go read out dot font dot color and let's say we want the color to be mm, rgb let's use a few extra things and let's say it is rgb 255-2550 so it's going to be red and green and no blue at all so what happens if you mix red and green i have no idea but we'll see then you can go red out i mean red display dot font dot style now you can like change the style to something you'd like like for example um, fs bold and fs italic maybe if you want you can go fs and underline as well there's a bunch of things here you can choose from let's just add uh, things there and let's add some text so ray display dot lines dot add and we can just add some text that says hello there hashtag 13 i am cool okay now if we run this let's click the button hello there i am cool so mixing red and green gives you yellow and as you can see it is bold it is big text there's underlining and that's basically everything we did here so yeah so next up we have uh, we can change like the font itself so it has a like it looks better we may decrease the size to something such as 15 maybe or 10 or 12 and maybe change the color back to normal and then we can go red out dot font dot name so this will change the font type so we can just go something like comic sans ms and of course you can just go to the font if you want and you can go here to name which in this case is tahoma and you can like change it to whatever you want here i chose comic sans ms and if you search for it, it would be right here, Comic Sans MS. So then if we run this, if we click the button now, as you can see, it looks more comedic. It doesn't look as, as it did last time. Okay, so next up, we can like uh, change how the paragraph and stuff looks, which is something that you'll use quite a lot. So here we can go read this play dot paragraph dot alignment and we can like set it to something such as ta center then if we run this click the button as you can see it centers the text then you can also like justify it left or right uh, so let's justify it right ta uh, right justify and if we run that Click the button as you can see now it's at the, the right side of the reach edit so yeah you can play around with that if you want and then you have uh, then you can also number the lines if you wanted to do that so read display dot paragraph dot numbering and we can say something such ns becomes NS and then we can like say bullet and we can just do that and oop. now if we run it click the button as you can see it numbers all of the lines so yeah uh, not a numbering specifically but it gives it a, a nice and then we can also also we can also add tab stops so we can go here and we can say dot tab count and let's say it is something such as free now basically what tabbing is is it's like this you see this right here now when you we align everything as you can see it indents it tabs itself so they're aligned with each other now what it means in Delphi is let's say as you can see there's like a tab between these two and then on the next line 
we can just get to the next line is like uh, some text that is related to the top tab and then on the other side there is like more text which is related to the other side so let's actually remove this and press ctrl d and right here we can say something such as name and then hash 9 because we need to tab it and then age and then we can just control c v v v v and we can change up this like 29 13 90 and 56 and here we can change this to lucas luca um, lucia leo and then before we do that what we do have to do then is we have to say where it's or we can actually just do this as well we have to see where the tabbing happens and stuff like that now with this you can mostly play around with it because it's quite difficult to understand but it just basically sets the position of the tab so you can go like read display dot paragraph dot tab and then at index zero because that's where it starts you can do something like zero and then we can go cbv and then at index one we can do something like 100. now if we run this click the button as you can see there's name and then 100 as the tab and then age we also change this so it's something like 10 instead which makes it a lot smaller now if we click the button as you can see there's a, a much smaller space here and of course you can increase the amount of tabs there are so you can just like increase it to like five or something and b b b b b and then you can change a bunch of uh, values for the reach edit which it will only be changed by the next line so let's go read display dot cell attribute dot size and let's say it is something such as 30 for example now if we run this click the button and it basically just changes the size and we can also do that click the button and now if we type something it will be quite large so yeah this is mostly actually just to change it for the next line to be added for Richard. So we can also do something like this to help me show you what I mean. And CVV. And you can make this like 22, 22, 22, and then make this something like 15, like a bit smaller, then run this, click the button. And as you can see, it only does it for the first line. That's next. So there it might be maybe two lines added afterwards but it's only the values or the attributes that get set for the next line after this so yeah you can use that and you can also use things such as the coloring and the styling and stuff like that so just like red display dot cell attributes and then you can just like go dot and look at everything you can do basically everything you did before such as uh, the style which is bold or not bold or the color such as color and or even the name such as the name it can be changed by using this but then we'll only change the next line it but the one after that will go back to its original state so yeah that's all i wanted to do today in terms of reach edit thank you for watching I hope you all enjoyed this full course out tutorial. I'll see you all.